a dark night's work by elizabeth cleggern gaskell chapter one in the country town of a certain shire there lived about forty years ago one mr wilkins a conveyancing attorney of considerable standing the certain shire was but a small county and the principal town in it contained only about four thousand inhabitants so in saying that mr wilkins was the principal lawyer in hamley i say very little unless i add that he transacted all the legal business of the gentry for twenty miles round his grandfather had established the connection his father had consolidated and strengthened it and indeed by his wise and upright conduct as well as by his professional skill had obtained for himself the position of confidential friend to many of the surrounding families of distinction he visited among them in a way which no mere lawyer had ever done before dined at their tables he alone not accompanied by his wife be it observed rode to the meet occasionally as if by accident although he was as well mounted as any squire among them and was often persuaded after a little coquetting about professional engagements and being wanted at the office to have a run with his clients nay once or twice he forgot his usual caution was first in at the death and rode home with the brush but in general he knew his place as his place was held to be in that aristocratic county and in those days nor let it be supposed that he was in any way a toad-eater he respected himself too much for that he would give the most unpalatable advice if need were would counsel an unsparing reduction of expenditure to an extravagant man would recommend such an abatement of family pride as paved the way for one or two happy marriages in some instances nay what was the most likely piece of conduct of all to give offence forty years ago he would speak up for an unjustly used tenant and that with so much temperate and well-timed wisdom and good feeling that he more than once gained his point he had a son edward this boy was the secret joy and pride of his father's heart for himself he was not in the least ambitious but it did cost him a hard struggle to acknowledge that his own business was too lucrative and brought in too large an income to pass away into the hands of a stranger as it would do if he indulged his ambition for his son by giving him a college education and making him into a barrister this determination on the more prudent side of the argument took place while edward was at eton the lad had perhaps the largest allowance of pocket-money of any boy at school and he had always looked forward to going to christ church along with his fellows the sons of the squires his father's employers it was a severe mortification to him to find that his destiny was changed and that he had to return to hamley to be articled to his father and to assume the hereditary subservient position to lads whom he had licked in the playground and beaten in learning his father tried to compensate for him the disappointment by every indulgence which money could purchase edward's horses were even finer than those of his father his literary tastes were kept up and fostered by his father's permission to form an extensive library for which purpose a noble room was added to mr wilkins's already extensive house in the suburbs of hamley and after his year of legal study in london his father sent him to make the grand tour with something very like carte blanche as to expenditure to judge from the packages which were sent home from various parts of the continent at last he came home came back to settle as his father's partner at hamley he was a son to be proud of and right down proud was old mr wilkins of his handsome accomplished gentlemanly lad for edward was not one to be spoilt by the course of indulgence he had passed through at least if it had done him an injury the effects were at present hidden from view he had no vulgar vices he was indeed rather too fine for the society he was likely to be thrown into even supposing that society to consist of the highest of his father's employers he was well read and an artist of no mean pretensions above all his heart was in the right place as his father used to observe nothing could exceed the deference he always showed to him his mother had long been dead i do not know whether it was edward's own ambition or his proud father's wishes that had led him to attend the hamley assemblies i should conjecture the latter for edward had of himself too much good taste 
to wish to intrude into any society in the opinion of all the shire no society had more reason to consider itself select than that which met at every full moon in the hamley assembly room an excrescence built on the principal inn in the town by the joint subscription of all the county families into those choice and mysterious precincts no townsperson was ever allowed to enter no professional man might set his foot therein no infantry officer saw the interior of that ball or that card-room the old original subscribers would fain have had a man prove his sixteen quarterings before he might make his bow to the queen of the night but the old original founders of the hamley assemblies were dropping off minutes had vanished with them country dances had died away quadrilles were in high vogue nay one or two of the high magnates of shire were trying to introduce waltzing as they had seen it in london where it had come in with the visit of the allied sovereigns when edward wilkins made his debut in these boards he had been at many splendid assemblies abroad but still the little old ballroom attached to the george inn in his native town was to him a place grander and more awful than the most magnificent saloons he had seen in paris or rome he laughed at himself for this unreasonable feeling of awe but there it was notwithstanding he had been dining at the house of one of the lesser gentry who was under considerable obligations to his father and who was the parent of eight muckle mood daughters so hardly likely to oppose much aristocratic resistance to the elder mr wilkins's clearly implied wish that edward should be presented at the hamley assembly rooms but many a squire glowered and looked back at the introduction of wilkins the attorney's son into the sacred precincts and perhaps there would have been much more mortification than pleasure in this assembly to that young man had it not been for an incident that occurred pretty late in the evening the lord lieutenant of the county usually came with a large party to the hamley assemblies once in a season and this night he was expected and with him a fashionable duchess and her daughters but time wore on and they did not make their presence at last there was a rustling and bustling and in sail the superb party for a few minutes dancing was stopped the earl led the duchess to a sofa some of their acquaintances came to speak to them and then the quadrilles were finished in rather a flat manner a country dance followed in which none of the lord lieutenant's party joined then there was a consultation a request an inspection of the dancers a message to the orchestra and the band struck up a waltz the duchess's daughters flew off to the music and some more young ladies seemed ready to follow but alas there was a lack of gentlemen acquainted with the new-fashioned dance one of the stewards bethought him of young wilkins only just returned from the continent edward was a beautiful dancer and waltzed to admiration for the next partner he had one of the lady s for the duchess to whom the shire squires and their little county politics and contempts were alike unknown saw no reason why her lovely lady sophie should not have good partner whatever his pedigree might be and begged the steward to introduce mr wilkins to her after this night his fortune was made with the young ladies of the hamley assemblies he was not unpopular with the mammas but the heavy squires still looked at him askance and the heirs whom he had licked at eton called him an upstart behind his back End of chapter one chapter two it was not a satisfactory situation mr wilkins had given his son an education and tastes beyond his position he could not associate with either profit or pleasure with the doctor or the brewer of hamley the vicar was old and deaf the curate a raw young man half frightened at the sound of his own voice then as to matrimony for the idea of his marriage was hardly more present in edward's mind than in that of his father he could scarcely fancy bringing home any one of the young ladies of hamley to the elegant mansion so full of suggestion and association to an educated person so inappropriate a dwelling for an ignorant uncouth ill-brought-up girl yet edward was fully aware if his fond father was not 
that of all the young ladies who were glad enough of him as a partner at the hamley assemblies there was not one of them but would have considered herself affronted by an offer of marriage from an attorney the son and grandson of attorneys the young man had perhaps received many a slight and mortification pretty quietly during these years which yet told upon his character in after life even at this very time they were having their effect he was of too sweet a disposition to show resentment as many men would have done but nevertheless he took a secret pleasure in the power which his father's money gave him he would buy an expensive horse after five minutes conversation as to the price about which a needy heir of one of the proud county families had been haggling for three weeks his dogs were from the best kennels in england no matter at what cost his guns were the newest and most improved make and all these were expenses on objects which were among those of daily envy to the squires and squires sons around they did not much care for the treasures of art which report said were being accumulated in mr wilkins's house but they did covet the horses and hounds he possessed and the young man knew that they coveted and rejoiced in it by and by he formed a marriage which went as near as marriages ever do towards pleasing everybody he was desperately in love with miss lamott so he was delighted when she consented to be his wife his father was delighted in his delight and besides was charmed to remember that miss lamott's mother had been sir frank holster's younger sister and that although her marriage had been disowned by her family as beneath her in rank yet no one could efface her name out of the baronetage were latisse youngest daughter of sir mark holster born seventeen seventy two married h lamott seventeen ninety nine died eighteen ten was duly chronicled she had left two children a boy and a girl of whom their uncle sir frank took charge as their father was worse than dead an outlaw whose name was never mentioned mark lamont was in the army latisse had a dependent position in her uncle's family not intentionally made more dependent than was rendered necessary by circumstances but still dependent enough to grate on the feelings of a sensitive girl whose natural susceptibility to slights was redoubled by the constant recollection of her father's disgrace as mr wilkins well knew sir frank was considerably involved but it was with very mixed feelings that he listened to the suit which would provide his penniless niece with a comfortable not to say luxurious home and with a handsome accomplished young man of unblemished character for a husband he said one or two bitter and insolent things to mr wilkins even while he was giving his consent to the match that was his temper his proud evil temper but he really and permanently was satisfied with the connection though he would occasionally turn round to his nephew-in-law and sting him with a covert insult as to his want of birth and inferior position which he held forgetting apparently that his own brother-in-law and latisse's father might be at any moment brought to the bar of justice if he attempted to re-enter his native country edward was annoyed at all this latisse resented it she loved her husband dearly and was proud of him for she had discernment enough to see how superior he was in every way to her cousins the young holsters who borrowed his horses drank his wines and yet had caught their father's habit of sneering at his profession latisse wished that edward would content himself with a purely domestic life would let himself drop out of the company of the shire squirearchy and find his relaxation with her in their luxurious library or lovely drawing-room so full of white gleaming statues and gems of pictures but perhaps this was too much to expect of any man especially of one who felt himself fitted in many ways to shine in society and who was social by nature sociality in that county at that time meant conviviality edward did not care for wine and yet he was obliged to drink and by and by he grew to pique himself on his character as a judge of wine his father by this time was dead dead happy old man 
with a contented heart his affairs flourishing his poorer neighbours loving him his richer respecting him his son and daughter-in-law the most affectionate and devoted that ever man had and his healthy conscience at peace with his god latisse could have lived to herself and her husband and children edward daily required more and more the stimulus of society his wife wondered how he could care to accept dinner invitations from people who treated him as wilkins the attorney a very good sort of fellow as they introduced him to strangers who might be staying at the country but who had no power to appreciate the taste the talents the impulsive artistic nature which she held so dear she forgot that by accepting such invitations edward was occasionally brought into contact with people not merely of high conventional but of high intellectual rank that when a certain amount of wine had dissipated his sense of inferiority of rank and position he was a brilliant talker a man to be listened to and admired even by wandering london statesmen professional diners out or any great authors who might find themselves visitors in a shire country house what she would have had him share from the pride of her heart she should have warned him to avoid from the temptations to sinful extravagance which it led him into he had begun to spend more than he ought not in intellectual though that would have been wrong but in purely sensual things his wines his table should be such as no squire's purse or palate could command his dinner parties smaller in number the viands rare and delicate in quality and sent up to table by an italian cook should be such as even the london stars should notice with admiration he would have latisse dressed in the richest materials the most delicate lace jewellery he said was beyond their means glancing with proud humility at the diamonds of the elder ladies and the alloyed gold of the younger but he managed to spend as much on his wife's lace as would have bought many a set of inferior jewellery latisse well became it all if as people said her father had been nothing but a french adventurer she bore traces of her nature in her grace her delicacy her fascinating and elegant ways of doing all things she was made for society and yet she hated it and one day she went out of it altogether and for evermore she had been well in the morning when edward went down to his office in hamley at noon he was sent for by hurried trembling messengers when he got home breathless and uncomprehending she was past speech one glance from her lovely loving black eyes showed that she recognized him with the passionate yearning that had been one of the characteristics of her love through life there was no word passed between them he could not speak any more than she he knelt down by her she was dying she was dead and he knelt on immovable they brought him his eldest child eleanor in utter despair what to do in order to rouse him they had no thought as to the effect on her hitherto shut up in the nursery during this busy day of confusion and alarm the child had no idea of death and her father kneeling and tearless was far less an object of surprise or interest to her than her mother lying still and white and not turning her head to smile at her darling mamma mamma cried the child in shapeless terror but the mother never stirred and the father hid his face yet deeper in the bedclothes to stifle a cry as if a sharp knife had pierced his heart the child forced her impetuous way from her attendants and rushed to the bed undeterred by deadly cold or stony immobility she kissed the lips and stroked the glossy raven hair murmuring sweet words of wild love such as had passed between the mother and child often and often when no witnesses were by and altogether seemed so nearly beside herself in agony of love and terror that edward arose and softly taking her in his arms bore her away laying back like one dead so exhausted was she by the terrible emotion they had forced on her childish heart into his study a little room opening out of the grand library where on happy evenings never to come again he and his wife were wont to retire to have coffee together and then perhaps stroll out of the glass door into the open air the shrubbery the fields 
never more to be trodden by those dear feet what passed between father and child in this seclusion none could tell late in the evening eleanor's supper was sent for and the servant who brought it in saw the child lying as one dead in her father's arms and before he left the room watched his master feeding her the girl of six years of age with his tender care as if she had been a baby of six months End of chapter two chapter three from that time the tie between father and daughter grew very strong and tender indeed eleanor it is true divided her affection between her baby sister and her papa but he caring little for babies had only a theoretic regard for his younger child while the elder absorbed all his love every day that he dined at home eleanor was placed opposite to him while he ate his late dinner she sat where her mother had done during the meal although she had dined and even supped some time before on the more primitive nursery fare it was half pitiful half amusing to see the little girl's grave thoughtful ways and modes of speech as if trying to act up to the dignity of her place as her father's companion till sometimes the little head nodded off to slumber in the middle of lisping some wise little speech old-fashioned the nurse called her and prophesied that she would not live long in consequence of her old-fashionedness but instead of the fulfilment of this prophecy the fat bright baby was seized with fits and was well ill and dead in a day eleanor's grief was something alarming from its quietness and concealment she waited till she was left as she thought alone at nights and then sobbed and cried her passionate cry for baby baby come back to me come back till every one feared for the health of the frail little girl whose childish affections had had to stand two such shocks her father put aside all business all pleasure of every kind to win his darling from her grief no mother could have done more no tenderest nurse done half so much as mr wilkins did for eleanor if it had not been for him she would have just died of her grief as it was she overcame it but slowly wearily hardly letting herself love any one for some time as if she instinctively feared lest all her strong attachments should find a sudden end in death her love thus dammed up in small space at last burst its banks and overflowed on her father it was a rich reward to him for all his care of her and he took delight perhaps a selfish delight in all the many pretty ways she perpetually found of convincing him if he had needed conviction that he was ever the first object with her the nurse told him that half an hour or so before the earliest time at which he could be expected home in the evenings miss eleanor began to fold up her doll's things and lull the inanimate treasure to sleep then she would sit and listen with an intensity of attention for his footstep once the nurse had expressed some wonder at the distance at which eleanor could hear her father's approach saying that she had listened and could not hear a sound to which eleanor had replied of course you cannot he is not your papa then when he went away in the morning after he had kissed her eleanor would run to a certain window from which she could watch him up the lane now hidden behind a hedge now reappearing through an open space again out of sight till he reached a great old beech tree where for an instant more she saw him and then she would turn away with a sigh sometimes reassuring her unspoken fears by saying softly to herself he will come home again to-night mr wilkins liked to feel his child dependent on him for all her pleasures he was even a little jealous of any one who devised a treat or conferred a present the first news of which did not come from or through him at last it was necessary that eleanor should have some more instruction than her good old nurse could give her father did not care to take upon himself the office of teacher which he thought he foresaw would necessitate occasional blame and occasional exercise of authority which might possibly render him less idolized by his little girl so he commissioned lady holster to choose out one among her many proteges for a governess to his daughter now lady holster who kept a sort of amateur county register office was only too glad to be made of use in this way but when she inquired a little further as to the sort of person required all she could extract from mr wilkins was you know the kind of education a lady should have and will i am sure choose a governess for eleanor better than i could direct you 
only please choose someone who will not marry me and who will let eleanor go on making my tea and doing pretty much what she likes for she's so good they need not try to make her better only to teach her what a lady should know miss munro was selected a plain intelligent quiet woman of forty and it was difficult to decide whether she or mr wilkins took the most pains to avoid each other acting with regard to eleanor pretty much like the famous adam and eve in the weather glass when the one came out and the other went in miss munro had been tossed about and overworked quite enough in her life not to value the privilege and indulgence of her evenings to herself her comfortable schoolroom her quiet cosy teas her book or her letter writing afterwards by mutual agreement she did not interfere with eleanor in her ways and occupations on the evenings when the girl had not her father for companion and these occasions became more and more frequent as years passed on and the deep shadow was lightened which the sudden death that had visited his household had cast over him as i have said before he was always a popular man at dinner parties his amount of intelligence and accomplishment was rare in this shire and if it required more wine than formerly to bring his conversation up to the desired point of range and brilliancy wine was not an article spared or grudged at the county dinner tables occasionally his business took him to london hurried as these journeys might be he never returned without a new game a new toy of some kind to make home pleasant to his little maid as he expressed himself he liked too to see what was doing in art or in literature and as he gave pretty extensive orders for anything he admired he was almost sure to be followed down to hamley by one or two packages or parcels the arrival and opening of which began soon to form the pleasant epochs in eleanor's grave though happy life the only person of his own standing with whom mr wilkins kept up any intercourse in hamley was the new clergyman a bachelor about his own age a learned man a fellow of his college whose first claim on mr wilkins's attention was the fact that he had been travelling bachelor for his university and had consequently been on the continent about the very same two years that mr wilkins had been there and although they had never met yet they had many common acquaintances and common recollections to talk over of this period which after all had been about the most bright and hopeful of mr wilkins's life mr ness had an occasional pupil that is to say he never put himself out of the way to obtain pupils but he did not refuse the entreaties sometimes made to him that he would prepare a young man for college by allowing the said young man to reside and read with him ness's men took rather high honors for the tutor too indolent to find out work for himself had a certain pride in doing well the work that was found for him when eleanor was somewhere about fourteen a young mr corbett came to be a pupil to mr ness her father always called on the young men reading with the clergyman and asked them to his house his hospitality had in course of time lost its recherche and elegant character but was always generous and often profuse besides it was in his character to like the joyous thoughtless company of the young better than that of the old given the same amount of refinement and education in both mr corbett was a young man of very good family from a distant county if his character had not been so grave and deliberate his years would only have entitled him to be called a boy for he was but eighteen at the time when he came to read with mr ness but many men of five-and-twenty have not reflected so deeply as this young mr corbett already had he had considered and almost matured his plan for life had ascertained what objects he desired most to accomplish in the dim future which is to many at this age only a shapeless mist and had resolved on certain steady courses of action by which such objects were most likely to be secured a younger son his family connections and family interest prearranged a legal career for him and it was in accordance with his own tastes and talents all however which his father hoped for him was that he might be able to make an income sufficient for a gentleman to live on old mr corbett was hardly to be called ambitious or if he were his ambition was limited to views for the eldest son but ralph intended to be a distinguished lawyer not so much for the vision of the woolsack which i suppose dances before the imagination of every young lawyer as for the grand intellectual exercise and consequent power over mankind that distinguished lawyers may always possess if they choose a seat in parliament statesmanship 
and all the great scope for a powerful and active mind that lay on each side of such a career these were the objects which ralph corbett set before himself to take high honors at college was the first step to be accomplished and in order to achieve this ralph had not persuaded persuasion was a weak instrument which he despised but gravely reasoned his father into consenting to pay the large sum which mr ness expected with a pupil the good-natured old squire was rather pressed for ready money but sooner than listen to an argument instead of taking his nap after dinner he would have yielded anything but this did not satisfy ralph his father's reason must be convinced of the desirability of the step as well as his weak will give way the squire listened looked wise sighed spoke of edward's extravagance and the girl's expenses grew sleepy and said very true that is but reasonable certainly glanced at the door and wondered when his son would have ended his talking and go into the drawing-room and at length found himself writing the desired letter to mr ness consenting to everything terms and all mr ness never had a more satisfactory pupil one whom he could treat more as an intellectual equal mr corbett as ralph was always called it in hamley was resolute in his cultivation of himself even exceeding what his tutor demanded of him he was greedy of information in the hours not devoted to absolute study mr ness enjoyed giving information but most of all he liked the hard tough arguments on all metaphysical and ethical questions in which mr corbett delighted to engage him they lived together on terms of happy equality having this much in common they were essentially different however although there were so many points of resemblance mr ness was unworldly as far as the idea of real unworldliness is compatible with a turn for self-indulgence and indolence while mr corbett was deeply radically worldly yet for the accomplishment of his object could deny himself all the careless pleasures natural to his age the tutor and pupil allowed themselves one frequent relaxation that of mr wilkins's company mr ness would stroll to the office after the six hours hard reading were over leaving mr corbett still bent over the table book bestrewn and see what mr wilkins's engagements were if he had nothing better to do that evening he was either asked to dine at the parsonage or he in his careless hospitable way invited the other two to dine with him eleanor forming the fourth at the table as far as seats went although her dinner had been eaten early with miss monroe she was little and slight of her age and her father never seemed to understand how she was passing out of childhood yet while in stature she was like a child in intellect in force of character in strength of clinging affection she was a woman there might be much of the simplicity of a child about her there was little of the undeveloped girl varying from day to day like an april sky careless as to which way her own character is tending so the two young people sat with their elders and both relished the company they were thus prematurely thrown into mr corbett talked as much as either of the other two gentlemen opposing and disputing on any side as if to find out how much he could urge against received opinions eleanor sat silent her dark eyes flashing from time to time in vehement interest sometimes in vehement indignation if mr corbett riding a tilt at every one ventured to attack her father he saw how this course excited her and rather liked pursuing it in consequence he thought it only amused him another way in which eleanor and mr corbett were thrown together occasionally was this mr ness and mr wilkins shared the same times between them and it was eleanor's duty to see that the paper was regularly taken from her father's house to the parsonage her father liked to dawdle over it until mr corbett had come to live with him mr ness had not much cared at what time it was passed on to him but the young man took a strong interest in all public events and especially in all that was said about them he grew impatient if the paper was not forthcoming and would set off himself to go for it sometimes meeting the penitent breathless eleanor in the long lane which led from hamley to mr wilkins's house at first he used to receive her eager oh i am sorry mr corbett but papa has only just done with it rather gruffly after a time he had the grace to tell her it did not signify and by and by he would turn back with her to give her some advice about her garden or her plants for his mother and sisters were first-rate practical gardeners 
and he himself was as he expressed it a capital consulting physician for a sickly plant all this time his voice his step never raised the child's color one shade the higher never made her heart beat the least quicker as the slightest sign of her father's approach was wont to do she learnt to rely on mr corbett for advice for a little occasional sympathy and for much condescending attention he also gave her more fault-finding than all the rest of the world put together and curiously enough she was grateful to him for it for she really was humble and wished to improve he liked the attitude of superiority which this implied and exercised right gave him they were very good friends at present nothing more all this time i have spoken only of mr wilkins's life as he stood in relation to his daughter but there is far more to be said about it after his wife's death he withdrew himself from society for a year or two in a more positive and decided manner than is common with widowers it was during this retirement of his that he riveted his little daughter's heart in such a way as to influence all her future life when he began to go out again it might have been perceived had one cared to notice how much the different characters of his father and wife had influenced him and kept him steady not that he broke out into any immoral conduct but he gave up time to pleasure which both old mr wilkins and latisse would have quietly induced him to spend in the office superintending his business his indulgence in hunting and all field sports had hitherto been only occasional they now became habitual as far as the seasons permitted he shared a moor in scotland with one of the holsters one year persuading himself that the bracing air was good for eleanor's health but the year afterwards he took another this time joining with a comparative stranger and in this moor there was no house to which it was fit to bring a child and her attendants he persuaded himself that by frequent journeys he could make up for his absences from hamley but journeys cost money and he was often away from his office when important business required attending to there was some talk of a new attorney setting up in hamley to be supported by one or two of the more influential county families who had found wilkins not so attentive as his father sir frank holster sent for his relation and told him of this project speaking to him at the same time in pretty round terms on the folly of the life he was leading foolish it certainly was and as such mr wilkins was secretly acknowledging it but when sir frank lashing himself began to talk of his hearer's presumption in joining the hunt in aping the mode of life and amusement of the landed gentry edward fired up he knew how much sir frank was dipped and comparing it with the round sum his own father had left him he said some plain truths to sir frank which the latter never forgave and henceforth there was no intercourse between holster court and ford bank as edward wilkins had christened his father's house on his first return from the continent the conversation had two consequences besides the immediate one of the quarrel mr wilkins advertised for a responsible and confidential clerk to conduct the business under his own superintendence and he also wrote to the herald's college to ask if he did not belong to the family bearing the same name in south wales those who have since reassumed their ancient name of de winton both applications were favorably answered a skilful experienced middle-aged clerk was recommended to him by one of the principal legal firms in london and immediately engaged to come to hamley at his own terms which were pretty high but as mr wilkins said it was worth any money to pay for the relief from constant responsibility with such a business as his involved some people remarked that he had never appeared to feel the responsibility very much hitherto as witness his absences in scotland and his various social engagements when at home it had been very different they said in his father's day the herald's college held out hopes of affiliating him to the south wales family but it would require time and money to make the requisite inquiries and substantiate the claim now in many a place there would be none to contest the right a man might have to assert that he belonged to such and such a family or even to assume their arms but it was otherwise in this shire every one was up in genealogy and heraldry and considered filching a name and a pedigree a far worse sin than any those mentioned in the commandments 
there were those among them who would doubt and dispute even the decision of the herald's college but with it if in his favor mr wilkins intended to be satisfied and accordingly he wrote in reply to their letter to say that of course he was aware such inquiries would take a considerable sum of money but still he wished them to be made and that speedily before the end of the year he went up to london to order a brougham to be built for eleanor to drive out in wet weather he said but as going in a closed carriage always made her ill he used it principally himself in driving to dinner parties with the de winton wilkins's arms neatly emblazoned on panel and harness hitherto he had always gone about in a dog-cart the immediate descendant of his father's old-fashioned gig for all this the squires his employers only laughed at him and did not treat him with one whit more respect mr dunster the new clerk was a quiet respectable-looking man you could not call him a gentleman in manner and yet no one could say he was vulgar he had not much varying expression on his face but a permanent one of thoughtful consideration of the subject in hand whatever it might be that would have fitted as well with the profession of medicine as with that of law and was quite the right look for either occasionally a bright flash of sudden intelligence lightened up his deep-sunk eyes but even this was quickly extinguished as by some inward repression and the habitually reflective subdued expression returned to the face as soon as he came into his situation he first began quietly to arrange the papers and next the business of which they were the outer sign into more methodical order than they had been in since old mr wilkins's death punctual to a moment himself he looked his displeased surprise when the inferior clerks came tumbling in half an hour after the time in the morning and his look was more effective than many men's words henceforward the subordinates were within five minutes of the appointed hour for opening the office but still he was always there before them mr wilkins himself winced under his new clerk's order and punctuality mr dunster raised eyebrow and contraction of the lips at some woeful confusion in the business of the office chafed mr wilkins more far more than any open expression of opinion would have done for that he could have met and explained away as he fancied a secret respectful dislike grew up in his bosom against mr dunster he esteemed him he valued him and he could not bear him year after year mr wilkins had become more under the influence of his feelings and less under the command of his reason he rather cherished than repressed his nervous repugnance to the harsh measured tones of mr dunster's voice the latter spoke with a provincial twang which grated on his employer's sensitive ear he was annoyed at a certain green coat which his new clerk brought with him and he watched its increasing shabbiness with a sort of childish pleasure but by and by mr wilkins found out that from some perversity of taste mr dunster always had his coats sunday and working day made of this obnoxious color and this knowledge did not diminish his secret irritation the worst of all perhaps was that mr dunster was really invaluable in many ways a perfect treasure as mr wilkins used to term him in speaking of him after dinner but for all that he came to hate his perfect treasure as he gradually felt that dunster had become so indispensable to the business that his chief could not do without him the clients re-echoed mr wilkins's words and spoke of mr dunster as invaluable to his master a thorough treasure the very saving of the business they had not been better attended to not even in old mr wilkins's days such a clear head such a knowledge of law such a steady upright fellow always at his post the grating voice the drawing accent the bottle green coat were nothing to them far less noticed in fact than wilkins's expensive habits the money he paid for his wine and horses and the nonsense of claiming kin with the welsh wilkinses and setting up his brougham to drive about the shire lanes and be knocked to pieces over the rough round paving stones thereof all these remarks did not come near eleanor to trouble her life to her her dear father was the first of human beings so sweet so good so kind so charming in conversation so full of accomplishment and information to her healthy happy mind every one turned their bright side 
she loved miss munro all the servants especially dixon the coachman he had been her father's playfellow as a boy and with all his respect and admiration for his master the freedom of intercourse that had been established between them then had never been quite lost dixon was a fine stalwart old fellow and was as harmonious in his ways with his master as mr dunster was discordant accordingly he was a great favorite and could say many a thing which might have been taken as impertinent from another servant he was eleanor's great confidant about many of her little plans and projects things that she dared not speak of to mr corbett who after her father and dixon was her next best friend this intimacy with dixon displeased mr corbett he once or twice insinuated that he did not think it was well to talk so familiarly as eleanor did with a servant one out of a completely different class such as dixon eleanor did not easily take hints every one had spoken plain out to her hitherto so mr corbett had to say his meaning plain out at last then for the first time he saw her angry but she was too young too childish to have words at will to express her feelings she only could say broken beginnings of sentences such as what a shame good dear dixon who is loyal and true and kind as any nobleman i like him far better than you mr corbett and i shall talk to him and then she burst into tears and ran away and would not come to wish mr corbett good-bye though she knew she should not see him again for a long time as he was returning the next day to his father's house from whence he would go to cambridge he was annoyed at this result of the good advice he had thought himself bound to give to a motherless girl who had no one to instruct her in the proprieties in which his own sisters were brought up he left hamley both sorry and displeased as for eleanor when she found out the next day that he really was gone gone without even coming to ford bank again to see if she were not penitent for her angry words gone without saying or hearing a word of good-bye she shut herself up in her room and cried more bitterly than ever because anger against herself was mixed with regret for his loss luckily her father was dining out or he would have inquired what was the matter with his darling and she would have had to try to explain what could not be explained as it was she sat with her back to the light during the schoolroom tea and afterwards when miss munro had settled down to her study of the spanish language eleanor stole out into the garden meaning to have a fresh cry over her own naughtiness and mr corbett's departure but the august evening was still and calm and put her passionate grief to shame hushing her up as it were with the other young creatures who were being soothed to rest by the serene time of day and the subdued light of the twilight sky there was a piece of ground surrounding the flower garden which was not shrubbery not wood not kitchen garden only a grassy bit out of which a group of old forest trees sprang their roots were heaved above the ground their leaves fell in autumn so profusely that the turf was ragged and bare in spring but to make up for this there never was such a place for snowdrops the roots of these old trees were eleanor's favorite play-place this space between these two was her doll's kitchen that its drawing-room and so on mr corbett rather despised her contrivances for doll's furniture so she had not often brought him here but dixon delighted in them and contrived and planned with the eagerness of six years old rather than forty to-night eleanor went to this place and there were all a new collection of ornaments for miss dolly's sitting-room made out of fur bobs in the prettiest and most ingenious way she knew it was dixon's doing and rushed off in search of him to thank him what's the matter with my pretty asked dixon as soon as the pleasant excitement of thanking and being thanked was over and he had leisure to look at her tear-stained face oh i don't know never mind she said reddening dixon was silent for a minute or two while she tried to turn off his attention by her hurried prattle there's no trouble afoot that i can mend asked he in a minute or two oh no it's really nothing nothing at all it's only that mr corbett went away without saying good-bye to me that's all and she looked as if she would have liked to cry again that was not manners said dixon decisively but it was my fault replied eleanor pleading against the condemnation dixon looked at her pretty sharply from under his ragged bushy eyebrows he had been giving me a lecture and saying i didn't do what his sisters did just as if i were to be always trying to be like somebody else and i was cross and ran away 
then it was missy who wouldn't say good-bye that was not manners in missy but dixon i don't like being lectured i reckon you don't get much of it but indeed my pretty i dare say mr corbett was in the right for you see master is busy and miss munro is so dreadful learned and your poor mother is dead and gone and you have no one to teach you how young ladies go on and by all accounts mr corbett comes of a good family i've heard say his father had the best stud farm in all of shropshire and spared no money upon it and the young ladies his sisters will have been taught the best of manners it might be well for my pretty to hear how they go on you dear old dixon you don't know anything about my lecture and i'm not going to tell you only i dare say mr corbett might be a little bit right though i'm sure he was a great deal wrong but you'll not go on a fretting you won't now there's a good young lady for master won't like it and it'll make him uneasy and he's enough of trouble without your red eyes bless them trouble papa trouble oh dixon what do you mean exclaimed eleanor her face taking all a woman's intensity of expression in a minute nay i know not said dixon evasively only that dunster fellow is not to my mind and i think he potters the master sadly with his fidvad ways i hate mr dunster said eleanor vehemently i won't speak a word to him the next time he comes to dine with papa missy will do what papa likes best said dixon admonishingly and with this the pair of friends parted End of section three. chapter four the summer afterwards mr corbett came again to read with mr ness he did not perceive any alteration in himself and indeed his early matured character had hardly made progress during the last twelve months whatever intellectual acquirements he might have made therefore it was astonishing to him to see the alteration in eleanor wilkins she had shot up from a rather puny girl to a tall slight young lady with promise of great beauty in the face which a year ago had only been remarkable for the fineness of the eyes her complexion was clear now although colourless twelve months ago he would have called it sallow her delicate cheek was smooth as marble her teeth were even and white and her rare smiles called out a lovely dimple she met her former friend and lecturer with a grave shyness for she remembered well how they had parted and thought he could hardly have forgiven much less forgotten her passionate flinging away from him but the truth was after the first few hours of offended displeasure he had ceased to think of it at all she poor child by way of proving her repentance had tried hard to reform her boisterous tomboy manners in order to show him that although she would not give up her dear old friend dixon at his or any one's bidding she would strive to profit by his lectures in all things reasonable the consequence was that she suddenly appeared to him as an elegant dignified young lady instead of the rough little girl he remembered still below her somewhat formal manners there lurked the old wild spirit as he could plainly see after a little more watching and he began to wish to call this out and to strive by reminding her of old days and her childish frolics to flavour her subdued manners and speech with a little of the former originality in this he succeeded no one neither mr wilkins nor miss munro nor mr ness saw what this young couple were about they did not know it themselves but before the summer was over they were desperately in love with each other or perhaps i should rather say eleanor was desperately in love with him he as passionately as he could be with any one but in him the intellect was superior in strength to either the affections or passions the causes of the blindness of those around them were these mr wilkins still considered eleanor as a little girl as his pet his darling but nothing more miss munro was anxious about her own improvement mr ness was deep in a new edition of horace which he was going to bring out with notes i believe dixon would have been keener sighted but eleanor kept mr corbett and dixon apart for obvious reasons they were each her dear friends but she knew that mr corbett did not like dixon and suspected that the feeling was mutual the only change of circumstances between this year and the previous one consisted in this development of attachment between the young people 
otherwise everything went on apparently as usual with eleanor the course of the day was something like this up early and into the garden until breakfast time when she made tea for her father and miss monroe in the dining-room always taking care to lay a little nosegay of freshly gathered flowers by her father's plate after breakfast when the conversation had been on general and indifferent subjects mr wilkins withdrew into the little study so often mentioned it opened out of a passage that ran between the dining-room and the kitchen on the left hand of the hall corresponding to the dining-room on the other side of the hall was the drawing-room with its side window serving as a door into the conservatory and this again opened into the library old mr wilkins had added a semicircular projection to the library which was lighted by a dome above and showed off his son's italian purchases of sculpture the library was by far the most striking and agreeable room in the house and the consequence was that the drawing-room was seldom used and had the aspect of cold discomfort common to apartments rarely occupied mr wilkins's study on the other side of the house was also an afterthought built only a few years ago and projecting from the regularity of the outside wall a little stone passage led to it from the hall small narrow and dark and out of which no other door opened the study itself was a hexagon one side window one fireplace and the remaining four sides occupied with doors two of which have been already mentioned another at the foot of the narrow winding stairs which led straight to mr wilkins's bedroom over the dining-room and the fourth opening into a path through the shrubbery to the right of the flower garden as you looked from the house the path led through the stable-yard and then by a short cut right into hamley and brought you out close by mr wilkins's office it was by this way he always went and returned to his business he used the study for a smoking and lounging room principally although he always spoke of it as a convenient place for holding confidential communications with such of his clients as did not like discussing their business within the possible hearing of all the clerks in his office by the outer door he could also pass to the stables and see that proper care was taken at all times of his favorite and valuable horses into this study eleanor would follow him of a morning helping him on with his great coat mending his gloves talking an infinite deal of merry fond nothing and then clinging to his arm she would accompany him in his visits to the stables going up to the shyest horses and petting them and patting them and feeding them with bread all the time that her father held converse with dixon when he was finally gone and sometimes it was a long time first she returned to the schoolroom to miss monroe and tried to set herself hard at work on her lessons but she had not much time for steady application if her father had cared for her progress in anything she would and could have worked hard at that study or accomplishment but mr wilkins the ease and pleasure-loving man did not wish to make himself into the pedagogue as he would have considered it if he had ever questioned eleanor with a real steady purpose of ascertaining her intellectual progress it was quite enough for him that her general intelligence and variety of desultory and miscellaneous reading made her a pleasant and agreeable companion for his hours of relaxation at twelve o'clock eleanor put away her books with joyful eagerness kissed miss monroe asked her if they should go a regular walk and was always rather thankful when it was decided that it would be better to stroll in the garden a decision very often come to for miss monroe hated fatigue hated dirt hated scrambling and dreaded rain all of which are evils the chances of which are never far distant from country walks so eleanor danced out into the garden worked away among the flowers played at the old games among the roots of the trees and when she could seduce dixon into the flower garden to have a little consultation as to the horses and dogs for it was one of her father's few strict rules that eleanor was never to go into the stable-yard unless he were with her so these tete-a-tetes with dixon were always held in the flower garden a bit of forest ground surrounding it miss monroe sat and basked in the sun close to the dial which made the centre of the gay flower beds upon which the dining-room and study windows looked at one o'clock eleanor and miss monroe dined an hour was allowed for miss monroe's digestion which eleanor again spent out of doors and at three lessons began again and lasted till five at that time they went to dress preparatory for the schoolroom tea at half-past five 
after tea eleanor tried to prepare her lessons for the next day but all the time she was listening for her father's footstep the moment she had heard that she dashed down her book and flew out of the room to welcome and kiss him seven was his dinner hour he hardly ever dined alone indeed he often dined from home four days out of seven and when he had no engagement to take him out he liked to have someone to keep him company mr ness very often mr corbett along with him if he was in hamley a stranger friend or one of his clients sometimes reluctantly and when he fancied he could not avoid the attention without giving offence mr wilkins would ask mr dunster and then the two would always follow eleanor into the library at a very early hour as if their subjects for tete-a-tete -tete conversation were quite exhausted with all his other visitors mr wilkins sat long yes and yearly longer with mr ness because they became interested in each other's conversation with some of the others because the wine was good and the host hated to spare it mr corbett used to leave his tutor and mr wilkins and saunter into the library there sat eleanor and miss munro each busy with their embroidery he would bring a stool to eleanor's side question and tease her interest her and they would become entirely absorbed in each other miss munro's sense of propriety being entirely set at rest by the consideration that mr wilkins must know what he was about in allowing a young man to become thus intimate with his daughter who after all was but a child mr corbett had lately fallen into the habit of walking up to ford bank for the times every day near twelve o'clock and lounging about in the garden until one not exactly with either eleanor or miss munro but certainly far more at the beck and call of the one than of the other miss munro used to think he would have been glad to stay and lunch at their early dinner but she never gave the invitation and he could not well stay without her expressed sanction he told eleanor about his mother and sisters and their ways of going on and spoke of them and of his father as of people she was one day certain to know and to know intimately and she did not question or doubt his view of things she simply acquiesced he had some discussion with himself as to whether he should speak to her and so secure her promise to be his before returning to cambridge or not he did not like the formality of an application to mr wilkins which would after all have been the proper and straightforward course to pursue with a girl of her age she was barely sixteen not that he anticipated any difficulty on mr wilkins's part his approval of the intimacy which at their respective ages was pretty sure to lead to an attachment was made as evident as could be by actions without words but there would have to be reference to his own father who had no notion of the whole affair and would be sure to treat it as a boyish fancy as if at twenty-one ralph was not a man as clear and deliberative in knowing his own mind as resolute as he ever would be in deciding upon the course of exertion that should lead him to independence and fame if such were to be attained by clear intellect and strong will no to mr wilkins he would not speak for another year or two but should he tell eleanor in direct terms of his love his intention to marry her again he inclined to the more prudent course of silence he was not afraid of any change in his own inclinations of them he was sure but he looked upon it in this way if he made a regular declaration to her she would be bound to tell it to her father he should not respect her or like her so much if she did not and yet this course would lead to all the conversations and discussions and references to his own father which made his own direct appeal to mr wilkins appear a premature step to him whereas he was as sure of eleanor's love for him as if she had uttered all the vows that women ever spoke he knew even better than she did how fully and entirely that innocent girl's heart was his own he was too proud to dread her inconstancy for an instant besides as he went on to himself as if to make assurance doubly sure whom does she see those stupid holsters who ought to be only too proud of having such a girl for their cousin ignore her existence and spoke slightly of her father only the very last time i dined there the country people of this precisely boytian shire clutch at me because my father goes up to the plantagenets for his pedigree not one whit for myself and neglect eleanor and only condescend to her father because old wilkins was nobody knows whose son so much the worse for them but so much the better for me in this case 
I'm above their silly, antiquated prejudices, and shall be only too glad when the fitting time comes to make Eleanor my wife. After all, a prosperous attorney's daughter may not be considered an unsuitable match for me, younger son as I am. Eleanor will make a glorious woman three or four years hence, just the style my father admires, such a figure, such limbs. I'll be patient and bide my time and watch my opportunities, and all will come right. So he bade Eleanor farewell in a most reluctant and affectionate manner, although his words might have been spoken out in Hamley Marketplace and were little different from what he said to Miss Monroe. Mr. Wilkins half expected a disclosure to himself of the love which he suspected in the young man, and when it did not come he prepared himself for a confidence from Eleanor, but she had nothing to tell him, as he very well perceived from the child's open, unembarrassed manner when they were left alone together after dinner. He had refused an invitation and shaken off Mr. Ness in order to have his confidential tete-a-tete -tete with his motherless girl, and there was nothing to make confidence of he was half inclined to be angry but then he saw that although sad she was so much at peace with herself and with the world that he always an optimist began to think the young man had done wisely in not tearing open the rosebud of her feelings too prematurely the next two years passed over in much the same way or a careless spectator might have thought so i have heard people say that if you look at a regiment advancing with steady step over a plain on a review day you can hardly tell that they are not merely marking time on one spot of ground, unless you compare their position with some other object by which to mark their progress, so even is the repetition of the movement. And thus the sad events of the future life of this father and daughter were hardly perceived in their steady advance, and yet over the monotony and flat uniformity of their days sorrow came marching down upon them like an armed man long before mr wilkins had recognized its shape it was approaching him in the distance as in fact it is approaching all of us at this very time you reader i writer have each our great sorrow bearing down upon us it may be yet beyond the dimmest point of our horizon but in the stillness of the night our hearts shrink at the sound of its coming footstep well it is for those who fall into the hands of the lord rather than into the hands of men but worst of all is it for him who has hereafter to mingle the gall of remorse with the cup held out to him by his doom mr wilkins took his ease and his pleasure yet more and more every year of his life nor did the quality of his ease and his pleasure improve it seldom does with self-indulgent people he cared less for any books that strained his faculties a little less for engravings and sculptures perhaps more for pictures he spent extravagantly on his horses thought of eating and drinking there was no open vice in all this so that any awful temptation to crime should come down upon him and startle him out of his mode of thinking and living half the people about him did much the same as far as their lives were patent to his unreflective observation but most of his associates had their duties to do and did them with a heart and a will in the hours when he was not in their company yes i call them duties though some of them might be self-imposed and purely social they were engagements they had entered into either tacitly or with words and that they fulfilled for mr hetherington the master of the hounds who was up at no one knows what hour to go down to the kennel and see that the men did their work well and thoroughly to stern old sir lionel playfair the upright magistrate the thoughtful conscientious landlord they did their work according to their lights there were few laggards among those with whom mr wilkins associated in the field or at the dinner-table mr ness though as a clergyman he was not so active as he might have been yet even mr ness fagged away with his pupils in his new edition of one of the classics only mr wilkins dissatisfied with his position neglected to fulfil the duties thereof he imitated the pleasures and longed for the fancied leisure of those about him leisure that he imagined would be so much more valuable in the hands of a man like himself full of intellectual tastes and accomplishments than frittered away by dull boors of untravelled uncultivated squires whose company however be it said by the way he never refused 
and yet daily mr wilkins was sinking from the intellectually to the sensually self-indulgent man he lay late in bed and hated mr dunster for his significant glance at the office clock when he announced to his master that such and such a client had been waiting more than an hour to keep an appointment why didn't you see him yourself dunster i'm sure you would have done quite as well as me mr wilkins sometimes replied partly with a view of saying something pleasant to the man whom he disliked and feared mr dunster always replied in a meek matter-of-fact tone oh sir they wouldn't like to talk over their affairs with a subordinate and every time he said this or some speech of the same kind the idea came more and more clearly into mr wilkins's head of how pleasant it would be to himself to take dunster into partnership and thus throw all the responsibility of the real work and drudgery upon his clerk's shoulders importunate clients who would make appointments at unreasonable hours and would keep to them might confide in the partner though they would not in the clerk the great objections to this course were first and foremost mr wilkins's strong dislike for mr dunster his repugnance to his company his dress his voice his ways all of which irritated his employer till his state of feeling towards dunster might be called antipathy next mr wilkins was fully aware of the fact that all mr dunster's actions and words were carefully and thoughtfully prearranged to further the great unspoken desire of his life that of being made a partner where he now was only a servant mr wilkins took a malicious pleasure in tantalizing mr dunster by such speeches as the one i have just mentioned which always seemed like an opening to the desired end but still for a long time never led any further yet all the while that end was becoming more and more certain and at last it was reached mr dunster always suspected that the final push was given by some circumstance from without some reprimand for neglect some threat of withdrawal of business which his employer had received but of this he could not be certain all he knew was that mr wilkins proposed the partnership to him in about as ungracious a way as such an offer could be made an ungraciousness which after all had so little effect on the real matter in hand that mr dunster could pass over it with private sneer while taking all possible advantage of the tangible benefit it was now in his power to accept mr corbett's attachment to eleanor had been formally disclosed to her just before this time he had left college entered at the middle temple and was fagging away at law and feeling success in his own power eleanor was to come out at the next hamley assemblies and her lover began to be jealous of the possible admirers her striking appearance and piquant conversation might attract and thought it a good time to make the success of his suit certain by spoken words and promises he needed not have alarmed himself even enough to make him take this step if he had been capable of understanding eleanor's heart as fully as he did her appearance in conversation she never missed the absence of formal words and promises she considered herself as fully engaged to him as much pledged to marry him and no one else before he had asked the final question as afterwards she was rather surprised at the necessity for those decisive words eleanor dearest will you can you marry me and her reply was given with a deep blush i must record and in a soft murmuring tone yes oh yes i never thought of anything else then i may speak to your father may not i darling he knows i'm sure he knows and he likes you so much oh how happy i am but still i must speak to him before i go when can i see him my eleanor i must go back to town at four o'clock i heard his voice in the stable only just before you came let me go and find out if he has gone to the office yet no to be sure he was not gone he was quietly smoking a cigar in his study sitting in an easy chair near the open window and leisurely glancing at the advertisements in the times he hated going to the office more and more since dunster had become a partner that fellow gave himself such airs of investigation and reprehension he got up took the cigar out of his mouth and placed a chair for mr corbett knowing well why he had thus formally prefaced his entrance into the room with can i have a few minutes conversation with you mr wilkins 
certainly my dear fellow sit down will you have a cigar no i never smoke mr corbett despised all these kinds of indulgences and put a little severity into his refusal but quite unintentionally for though he was thankful he was not as other men he was not at all the person to trouble himself unnecessarily with their reformation i want to talk to you about eleanor she says she thinks you must be aware of our mutual attachment well said mr wilkins he had resumed his cigar partially to conceal his agitation at what he knew was coming i believe i have had my suspicions it's not very long since i was young myself and he sighed over the recollection of latisse and his fresh hopeful youth and i hope sir as you have been aware of it and have never manifested any disapprobation of it that you will not refuse your consent a consent i now ask you for to our marriage mr wilkins did not speak for a little while a touch a thought a word more would have brought him to tears for at the last he found it hard to give the consent which would part him from his only child suddenly he got up and putting his hand into that of the anxious lover for his silence had rendered mr corbett anxious up to a certain point of perplexity he could not understand the implied he would and would not mr wilkins said yes god bless you both i will give her to you some day only it must be a long time first and now go away go back to her for i can't stand this much longer mr corbett returned to eleanor mr wilkins sat down and buried his head in his hands then went to his stable and had wildfire saddled for a good gallop over the country mr dunster waited for him in vain at the office where an obstinate old country gentleman from a distant part of the shire would ignore dunster's existence as a partner and pertinaciously demand to see mr wilkins on important business End of chapter four chapter five a few days afterwards eleanor's father bethought himself that same further communication ought to take place between him and his daughter's lover regarding the approval of the family of the latter to the young man's engagement and he accordingly wrote a very gentlemanly letter saying that of course he trusted that rolf had informed his father of his engagement that mr corbett was well known to mr wilkins by reputation holding the position which he did in shropshire but that as mr wilkins did not pretend to be in the same station of life mr corbett might possibly never even have heard of his name although in his own county it was well known as having been for generations that of the principal conveyancer and land agent of blankshire that his wife had been a member of that old knightly family of holsters and that he himself was descended from a younger branch of the south wales de wintons or wilkins that eleanor as his only child would naturally inherit all his property but that in the meantime of course some settlement upon her would be made the nature of which might be decided nearer at the time of the marriage it was a very good straightforward letter and well fitted for the purpose to which mr wilkins knew it would be applied of being forwarded to the young man's father one would have thought that it was not an engagement so disproportionate in point of station as to cause any great opposition on that score but unluckily captain corbett the heir and eldest son had just formed a similar engagement with lady maria brabant the daughter of one of the proudest earls in blankshire who had always resented mr wilkins's appearance on the field as an insult to the county and ignored his presence at every dinner-table where they met lady maria was visiting the corbetts at the very time when Ralph's letter enclosing mr wilkins reached the paternal halls and she merely repeated her father's opinions when mrs corbett and her daughters naturally questioned her as to who these wilkinses were they remembered the name in Ralph's letters formerly the father was some friend of mr ness's the clergyman with whom Ralph had read they believed Ralph used to dine with these wilkinses sometime along with mr ness lady maria was a good-natured girl and meant no harm in repeating her father's words touched up it is true by some of the dislike she herself felt to the intimate alliance it proposed which would make her sister-in-law to the daughter of an upstart attorney not received in the county 
always trying to push his way into the set above him, claiming connection with the de Wintons of Blaincastle, who, as she well knew, only laughed when he was spoken of, and said they were more rich in relations than they were aware of. Not people Papa would ever like her to know, whatever might be the family connection. These little speeches, told in a way which the girl who uttered them did not intend they should. Mrs. Corbett and her daughters set themselves violently against this foolish entanglement of Rolf's. They would not call it an engagement, they argued, and they urged, and they pleaded, till the squire, anxious for peace at any price, and always more under the sway of the people who were with him, however unreasonable they might be, than of the absent, even though these had the wisdom of Solomon, or the prudence and sagacity of his son Rolf, wrote an angry letter, saying that, as Rolf was of age, of course he had a right to please himself. Therefore all his father could say was that the engagement was not at all what either he or Rolf's mother had expected or hoped, that it was a degradation to the family just going to ally themselves with a peer of James the First's creation, that of course Rolf must do as he liked, but that if he married this girl he must never expect to have her received by the Corbetts of Corbett Hall as a daughter. The squire was rather satisfied with his production, and took it to show to his wife, but she did not think it was strong enough, and added a little postscript. Dear Rolf, though, as second son, you are entitled to Bromley and my death, yet I can do much to make that estate worthless. Hitherto, regard for you has prevented my taking steps as to sell of timber, etc., which would materially increase your sister's portions. This just measure I shall infallibly take, if I find you persevere in keeping to the silly engagement. Your father's disapproval is always a sufficient reason to allege. Rolf was annoyed at the receipt of these letters, though he only smiled as he locked them up in his desk. Dear old father, how he blusters! As to my mother, she is reasonable when I talk to her. Once give her a definite idea of what Eleanor's fortune will be, and let her, if she chooses, cut down her timber, a threat she has held over me ever since I knew what a rocking horse was, and which I have known to be illegal these ten years past. And she'll come around. I know better than they do how Reginald had run up post obits, and as for that vulgar, high-born Lady Maria they are all so full of, why, she is a Flanders mare to my Eleanor, and has not a silver penny to cross herself with, besides. I bide my time, you dear good people." He did not think it necessary to reply to these letters immediately, nor did he even allude to their contents in his To Eleanor. Mr. Wilkins, who had been very well satisfied with his own letter to the young man, and had thought that it must be equally agreeable to every one, was not at all suspicious of any disapproval, because the fact of a distinct sanction on the part of Mr. Ralph Corbett's friends to his engagement was not communicated to him. As for Eleanor, she trembled all over with happiness. Such a summer for the blossoming of flowers and ripening of fruit had not been known for years. It seemed to her as if bountiful loving nature wanted to fill the cup of Eleanor's joy to overflowing, and as if everything, animate and inanimate, sympathized with her happiness. Her father was well, and apparently content. Miss Monroe was very kind. Dixon's lameness was quite gone off. Only Mr. Dunster came creeping about the house, on pretense of business, seeking out her father, and disturbing all his leisure with his dust-coloured parchment-skin careworn face, and seeming to disturb the smooth current of her daily life whenever she saw him. Eleanor made her appearance at the Hamley assemblies, but with less éclat than either her father or her lover expected. Her beauty and natural grace were admired by those who could discriminate, but to the greater number there was what they called a want of style, Want of elegance? There certainly was not, for her figure was perfect, and though she moved shyly, she moved well. Perhaps it was not a good place for a correct appreciation of Miss Wilkins. Some of the old dowagers thought it a piece of presumption in her to be there at all, but the lady holster of the day, who remembered her husband's quarrel with Mr. Wilkins, and looked away whenever Eleanor came near, resented this opinion. Miss Wilkins is descended from Sir Frank's family, one of the oldest in the county. The objection might have been made years ago to the father, but as he had been received 
she did not know why miss wilkins was to be alluded to as out of her place eleanor's greatest enjoyment in the evening was to hear her father say after all was over and they were driving home well i thought my nelly the prettiest girl there and i think i know some other people who would have said the same if they could have spoken out thank you papa said eleanor squeezing his hand which she held she thought he alluded to the absent rolf as a person who would have agreed with him had he had the opportunity of seeing her but no he seldom thought much of the absent but had been rather flattered by seeing lord hildebrand take up his glass for the apparent purpose of watching eleanor your pearls too were as handsome as any in the room child but we must have them reset the sprays are old-fashioned now let me have them to-morrow to send up to hancock papa please i had rather keep them as they are as mamma wore them he was touched in a minute very well darling god bless you for thinking of it but he ordered her a set of sapphires instead for the next assembly these balls were not such as to intoxicate eleanor with success and make her in love with gaiety large parties came from the different country houses in the neighborhood and danced with each other when they had exhausted the resources they brought with them they had generally a few dances to spare for friends of the same standing with whom they were most intimate eleanor came with her father and joined an old card-playing dowager by way of a chaperone the said dowager being under old business obligations to the firm of wilkins and son and apologizing to all her acquaintance for her own weak condescension to mr wilkins's foible and wishing to introduce his daughter into society above her natural sphere it was upon this lady after she had uttered some such speech as the one i have just mentioned that lady holster had come down with the pedigree of eleanor's mother but though the old dowager had drawn back a little discomfited at my lady's reply she was not more attentive to eleanor in consequence she allowed mr wilkins to bring in his daughter and place her on the crimson sofa beside her spoke to her occasionally in the interval that elapsed before the rubbers could be properly arranged in the card-room invited the girl to accompany her to that sober amusement and on eleanor's declining and preferring to remain with her father the dowager left her with a sweet smile on her plump countenance and an approving conscience somewhere within a portly frame assuring her that she had done all that could possibly have been expected from her towards that good wilkins daughter eleanor stood by her father watching the dances and thankful for the occasional chance of a dance while she had been sitting by her at chaperone mr wilkins had made the tour of the room dropping out the little fact of his daughter's being present wherever he thought the seed likely to bring forth the fruit of partners and some came because they liked mr wilkins and some asked eleanor because they had done their duty dances to their own party and might please themselves so that she usually had an average of one invitation to every three dances and this principally towards the end of the evening but considering her real beauty and the care which her father always took about her appearance she met with far less than her due of admiration admiration she did not care for partners she did and sometimes felt mortified when she had to sit or stand quiet during all the first part of the evening if it had not been for her father's wishes she would much rather have stayed at home but nevertheless she talked even to the irresponsive old dowager and fairly chatted to her father when she got beside him because she did not like him to fancy that she was not enjoying herself and indeed she had so much happiness in the daily course of this part of her life that on looking back upon it afterwards she could not imagine anything brighter than it had been the delight of receiving her lover's letters the anxious happiness of replying to them always a little bit fearful that she should not express herself in her love in the precisely happy medium becoming a maiden the father's love and satisfaction in her the calm prosperity of the whole household was delightful at the time and looking back upon it it was dreamlike occasionally mr corbett came down to see her he had always slept on these occasions at mr ness's but he was at ford bank the greater part of the one day between two nights that he allowed himself for the length of his visits and even these short peeps were not frequently taken he was working hard at law faking at it tooth and nail arranging his whole life so as best to promote the ends of his ambition feeling a delight in surpassing and mastering his fellows those who started in the race at the same time he read eleanor's letters over and over again 
nothing else beside the law books he perceived the repressed love hidden away in subdued expressions in her communications with an amused pleasure at the attempt at concealment he was glad that her gaieties were not more gay he was glad that she was not too much admired although a little indignant at the want of taste on the part of the blankshire gentleman but if other admirers had come prominently forward he would have had to take some more decided steps to assert his rights than he had hitherto done for he had caused elinor to express a wish to her father that her engagement should not be too much talked about until nearer the time when it would be prudent for him to marry her he thought that the knowledge of this the only imprudently hasty step he had ever meant to take in his life might go against his character for wisdom if the fact became known while he was as yet only a student mr wilkins wondered a little but acceded as he always did to any of elinor's requests mr ness was a confidant of course and some of lady maria's connections heard of it and forgot it again very soon and as it happened no one else was sufficiently interested in elinor to care to ascertain the fact all this time mr ralph corbett maintained a very quietly decided attitude towards his own family he was engaged to miss wilkins and all he could say was he felt sorry that they disapproved of it he was not able to marry just at present and before the time for his marriage arrived he trusted that his family would take a more reasonable view of things and be willing to receive her as his wife with all becoming respect or affection this was the substance of what he repeated in different forms of reply to his father's angry letters at length his invariable determination made way with his father the paternal thunderings were subdued to a distant rumbling in the sky and presently the inquiry was broached as to how much fortune miss wilkins would have how much down on her marriage what were the eventual probabilities now this was a point which mr ralph corbett himself wished to be informed upon he had not thought much about it in making the engagement he had been too young or too much in love but an only child of a wealthy attorney ought to have something considerable and an allowance so as to enable the young couple to start housekeeping in a moderately good part of town would be advantage to him in his profession so he replied to his father adroitly suggesting that a letter containing certain modifications of the inquiry which had been rather roughly put in mr corbett's last should be sent to him in order that he might himself ascertain from mr wilkins what were elinor's prospects as regarded fortune the desired letter came but not in such a form that he could pass it on to mr wilkins he preferred to make quotations and even these quotations were a little altered and dressed before he sent them on the gist of his letter to mr wilkins was this he stated that he hoped soon to be in a position to offer elinor a home that he anticipated a steady progress in his profession and consequently in his income but that contingencies might arise as his father suggested which would deprive him of the power of earning a livelihood perhaps when it might be more required than it would be at first that it was true that after his mother's death a small estate in shropshire would come to him as a second son and of course elinor would receive the benefits of this property secured to her legally as mr wilkins thought best that being a matter for after discussion but that at present his father was anxious as might be seen from the extract to ascertain whether mr wilkins could secure him from the contingency of having his son's widow and possible children thrown upon his hands by giving elinor a dowry and if so it was gently insinuated what would be the amount of the same when mr wilkins received this letter it startled him out of a happy daydream he liked ralph corvett and the whole connection quite well enough to give his consent to an engagement and sometimes even he was glad to think that elinor's future was assured and that she would have a protector and friends after he was dead and gone but he did not want them to assume their responsibilities so soon he had not distinctly contemplated her marriage as an event likely to happen before his death he could not understand how his own life would go on without her or indeed why she and rolf at corbett could not continue just as they were at present he came down to breakfast with the letter in his hand but elinor's blushes as she glanced at the handwriting he knew that she had heard from her lover by the same post by her tender caresses caresses given as if to make up for the pain which the prospect of her leaving him was sure to cause him he was certain that she was aware of the contents of the letter yet he put it in his pocket and tried to forget it 
he did this not merely from reluctance to complete any arrangement which might facilitate elinor's marriage there was a further annoyance connected with the affair his money matters had been for some time in an involved state he had been living beyond his income even reckoning that as he always did at the highest point which it ever touched he kept no regular accounts reasoning with himself or perhaps i should rather say persuading himself that there was no great occasion for regular accounts when he had a steady income arising from his profession as well as the interest of a good sum of money left him by his father and when living in his own house near a country town where provisions were cheap his expenditure for a small family only one child could never amount to anything like his incomings from the above-mentioned sources but servants and horses and choice wines and rare fruit trees and a habit of purchasing any book or engraving that may take the fancy irrespective of the price run away with money even though there be but one child a year or two ago mr wilkins had been startled into a system of exaggerated retrenchment retrenchment which only lasted about six weeks by the sudden bursting of a bubble speculation in which he had invested a part of his father's savings but as soon as the change in his habits necessitated by his irksome new economies became irksome he had comforted himself for his relapse into his former easy extravagance of living by remembering the fact that elinor was engaged to the son of a man of large property and that though rolf was only the second son yet his mother's estate must come to him as mr ness had already mentioned on first hearing of her engagement mr wilkins did not doubt that he could easily make elinor a fitting allowance or even pay down a requisite dowry but the doing so would involve an examination into the real state of his affairs and this involved distasteful trouble he had no idea how much more than mere temporary annoyance would arise out of the investigation until it was made he decided in his own mind that he would not speak to elinor on the subject of her lover's letter so for the next few days she was kept in suspense seeing little of her father and during the short time she was with him she was made aware that he was nervously anxious to keep the conversation engaged on general topics rather than on the one which she had at heart as i have already said mr corbett had written to her by the same post as that on which he sent the letter to her father telling her of its contents and begging her in all those sweet words which lovers know how to use to urge her father to compliance for his sake his her lovers who was pining and lonely in all the crowds of london since her loved presence was not there he did not care for money save as a means of hastening their marriage indeed if there were only some income fixed however small some time for their marriage fixed however distant, he could be patient he did not want superfluity of wealth his habits were simple as she well knew and money enough would be theirs in time both from her share of contingencies and the certainty of his finally possessing bromley elinor delayed replying to this letter until her father should have spoken to her on the subject but as she perceived that he avoided all such conversation the young girl's heart failed her she began to blame herself for wishing to leave him to reproach herself for being accessory to any step which made him shun being alone with her and look distressed and full of care as he did now it was the usual struggle between father and lover for the possession of love instead of the natural and graceful resignation of the parent to the prescribed course of things and as usual it was the poor girl who bore the suffering for no fault of her own although she blamed herself for being the cause of the disturbance in the previous order of affairs elinor had no one to speak to confidentially but her father and her lover and when they were at issue she could talk openly to neither so she brooded over mr corbett's unanswered letter and her father's silence and became pale and dispirited once or twice she looked up suddenly and caught her father's eye gazing upon her with a certain wistful anxiety but the instant she saw this he pulled himself up as it were and would begin talking gaily about the small topics of the day at length mr corbett grew impatient at not hearing either from mr wilkins or elinor and wrote urgently to the former making known to him a new proposal suggested to him by his father which was that a certain sum should be paid down by mr wilkins to be applied under the management of trustees to the improvement of the bromley estate out of the profits of which 
or other resources in the elder mr corbett's hands a heavy rate of interest should be paid on this advance which would secure an income to the young couple immediately and considerably increase the value of the estate upon which eleanor's settlement was to be made the terms offered for this laying down of ready money were so advantageous that mr wilkins was strongly tempted to accede to them at once as eleanor's pale cheek and want of appetite had only that very morning smote upon his conscience and this immediate transfer of ready money was as a sacrifice a soothing balm to his self-reproach and laziness and dislike to immediate unpleasantness of action had its counterbalancing weakness in imprudence mr wilkins made some rough calculations on a piece of paper deeds and all such tests of accuracy being down at the office discovered that he could pay down the sum required wrote a letter agreeing to the proposal and before he sealed it called eleanor into his study and bade her read what he had been writing and tell him what she thought of it he watched the colour come rushing into her white face her lips quiver and tremble and even before the letter was ended she was in his arms kissing him and thanking him with blushing caresses rather than words there there said he smiling and sighing that will do why i do believe you took me for a hard-hearted father just like a heroine's father in a book you've looked as woe-begone this week past as ophelia one can't make up one's mind in a day about such sums of money as this little woman and you should have let your old father have time to consider oh papa i was only afraid you were angry well if i was a bit perplexed seeing you look so ill and pining was not the way to bring me round old corbett i must say is trying to make a good bargain for his son it is well for me that i have never been an extravagant man but papa we don't want all this much yes yes it is all right you shall go into their family as a well-proportioned girl if you can't go as a lady maria come don't trouble your little head any more about it give me one more kiss and then we'll go and order the horses and have a ride together by way of keeping holiday i deserve a holiday don't i nelly some country people at work at the roadside as the father and daughter passed along stopped to admire their bright happy looks and one spoke of the hereditary handsomeness of the wilkins family for the old man the present mr wilkins father had been fine-looking in his drab breeches and gaiters and usual assumption of a yell man's dress another said it was easy for the rich to be handsome they had always plenty to eat and could ride when they were tired of walking and had no care for the morrow to keep them from sleeping at nights and in sad acquiescence with their contrasted lot the men went on with their hedging and ditching in silence and yet if they had known if the poor did know the troubles and temptations of the rich if those men had foreseen the lot darkening over the father and including the daughter in its cloud if mr wilkins himself had even imagined such a future possible well there was truth in the old heathen saying let no man be envied till his death eleanor had no more rides with her father no not ever again though they had stopped that afternoon at the summit of a breezy common and looked at a ruined hall not so very far off and discussed whether they could reach it that day and decided that it was too far away for anything but a hurried inspection and that some day soon they would make the old place into the principal object of an excursion but a rainy time came on when no rides were possible and whether it was the influence of the weather or some other care or trouble that oppressed him mr wilkins seemed to lose all wish for much active exercise and rather sought a stimulus to his spirits and circulation and wine but of this eleanor was innocently unaware he seemed dull and weary and sat long drowsing and drinking after dinner if the servants had not been so fond of him for much previous generosity and kindness they would have complained now and with reason of his irritability for all sorts of things seemed to annoy him you should get the master to take a ride with you miss said dixon one day as he was putting eleanor on her horse he's not looking well he's studying too much at the office but when eleanor named it to her father he rather hastily replied that it was all very well for women to ride out whenever they liked men had something else to do and then as he saw her look grave and puzzled he softened down his abrupt saying by adding that dunster had been making a fuss about his partner's non-attendance and altogether taking a good deal upon himself in a very offensive way so that he thought it better to go pretty regularly to the office in order to show him who was master senior partner and head of business at any rate 
Eleanor sighed a little over her disappointment at her father's preoccupation, and then forgot her own little regret and anger at Mr. Dunster, who had seemed all along to be a thorn in her father's side, and had latterly gained some power and authority over him, the exercise of which Eleanor could not help thinking was a very impertinent line of conduct from a junior partner, so lately only a paid clerk to a superior. There was a sense of something wrong in the Ford Bank household for many weeks about this time. Mr. Wilkins was not like himself, and his cheerful ways and careless, genial speeches were missed, even on the days when he was not irritable and evidently uneasy with himself and all about him. The spring was late in coming, and cold rain and sleep made any kind of outdoor exercise a trouble and discomfort rather than a bright natural event in the course of the day. All sound of winter gaieties, of assemblies and meets, and jovial dinners had died away, and the summer pleasures were as yet unthought of. Still, Eleanor had a secret perennial source of sunshine in her heart. Whenever she thought of Rolf, she could not feel much oppression from the present unspoken and indistinct gloom. He loved her, and oh, how she loved him! And perhaps this very next autumn, that depended on his own success in his profession. After all, if it was not this autumn, it would be the next, and with the letters that she received weekly, and the occasional visits that her lover ran down to Hamley to pay Mr. Ness, Eleanor felt as if she would almost prefer the delay of the time when she must leave her father's for her husband's roof. End of chapter 5 Recording by Grace Byrne OddlyAware.com Chapter 6 At Easter, just when the heavens and earth were looking their dreariest, for Easter fell very early this year, Mr. Corbett came down. Mr. Wilkins was too busy to see much of him. They were together even less than usual, although not less friendly when they did meet. But to Eleanor the visit was one of unmixed happiness. Hitherto she had always had a little fear mingled up with her love of Mr. Corbett. But his manners were softened, his opinions less decided and abrupt, and his whole treatment of her showed such tenderness that the young girl basked and reveled in it. One or two of their conversations had reference to their future married life in London, and she then perceived, although it did not jar against her, that her lover had not forgotten his ambition in his love. He tried to inoculate her with something of his own craving for success in life, but it was all in vain. She nestled to him and told him she did not care to be the Lord Chancellor's wife. Wigs and wool sacks were not in her line. Only if he wished it, she would wish it. The last two days of his stay the weather changed. Sudden heat burst forth, as it does occasionally for a few hours, even in our chilly English spring. The grey-brown bushes and trees started almost with visible progress into the tender green shade, which is the forerunner of the bursting leaves. The sky was of full, cloudless blue. Mr. Wilkins was to come home pretty early from the office to ride out with his daughter and her lover. But after waiting some time for him it grew too late, and they were obliged to give up the project. Nothing would serve Eleanor then but that she must carry out a table and have tea in the garden, on the sunny side of the tree, among the roots of which she used to play when a child. Miss Monroe objected a little to this caprice of Eleanor's, saying that it was too early for out-of-door meals. But Mr. Corbett overruled all objections, and helped her in her gay preparations. She always kept to the early hours of her childhood, although she, as then, regularly sat with her father at his late dinner, and this meal al fresco was to be a reality to her and Miss Monroe. There was a place arranged for her father, and she seized upon him as he was coming from the stable-yard by the shrubbery path to his study, and with merry playfulness made him a prisoner, accusing him of disappointing them of their ride, and drawing him more than half unwilling to his chair by the table. 
but he was silent and almost sad his presence damped them all they could hardly tell why for he did not object to anything though he seemed to enjoy nothing and only to force a smile at eleanor's occasional sallies these became more and more rare as she perceived her father's depression she watched him anxiously he perceived it and said shivering in that strange unaccountable manner which is popularly explained by the expression that someone is passing over the earth that will one day form your grave eleanor this is not a day for out-of-door tea i never felt so chilly a spot in my life i cannot keep from shaking where i sit i must leave this place my dear in spite of all your good tea oh papa i am so sorry but look how full that hot sun's rays come on this turf i thought i had chosen such a capital spot but he got up and persisted in leaving the table although he was evidently sorry to spoil the little party he walked up and down the gravel walk close by them talking to them as he kept passing by and trying to cheer them up are you warmer now papa asked eleanor oh yes all right it's only that place it seems so chilly and damp i'm as warm as a toast now the next morning mr corbett left them the unseasonably fine weather passed away too and all things went back to their rather gray and dreary aspect but eleanor was too happy to feel this much knowing what absent love existed for her alone and from this knowledge unconsciously trusting in the sun behind the clouds i have said that few or none in the immediate neighborhood of hamley beside their own household and mr ness knew of eleanor's engagement at one of the rare dinner parties to which she accompanied her father it was at the old lady's house who chaperoned her to the assemblies she was taken in to dinner by a young clergyman staying in the neighborhood he had just had a small living given to him in his own county and he felt as if this was a great step in his life he was good innocent and rather boyish in appearance eleanor was happy and at her ease and chatted away to this mr livingstone on many little points of interest which they found they had in common church music and the difficulty they had in getting people to sing in parts salisbury cathedral which they had both seen styles of church architecture ruskin's works and parish schools in which mr livingstone was somewhat shocked to find that eleanor took no great interest when the gentlemen came in from the dining-room it struck eleanor for the first time in her life that her father had taken more wine than was good for him indeed this had rather become a habit with him of late but as he always tried to go quietly off to his own room when such had been the case his daughter had never been aware of it before and the perception of it now made her cheeks hot with shame she thought that every one must be as conscious of his altered manner and way of speaking as she was and after a pause of sick silence during which she could not say a word she set to and talked to mr livingstone about parish schools anything with redoubled vigor and apparent interest in order to keep one or two of the company at least from noticing what was to her so painfully obvious the effect of her behavior was far more than she had intended she kept mr livingstone it is true from observing her father but she also riveted his attention on herself he had thought her very pretty and agreeable during dinner but after dinner he considered her bewitching irresistible he dreamed of her all night and wakened up the next morning to a calculation of how far his income would allow him to furnish his pretty new parsonage with that crowning blessing a wife for a day or two he did up little sums and sighed and thought of eleanor her face listening with admiring interest to his sermons 
her arm passed into his as they went together round the parish her sweet voice instructing classes in his schools turn where he would in his imagination eleanor's presence rose up before him the consequence was that he wrote an offer which he found a far more perplexing piece of composition than a sermon a real hearty expression of love going on over all obstacles to a straightforward explanation of his present prospects and future hopes and winding up with the information that on the succeeding morning he would call to know whether he might speak to mr wilkins on the subject of this letter it was given to eleanor in the evening as she was sitting with miss monroe in the library mr wilkins was dining out she hardly knew where as it was a sudden engagement of which he had sent word from the office a gentleman's dinner party she supposed as he had dressed in hamley without coming home eleanor turned over the letter when it was brought to her as some people do when they cannot recognize the handwriting as if to discover from paper or seal what two moments would assure them of if they opened the letter and looked at the signature eleanor could not guess who had written it by any outward sign but the moment she saw the name herbert livingston the meaning of the letter flashed upon her and she colored all over she put the letter away unread for a few minutes and then made some excuse for leaving the room and going upstairs when safe in her bedchamber she read the young man's eager words with a sense of self-reproach how must she engaged to one man have been behaving to another if this was the result of a single evening's interview the self-reproach was unjustly bestowed but with that we have nothing to do she made herself very miserable and at last went down with a heavy heart to go on with dante and rummage up words in the dictionary all the time she seemed to miss monroe to be plodding on with her italian more diligently and sedately than usual she was planning in her own mind to speak to her father as soon as he returned and he had said that he should not be late and beg him to undo the mischief she had done by seeing mr livingstone the next morning and frankly explaining the real state of affairs to him but she wanted to read her letter again and think it all over in peace and so at an early hour she wished miss monroe good night and went up to her own room above the drawing-room and overlooking the flower-garden and shrubbery path to the stable-yard by which her father was sure to return she went upstairs and studied her letter well and tried to recall all her speeches and conduct on that miserable evening as she thought it then not knowing what true misery was her head ached and she put out the candle and went and sat on the window seat looking out into the moonlit garden watching for her father she opened the window partly to cool her forehead partly to enable her to call down softly when she should see him coming along by and by the door from the stable yard into the shrubbery clicked and opened and in a moment she saw mr wilkins moving through the bushes but not alone mr dunster was with him and the two were talking together in rather excited tones immediately lost to hearing however as they entered mr wilkins's study by the outer door they have been dining together somewhere probably at mr hanbury's the hamley brewer thought eleanor but how provoking that he should have come home with papa this night of all nights two or three times before mr dunster had called on mr wilkins in the evening as eleanor knew but she was not quite aware of the reason for such late visits and had never put together the two facts as cause and consequence that on such occasions her father had been absent from the office all day and that there might be necessary business for him to transact the urgency of which was the motive for mr dunster's visits mr wilkins always seemed to be annoyed by his coming at so late an hour and spoke of it resenting the intrusion upon his leisure 
and Eleanor, without consideration, adopted her father's mode of speaking and thinking on the subject, and was rather more angry than he was whenever the obnoxious partner came on business in the evening. This night was, of all nights, the most ill-purposed time, so Eleanor thought, for a tete-a-tete -tete with her father. However, there was no doubt in her mind as to what she had to do. So late as it was, the unwelcome visitor could not stop long, and then she would go down and have her little confidence with her father, and beg him to see Mr. Livingston when he came next morning, and dismiss him as gently as might be. She sat on in the window seat, dreaming waking dreams of future happiness. She kept losing herself in such thoughts, and became almost afraid of forgetting why she sat there. Presently she felt cold, and got up to fetch a shawl in which she muffled herself and resumed her place. It seemed to her growing very late. The moonlight was coming fuller and fuller into the garden, and the blackness of the shadow was more concentrated and stronger. Surely Mr. Dunster could not have gone away along the dark shrubbery path so noiselessly, but what she must have heard him. No, there was the swell of voices coming up through the window from her father's study. Angry voices they were and her anger rose sympathetically as she knew that her father was being irritated. There was a sudden movement as of chairs pushed hastily aside, and then a mysterious, unaccountable noise, heavy, sudden, and then a slight movement as of chairs again, and then a profound stillness. Eleanor leaned her head against the side of the window to listen more intently, for some mysterious instinct made her sick and faint. No sound, no noise. Only by and by she heard what we have all heard at such times of intent listening, the beating of the pulses of her heart, and then the whirling rush of blood through her head. How long did this last? She never knew. By and by she heard her father's hurried footstep in his bedroom next to hers. But when she ran thither to speak to him and ask him what was amiss, if anything had been, if she might come to him now about Mr. Livingston's letter, she found that he had gone down again to his study, and almost at the same moment she heard the little private outer door of that room open. Someone went out and then there were hurried footsteps along the shrubbery path. She thought, of course, that it was Mr. Dunster leaving the house, and went back for Mr. Livingston's letter. Having found it, she passed through her father's room to the private staircase, thinking that if she went by the more regular way she would have run the risk of disturbing Miss Monroe, and perhaps of being questioned in the morning. Even in passing down this remote staircase she trod softly, for fear of being overheard. When she entered the room the full light of the candles dazzled her for an instant, coming out of the darkness. They were flaring wildly in the draught that came in through the open door, by which the outer air was admitted. For a moment there seemed no one in the room. And then she saw, with strange, sick horror, the legs of someone lying on the carpet behind the table. As if compelled, even while she shrank from doing it, she went round to see who it was that lay there so still and motionless as never to stir at her sudden coming. It was Mr. Dunster, his head propped on chair cushions, his eyes open, staring distended. There was a strong smell of brandy and heart's horn in the room, a smell so powerful as not to be neutralized by the free current of night air that blew through the two open doors. Eleanor could not have told whether it was reason or instinct that made her act as she did during this awful night. And thinking of it afterwards, with shuddering avoidance of the haunting memory that would come and overshadow her during many, many years of her life, she grew to believe that the powerful smell of the spilt brandy absolutely intoxicated her, 
an unconscious reekabite in practice but something gave her a presence of mind and a courage not her own and though she learned to think afterwards that she had acted unwisely if not wrongly and wickedly yet she marvelled in recalling that time how she could have then behaved as she did first of all she lifted herself up from her fascinated gaze at the dead man and went to the staircase door by which she had entered the study and shut it softly then she went back looked again took the brandy bottle and knelt down and tried to pour some into the mouth but this she found she could not do then she wetted her handkerchief with the spirit and moistened the lips all to no purpose for as i have said before the man was dead killed by rupture of a vessel of the brain how occasioned i must tell by and by of course all eleanor's little cares and efforts produced no effect her father had tried them before vain endeavours all to bring back the precious breath of life the poor girl could not bear the look of those open eyes and softly tenderly tried to close them although unconscious that in so doing she was rendering the pious offices of some beloved hand to a dead man she was sitting by the body on the floor when she heard steps coming with rushing and yet cautious tread through the shrubbery she had no fear although it might be the tread of robbers and murderers the awfulness of the hour raised her above common fears though she did not go through the usual process of reasoning and by it feel assured that the feet which were coming so softly and swiftly along were the same which she had heard leaving the room in like manner only a quarter of an hour before her father entered and started back almost upsetting someone behind him by his recoil on seeing his daughter in her motionless attitude by the dead man my god eleanor what has brought you here he said almost fiercely but she answered as one stupefied i don't know is he dead hush child it cannot be helped she raised her eyes to the solemn pitying awe-stricken face behind her father's the countenance of dixon is he dead she asked of him the man stepped forwards respectfully pushing his master on one side as he did so he bent down over the corpse and looked and listened and then reaching a candle off the table he signed mr wilkins to close the door and mr wilkins obeyed and looked with an intensity of eagerness almost amounting to faintness on the experiment and yet he could not hope the flame was steady steady and pitilessly unstirred even when it was adjusted close to mouth and nostril the head was raised up by one of dixon's stalwart arms while he held the candle in the other hand eleanor fancied that there was some trembling on dixon's part and grasped his wrist tightly in order to give it the requisite motionless firmness all in vain the head was placed again on the cushions the servant rose and stood by his master looked sadly on the dead man whom living none of them had liked or cared for and eleanor sat on quiet and tearless as one in a trance how was it father at length she asked he would fain have had her ignorant of all but so questioned by her lips so adjured by her eyes in the very presence of death he could not choose but speak the truth he spoke it in convulsive gasps each sentence an effort he taunted me he was insolent beyond my patience i could not bear it i struck him i can't tell how it was he must have hit his head in falling oh my god one little hour ago i was innocent of this man's blood he covered his face with his hands eleanor took the candle again kneeling behind mr dunster's head she tried the futile experiment once more 
could not a doctor do some good she asked of dixon in a hopeless voice no said he shaking his head and looking with a sidelong glance at his master who seemed to shrivel up and to shrink away at the bare suggestion doctors can do not i'm afeard all that a doctor could do i take it would be to open a vein and that i could do along with the best of them if i had but my fleam here he fumbled in his pockets as he spoke and as chance would it the fleam or cattle lancet was somewhere about his dress he drew it out smoothed and tried it on his finger eleanor tried to bear the arm but turned sick as she did so her father started eagerly forwards and did what was necessary with hurried trembling hands if they had cared less about the result they might have been more afraid of the consequences of the operation in the hands of one so ignorant as dixon but vein or artery it signified little no living blood gushed out only a little watery moisture followed the cut of the fleam they laid him back on his strange sad death couch dixon spoke next master ned said he for he had known mr wilkins in his days of bright careless boyhood and almost was carried back to them by the sense of charge and protection which the servant's presence of mind and sharpened senses gave him over his master on this dreary night master ned we must do summit no one spoke what was to be done did any folk see him come here dixon asked after a time eleanor looked up to hear her father's answer a wild hope coming into her mind that all might be concealed somehow she did not know how nor did she think of any consequences except saving her father from the vague dread trouble and punishment that she was aware would await him if all were known mr wilkins did not seem to hear in fact he did not hear anything but the unspoken echo of his own last words that went booming through his heart an hour ago i, I was innocent of this man's blood only an hour ago dixon got up and poured out half a tumbler full of raw spirit from the brandy bottle that stood on the table drink this master ned putting it to his master's lips nay to eleanor it will do him no harm only bring back his senses which poor gentlemen are scared away we shall need all our wits now sir please answer my question did any one see master dunster come here i don't know said mr wilkins recovering his speech it all seems in a mist he offered to walk home with me i did not want him i was almost rude to him to keep him off i did not want to talk of business i had taken too much wine to be very clear and some things at the office were not quite in order and he had found it out if any one heard our conversation they must know i did not want him to come with me oh why would he come he was as obstinate he would come and here it has been his death well sir what's done can't be undone and i'm sure we'd any of us bring him back to life if we could even by cutting off our hands though he was a mighty plaguey chap while he'd breath in him but what i'm thinking is this it'll maybe go awkward with you sir if he's found here one can't say but don't you think miss as he's neither kith nor kin to miss him we might just bury him away before morning somewhere there's better nor four hours of dark i wish we could put him in the churchyard but that can't be but to my mind the sooner we set about digging a place for him to lie in poor fellow the better it'll be for us all in the end i can pare a piece of turf up where it'll never be missed and if master'll take one spade and i another why we'll lay him softly down and cover him up and no one'll be the wiser there was no reply from either for a minute or so then mr wilkins said if my father could have known of my living to this why they will try me as a criminal and you eleanor dixon you are right 
we must conceal it or i must cut my throat for i never could live through it one minute of passion and my life blasted come along sir said dixon there's no time to lose and they went out in search of tools Eleanor following them shivering all over but begging that she might be with them and not have to remain in the study with she would not be bidden into her own room she dreaded inaction and solitude she made herself busy with carrying heavy baskets of turf and straining her strength to the utmost fetching all that was wanted with soft swift steps once as she passed near the open study door she thought that she heard a rustling and a flash of hope came across her could he be reviving she entered but a moment was enough to undeceive her it had only been a night rustle among the trees of hope life there was none they dug the hole deep and well working with fierce energy to quench thought and remorse once or twice her father asked for brandy, which Eleanor, reassured by the apparently good effect of the first dose, brought to him without a word. And once, at her father's suggestion, she brought food such as she could find in the dining-room, without disturbing the household, for Dixon. When all was ready for the reception of the body in its unblessed grave, Mr. Wilkins bade Eleanor go up to her own room. She had done all she could to help them. The rest must be done by them alone. She felt that it must, and indeed both her nerves and her bodily strength were giving way. She would have kissed her father as he sat wearily at the head of the grave. Dixon had gone in to make some arrangement for carrying the corpse, but he pushed her away quietly but resolutely. No, Nelly, you must never kiss me again. I am a murderer. But I will, my own darling papa, said she, throwing her arms passionately round his neck and covering his face with kisses. I love you, and I don't care what you are. If you were twenty times a murderer, which you are not, I am sure it was only an accident. Go in, my child, go in and try to get some rest. But go in, for we must finish as fast as we can. The moon is down, it will soon be daylight. What a blessing there are no rooms on one side of the house. Go, Nelly. And she went, straining herself up to move noiselessly with eyes averted, through the room which she shuddered at as the place of hasty and unhallowed death. Once in her own room she bolted the door on the inside, and then stole to the window, as if some fascination impelled her to watch all the proceedings to the end. But her aching eyes could hardly penetrate through the thick darkness which, at the time of the year of which I am speaking, so closely precedes the dawn. She could discern the tops of the trees against the sky, and could single out the well-known one at a little distance from the stem of which the grave was made, in the very piece of turf over which so lately she and Ralph had had their merry little tea-making, and where her father, as she now remembered, had shuddered and shivered, as if the ground on which his seat had then been placed was fateful and ominous to him. Those below moved softly and quietly in all they did, but every sound had a significant and terrible interpretation to Eleanor's ears. Before they had ended, the little birds had begun to pipe out their gay reveille to the dawn. Then doors closed, and all was profoundly still. Eleanor threw herself in her clothes on the bed, and was thankful for the intense, weary physical pain which took off something of the anguish of thought, anguish that she fancied from time to time was leading to insanity. By and by, the morning cold made her instinctively creep between the blankets, and once there, she fell into a dead, heavy sleep. End of chapter 6
Chapter Seven. Eleanor was awakened by a rapping at her door. It was her maid. She was fully aroused in a moment, for she had fallen asleep with one clearly defined plan in her mind, only one, for all thoughts and cares having no relation to the terrible event were as though they had never been. All her purpose was to shield her father from suspicion, and to do this she must control herself. Heart, mind, and body must be ruled to this one end. So she said to Mason, Let me lie half an hour longer, and beg Miss Monroe not to wait breakfast for me, but in half an hour bring me up a cup of strong tea, for I have a bad headache. Mason went away. Eleanor sprang up, rapidly undressed herself, and got into bed again, so that when her maid returned with her breakfast, there was no appearance of the night having been passed in any unusual manner. "'How ill you do look, miss,' said Mason. "'I am sure you had better not get up yet.' Eleanor longed to ask if her father had yet shown himself, but this question, so natural at any other time, seemed to her so suspicious under the circumstances that she could not bring her lips to frame it. At any rate, she must get up and struggle to make the day like all other days. So she rose, confessing that she did not feel very well, but trying to make light of it, and when she could think of anything but the one awe, to say a trivial sentence or two. But she could not recollect how she behaved in general, for her life hitherto had been simple, and led without any consciousness of effect. Before she was dressed, a message came up to say that Mr. Livingstone was in the drawing-room. Mr. Livingstone. He belonged to the old life of yesterday. The billows of the night had swept over his mark on the sands of her memory, and it was only by a strong effort that she could remember who he was, what he wanted. She sent Mason down to inquire from the servant who admitted him whom it was that he had asked for. He asked for Master first, but master has not rung for his water yet, so James told him he was not up. Then he took thought for a while and asked if he could speak to you. He would wait if you were not at liberty, but that he wished particular to see either master or you. So James asked him to sit down in the drawing-room, and he would let you know. I must go, thought Eleanor. I will send him away directly. To come, thinking of marriage to a house like this. Today, too and she went down hastily, and in a hard, unsparing mood towards a man whose affection for her she thought was like a gourd grown up in a night, and of no account but as a piece of foolish boyish excitement. She never thought of her own appearance. She had dressed without looking in the glass. Her only object was to dismiss her would-be suitor as speedily as possible. All feelings of shyness, awkwardness, or maiden modesty were quenched and overcome. In she went. He was standing by the mantelpiece as she entered. He made a step or two forward to meet her, and then stopped, petrified, as it were, at the sight of her hard white face. "'Miss Wilkins, I am afraid you are ill. I have come too early. But I have to leave Hamley in half an hour, and I thought, "'Oh, Miss Wilkins, what have I done?' for she sank into the chair nearest to her, as if overcome by his words, but indeed it was by the oppression of her own thoughts. She was hardly conscious of his presence. He came a step or two nearer, as if he longed to take her in his arms and comfort and shelter her, but she stiffened herself and arose, and by an effort walked towards the fireplace, and there stood as if awaiting what he would say next. But he was overwhelmed by her aspect of illness, he almost forgot his own wishes, his own suit, and his desire to relieve her from the pain, physical as he believed it, under which she was suffering. It was she who had to begin the subject. "'I received your letter yesterday, Mr. Livingstone. I was anxious to see you today, in order that I might prevent you from speaking to my father. I do not say anything of the kind of affection you can feel for me, me whom you have only seen once.' All I shall say is that the sooner we both forget what I must call folly, the better. She took the airs of a woman considerably older and more experienced than himself. He thought her haughty 
she was only miserable. "'You are mistaken,' said he, more quietly and with more dignity than was likely from his previous conduct. "'I will not allow you to characterize as folly what might be presumptuous on my part. I had no business to express myself so soon, but which in its foundation was true and sincere. That I can answer for most solemnly. It is possible, though it may not be a usual thing, for a man to feel so strongly attracted by the charms and qualities of a woman, even at first sight, as to feel sure that she, and she alone, can make his happiness. My folly consisted, there you are right, in even dreaming that you could return my feelings in the slightest degree, when you had only seen me once. And I am most truly ashamed of myself. I cannot tell you how sorry I am when I see how you have compelled yourself to come and speak to me when you are so ill. She staggered into a chair, for with all her wish for his speedy dismissal, she was obliged to be seated. His hand was upon the bell. No, don't she said wait a minute his eyes bent upon her with a look of deep anxiety touched her at that moment and she was on the point of shedding tears but she checked herself and rose again i will go said he it is the kindest thing i can do only may i write may i venture to write and urge what i have to say more coherently no said she don't write i have given you my answer we are nothing and can be nothing to each other. I am engaged to be married. I should not have told you if you had not been so kind. Thank you, but go now. The poor young man's face fell, and he became almost as white as she was for the instant. After a moment's reflection, he took her hand in his and said, May God bless you, and him too, whoever he be. But if you want a friend... I may be that friend, may I not? And try to prove that my words of regard were true, in a better and higher sense than I used them at first. And kissing her passive hand, he was gone, and she was left sitting alone. But solitude was not what she could bear. She went quickly upstairs and took a strong dose of sal volatile, even while she heard Miss Monroe calling to her. My dear... "'Who was that gentleman that has been closeted with you in the drawing-room all this time?' And then, without listening to Eleanor's reply, she went on. "'Mrs. Jackson has been here.' It was at Mrs. Jackson's house that Mr. Dunster lodged. "'Wanting to know if we could tell her where Mr. Dunster was, for he never came home last night at all. And you were in the drawing-room with—who did you say he was?' that Mr. Livingstone, who might have come at a better time to bid good-bye. And he had never dined here, had he? So I don't see any reason he had to come calling, and P.P.C.ing, and your papa not up. So I said to Mrs. Jackson, I'll send and ask Mr. Wilkins, if you like, but I don't see any use in it, for I can tell you just as well as anybody that Mr. Dunster is not in this house, wherever he may be. Yet nothing would satisfy her but that someone would go and waken up your papa, and ask if he could tell where Mr. Dunster was. "'And did papa?' inquired Eleanor, her dry throat huskily forming the inquiry that seemed to be expected from her. "'No, to be sure not. How should Mr. Wilkins know? As I said to Mrs. Jackson, Mr. Wilkins is not likely to know where Mr. Dunster spends his time when he is not in the office.' for they do not move in the same rank of life, my good woman. And Mrs. Jackson apologized, but said that yesterday they had both been dining at Mr. Hodgson's together, she believed, and somehow she had got it into her head that Mr. Dunster might have missed his way in coming along Moore Lane, and might have slipped into the canal. So she just thought she would step up and ask Mr. Wilkins if they had left Mr. Hodgson's together, or if your papa had driven home. I asked her why she had not told me all these particulars before, for I could have asked your papa myself all about when he last saw Mr. Dunster. And I went up to ask him a second time, but he did not like it at all, for he was busy dressing, and I had to shout my questions through the door, and he could not always hear me at first. What did he say? 
oh he had walked part of the way with mr dunster and then cut across by the short path through the fields as far as i could understand him through the door he seemed very much annoyed to hear that mr dunster had not been at home all night but he said i was to tell mrs jackson that he would go to the office as soon as he had had his breakfast which he ordered to be sent up directly into his own room and he had no doubt it would all turn out right but that she had better go home at once and as i told her she might find mr dunster there by the time she got there 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 is your papa going out he has not lost any time over his breakfast eleanor had taken up the hamley examiner a daily paper which lay on the table to hide her face in the first instance but it served a second purpose as she glanced languidly over the columns of the advertisements oh here are colonel macdonald's orchidias plants to be sold all the stock of hothouse and stove plants at hartwell priory i must send james over to hartwell to attend the sale it is to last for three days but can he be spared for so long oh yes he had better stay at the little inn there to be on the spot three days and as she spoke she ran out to the gardener who was sweeping up the newly mown grass in the front of the house she gave him hasty and unlimited directions only seeming intent if any one had been suspiciously watching her words and actions to hurry him off to the distant village where the auction was to take place when he was once gone she breathed more freely now no one but the three cognizant of the terrible reason of the disturbance of the turf under the trees in a certain spot in the belt around the flower garden would be likely to go into the place miss monroe might wander around with a book in her hand but she never noticed anything and was short-sighted into the bargain three days of this moist warm growing weather and the green grass would spring just as if life was what it had been twenty-four hours before when all this was done and said it seemed as if eleanor's strength and spirit sank down at once her voice became feeble her aspect wan and although she told miss monroe that nothing was the matter yet it was impossible for any one who loved her not to perceive that she was far from well the kind governess placed her pupil on the sofa covered her feet up warmly darkened the room and then stole out on tiptoe fancying that eleanor would sleep her eyes were indeed shut but try as much as she would to be quiet she was up in less than five minutes after miss monroe had left the room and walking up and down in all the restless agony of body that arises from an overstrained mind but soon miss monroe reappeared bringing with her a dose of soothing medicine of her own concocting for she was great in domestic quackery what the medicine was eleanor did not care to know she drank it without any sign of her usual merry resistance to physic of miss monroe's ordering and as the latter took up a book and showed a set purpose of remaining with her patient eleanor was compelled to lie still and presently fell asleep she awakened late in the afternoon with a start her father was standing over her listening to miss monroe's account of her indisposition she only caught one glimpse of his strangely altered countenance and hid her head in the cushions hid it from memory not from him for in an instant she must have conjectured the interpretation he was likely to put upon her shrinking action and she had turned towards him and had thrown her arms round his neck and was kissing his cold passive face then she fell back but all this time their sad eyes never met they dreaded the look of recollection that must be in each other's gaze there my dear said miss monroe now you must lie still till i fetch you a little broth you are better now are you not you need not go for the broth miss monroe said mr wilkins ringing the bell fletcher can surely bring it he dreaded the being left alone with his daughter nor did she fear it less she heard the strange alteration in her father's voice hard and hoarse as if it was an effort to speak the physical signs of his suffering cut her to the heart and yet she wondered how it was that they could both be alive or if alive they were not rending their garments and crying aloud 
Mr. Wilkins seemed to have lost the power of careless action and speech, it is true. He wished to leave the room, now his anxiety about his daughter was relieved, but hardly knew how to set about it. He was obliged to think about the veriest trifle, in order that by an effort of reason he might understand how he should have spoken or acted if he had been free from blood guiltiness. Eleanor understood all by intuition, but henceforward the unspoken comprehension of each other's hidden motions made their mutual presence a burdensome anxiety to each. Miss Monroe was a relief. They were glad of her as a third person, unconscious of the secret which constrained them. This afternoon her unconsciousness gave present pain, although on after reflection each found in her speeches a cause of rejoicing. And Mr. Dunster, Mr. Wilkins, has he come home yet? A moment's pause in which Mr. Wilkins pumped the words out of his husky throat. <clears throat> I have not heard. I have been writing. I went on business to Mr. Estcourt's. Perhaps you will be so kind as to send and inquire at Mrs. Jackson's. Eleanor sickened at the words. She had been all her life a truthful, plain-spoken girl. She held herself high above deceit. Yet here came the necessity for deceit. A snare spread around her. She had not revolted so much from the deed which brought unpremeditated death as she did from these words of her father's. The night before, in her mad fever of affright, she had fancied that to conceal the body was all that would be required. She had not looked forward to the long, weary course of small lies to be done and said involved in that one mistaken action. Yet while her father's words made her soul revolt, his appearance melted her heart, as she caught it half turned away from her, neither looking straight at Miss Monroe nor at anything materially visible. His hollow sunken eye seemed to Eleanor to have a vision of the dead man before it. His cheek was livid and worn, and its healthy coloring, gained by years of hearty outdoor exercise, was all gone into the wanness of age. His hair, even to Eleanor, seemed grayer for the past night of wretchedness. He stooped and looked dreamily earthward, where formerly he had stood erect. It needed all the pity called forth by such observation to quench Eleanor's passionate contempt for the course on which she and her father were embarked, when she heard him repeat his words to the servant who came with her broth. Fletcher, go to Mrs. Jackson's and inquire if Mr. Dunster is come home yet. I want to speak to him. To him, lying dead where he had been laid, killed by the man who now asked for his presence. Eleanor shut her eyes and lay back in despair. She wished she might die and be out of this horrible tangle of events. Two minutes after, she was conscious of her father and Miss Monroe stealing softly out of the room. They thought that she slept. She sprang off the sofa and knelt down. Oh, God, she prayed, thou knowest. Help me. There is none other help but thee. I suppose she fainted, for an hour or more afterwards, Miss Monroe, coming in, found her lying insensible by the side of the sofa. She was carried to bed. She was not delirious. She was only in a stupor, which they feared might end in delirium. To obviate this, her father sent far and wide for skillful physicians who tended her almost at the rate of a guinea the minute. People said how hard it was upon Mr. Wilkins that scarcely had that wretched Dunster gone off with no one knows how much out of the trusts of the firm before his only child fell ill, and, to tell the truth, he himself looked burnt and scared with affliction. He had a startled look, they said, as if he never could tell, after such experience, from which side the awful proofs of the uncertainty of earth would appear, the terrible phantoms of unforeseen dread. Both rich and poor, town and country, sympathized with him. The rich cared not to press their claims, or their business, at such a time, and only wondered in their superficial talk after dinner how such a good fellow as Wilkins 
could ever have been deceived by a man like Dunster. Even Sir Frank Holster and his lady forgot their old quarrel, and came to inquire after Eleanor, and sent her hothouse fruit by the bushel. Mr. Corbett behaved as an anxious lover should do. He wrote daily to Miss Monroe to beg for the most minute bulletins. He procured everything in town that any doctor even fancied might be of service. He came down as soon as there was the slightest hint of permission that Eleanor might see him. He overpowered her with tender words and caresses, till at last she shrank away from them, as from something too bewildering and past all right comprehension. But one night before this, when all windows and doors stood open to admit the least breath that stirred the sultry July air, a servant on velvet tiptoe had stolen up to Eleanor's open door, and had beckoned out of the chamber of the sleeper the ever-watchful nurse, Miss Monroe. "'A gentleman wants to see you,' were all the words the housemaid dared to say so close to the bedroom. And softly, softly, Miss Monroe stepped down the stairs, into the drawing-room, and there she saw Mr. Livingstone. But she did not know him. She had never seen him before. "'I have travelled all day. I heard she was ill, was dying. May I just have one more look at her? I will not speak. I will hardly breathe. Only let me see her once again.' "'I beg your pardon, sir, but I don't know who you are.' and if you mean miss wilkins by her she is very ill but we hope not dying she was very ill indeed yesterday very dangerously ill i may say but she is having a good sleep in consequence of a soporific medicine and we are really beginning to hope but just here miss monroe's hand was taken and to her infinite surprise was kissed before she could remember how improper such behaviour was "'God bless you, madame, for saying so. "'But if she sleeps, will you let me see her? "'It can do no harm, for I will tread as if on eggshells, "'and I have come so far. "'If I might just look on her sweet face. "'Pray, madam, let me just have one sight of her. "'I will not ask for more.' "'But he did ask for more, after he had had his wish.' He stole upstairs after Miss Monroe, who looked round reproachfully at him, if even a nightingale sang, or an owl hooted in the trees outside the open windows, yet who paused to say herself, outside Mr. Wilkins's chamber door, her father's room. He has not been in bed for six nights, till tonight. Pray, do not make a noise to waken him. And on into the deep stillness of the hushed room, where one clear ray of hidden lamplight shot athwart the door, where a watcher, breathing softly, sat beside the bed where Eleanor's dark head lay motionless on the white pillow, her face almost as white, her form almost as still. You might have heard a pen fall. After a while he moved to withdraw. Miss Monroe, jealous of every sound, followed him, with steps all the more heavy, because they were taken with so much care down the stairs, back into the drawing-room. By the bed-candle flaring in the draught, she saw that there was the glittering mark of wet tears on his cheek, and she felt, as she said afterwards, sorry for the young man. And yet she urged him to go, for she knew that she might be wanted upstairs. He took her hand and wrung it hard. Thank you. She looked so changed. Oh, she looked as though she were dead. You will write, Herbert Livingstone, Langham Vicarage, Yorkshire. You will promise me to write, if I could do anything for her, but I can but pray. Oh, my darling, my darling, and I have no right to be with her. Go away, there's a good young man, said Miss Monroe, all the more pressing to hurry him out the front door because she was afraid of his emotion overmastering him, and making him noisy in his demonstrations. "'Yes, I will write, I will write, never fear.' And she bolted the door behind him, and was thankful. Two minutes afterwards there was a low tap. She undid the fastenings, and there he stood, pale in the moonlight. "'Please don't tell her I came to ask about her. 
she might not like it. No, no, not I, poor creature. She's not likely to care to hear anything this long while. She never roused at Mr. Corbett's name. Mr. Corbett's, said Livingstone below his breath, and he turned and went away, this time for good. But Eleanor recovered. She knew she was recovering when, day after day, she felt involuntary strength and appetite return. Her body seemed stronger than her will, for that would have induced her to creep into her grave and shut her eyes forever on this world, so full of troubles. She lay, for the most part, with her eyes closed, very still and quiet, but she thought with the intensity of one who seeks for lost peace and cannot find it. She began to see that if in the mad impulses of that mad nightmare of horror they had all strengthened each other and dared to be frank and open, confessing a great fault, a greater disaster, a greater woe, which, in the first instance, was hardly a crime, their future course, though sad and sorrowful, would have been a simple and straightforward one to tread. But it was not for her to undo what was done, and to reveal the error and shame of a father. Only she, turning anew to God in the solemn and quiet watches of the night, made a covenant that in her conduct, her own personal individual life, she would act loyally and truthfully. And as for the future, and all the terrible chances involved in it, she would leave it in his hands, if, indeed, and here came in the tempter, he would watch over one whose life hereafter must seem based upon a lie. Her only plea, offered standing afar off, was, The lie is said and done and over. It was not for my own sake. Can filial piety be so overcome by the rights of justice and truth as to demand of me that I should reveal my father's guilt? Her father's severe, sharp punishment began. He knew why she suffered, what made her young strength falter and tremble, what made her life seem nigh about to be quenched in death. Yet he could not take his sorrow and care in the natural manner. He was obliged to think how every word and deed would be construed. He fancied that people were watching him with suspicious eyes when nothing was further from their thoughts. For once let the public of any place be possessed by an idea. It is more difficult to dislodge it than anyone imagines who has not tried. If Mr. Wilkins had gone into Hamley Marketplace and proclaimed himself guilty of the manslaughter of Mr. Dunster, nay, if he had detailed all the circumstances, the people would have exclaimed, Poor man, he is crazed by this discovery of the unworthiness of the man he trusted so. And no wonder... It was such a thing to have done, to have defrauded his partner to such an extent, and then have made off to America. For many small circumstances which I do not stop to detail here, went far to prove this, as we know, unfounded supposition. And Mr. Wilkins, who was known from his handsome boyhood, through his comely manhood, up to the present time, by all the people in Hamley, was an object of sympathy and respect to every one who saw him, as he passed by old and lorn and haggard before his time, all through the evil conduct of one London-bred who was as a hard, unlovely stranger to the popular mind of this little country town. Mr. Wilkins's own servants liked him. The workings of his temptations were such as they could understand. If he had been hot-tempered, he had also been generous, or, I should rather say, careless and lavish with his money. And now that he was cheated and impoverished by his partner's delinquency, they thought it no wonder that he drank long and deep into the solitary evenings which he passed at home. It was not that he was without invitations. Everyone came forward to testify their respect for him by asking him to their houses. He had probably never been so universally popular since his father's death. But, as he said, he did not care to go into society while his daughter was so ill. He had no spirits for company. But if any one had cared to observe his conduct at home and to draw conclusions from it, they could have noticed that, anxious as he was about Eleanor, 
he rather avoided than sought her presence now that her consciousness and memory were restored nor did she ask for or wish for him the presence of each was a burden to the other o oh, sad and woeful night of may overshadowing the coming summer months with gloom and bitter remorse end of chapter 7 recording by james k white chula vista chapter 8 still youth prevailed over all eleanor got well as i have said even when she would fain have died and the afternoon came when she left her room miss monroe would gladly have made a festival of her recovery and have had her conveyed into the unused drawing-room but eleanor begged that she might be taken into the library into the schoolroom anywhere she thought not looking on the side of the house on the flower garden which she had felt in all her illness as a ghastly pressure lying within sight of those very windows through which the morning sun streamed right upon her bed like the accusing angel bringing all hidden things to light and when eleanor was better still when the bath chair had been sent up for her use by some kindly old maid out of hamley she still petitioned that it might be kept on the lawn or town side of the house away from the flower garden one day she almost screamed when as she was going to the front door she saw dixon standing ready to draw her instead of fletcher the servant who usually went but she checked all demonstration of feeling although it was the first time she had seen him since he and she and one more had worked their hearts out in hard bodily labor he looked so stern and ill cross too which she had never seen him before as soon as they were out of immediate sight of the windows she asked him to stop forcing herself to speak to him dixon you look very poorly she said trembling as she spoke ay said he we didn't think much of it at the time did we miss nelly but it'll be the death on us i'm thinking it has aged me above a bit all my fifty years afore were but as a forenoon of child's play to that night master too i could a bear a good deal but master cuts through the stable yard and passed me without a word as if i was poison or a stinking fumert it's that as is worst miss nelly it is and the poor man brushed some tears from his eyes with the back of his withered furrowed hand eleanor caught the infection and cried outright sobbed like a child even while she held out her little white thin hand to his grasp for as he saw her emotion he was penitent for what he had said don't now don't was all he could think of to say dixon said she at length you must not mind it you must try not to mind it i see he does not like to be reminded of that even by seeing me he tries never to be alone with me my poor old dixon it has spoilt my life for me for i don't think he loves me any more she sobbed as if her heart would break and now it was dixon's turn to be comforter ah dear my blessing he loves you above everything it's only he can't abear the sight of us as is but natural and if he doesn't fancy being alone with you there's always one as does and that's a comfort at the worst of times and don't ye fret about what i said a minute ago i were put out because master all but pushed me out of his way this morning without never a word but i were an old fool for telling ye and i've really forgotten why i told fletcher i'd drag ye a bit about to-day the gardener's beginning for to wonder as you don't want to see the animals and bedding out things as you were so particular about in may and i thought i'd just have a word with ye and then if you'd let me we'd go together just once round the flower garden just to say you've been you know and to give them chaps a bit of praise you'll only have to look on the beds my pretty and it must be done some time so come along he began to pull resolutely in the direction of the flower garden eleanor bit her lips to keep in the cry of repugnance that rose to them 
as dixon stopped to unlock the door he said it's not hardness nothing like it i've waited till i heard you were better but it's in for a penny in for a pound with us all and folk may talk and bless your little brave heart you'll stand a deal for your father's sake and so will i though i do feel it above a bit when he puts out his hand as if to keep me off and i only going to speak to him about clippers knees though i alone i had wondered many a day when i was to have the good morrow master never missed sin he were a boy till well and now you've seen the beds and can say they looked mighty pretty and is done all as you wished and we are got out again and breathing fresher air than yon sun-baked hole with its smelling flowers not half so wholesome to snuff at as good stable dung so the good man chatted on not without the purpose of giving eleanor time to recover herself and partly also to drown his own cares which lay heavier on his heart than he could say but he thought himself rewarded by eleanor's thanks and warm pressure of his hard hand as she got out at the front door and bade him good-bye the break to her days of weary monotony was the letters she constantly received from mr corbett and yet here again lurked the sting he was all astonishment and indignation at mr dunster's disappearance or rather flight to america and now that she was growing stronger he did not scruple to express curiosity respecting the details never doubting but that she was perfectly acquainted with much that he wanted to know although he had too much delicacy to question her on the point which was most important of all in his eyes namely how far it had affected mr wilkins's worldly prospects for the report prevalent in hamley had reached london that mr dunster had made away with or carried off trust property to a considerable extent for all which mr wilkins would of course be liable it was hard work for ralph corbett to keep from seeking direct information on this head from mr ness or indeed from mr wilkins himself but he restrained himself knowing that in august he should be able to make all these inquiries personally before the end of the long vacation he had hoped to marry eleanor that was the time which had been planned by them when they had met in the early spring before her illness and all this misfortune happened but now as he wrote to his father nothing could be definitely arranged until he had paid his visit to hamley and seen the state of affairs accordingly one saturday in august he came to ford bank this time as a visitor to eleanor's home instead of to his old quarters at mr ness's the house was still as if asleep in the full heat of the afternoon sun as mr corbett drove up the window blinds were down the front door wide open great stands of heliotrope and roses and geraniums stood just within the shadow of the hall but through all the silence his approach seemed to excite no commotion he thought it strange that he had not been watched for that eleanor did not come running out to meet him that she allowed fletcher to come and attend to his luggage and usher him into the library just like any common visitor any morning caller he stiffened himself up into a moment's indignant coldness of manner but it vanished in an instant when on the door being opened he saw eleanor standing holding by the table looking for his appearance with almost panting anxiety he thought of nothing then but her evident weakness her changed looks for which no account of her illness had prepared him for she was deadly white lips and all and her dark eyes seemed unnaturally enlarged while the caves in which they were set were strangely deep and hollow her hair too had been cut off pretty closely she did not usually wear a cap but with some faint idea of making herself look better in his eyes she had put on one this day and the effect was that she seemed to be forty years of age but one instant after he had come in her pale face was flooded with crimson and her eyes were full of tears she had hard work to keep herself from going into hysterics but she instinctively knew how much he would hate a scene and she checked herself in time oh she murmured i am so glad to see you it is such a comfort such an infinite pleasure 
and so she went on cooing out words over him and stroking his hair with her thin fingers while he rather tried to avert his eyes he was so much afraid of betraying how much he thought her altered but when she came down dressed for dinner this sense of her change was diminished to him her short brown hair had already a little wave and was ornamented by some black lace she wore a large black lace shawl it had been her mother's of old over some delicate colored muslin dress her face was slightly flushed and had the tints of a wild rose her lips kept pale and trembling with involuntary motion it is true and as the lovers stood together hand in hand by the window he was aware of a little convulsive twitching at every noise even while she seemed gazing in tranquil pleasure on the long smooth slope of the newly mown lawn stretching down to the little brook that prattled merrily over the stones on its merry course to hamley town he felt a stronger twitch than ever before even while his ear less delicate than hers could distinguish no peculiar sound about two minutes after mr wilkins entered the room he came up to mr corbett with a warm welcome some of it real some of it assumed he talked volubly to him taking little or no notice of eleanor who dropped into the background and sat down on the sofa by miss monroe for on this day they were all to dine together ralph corbett thought that mr wilkins was aged but no wonder after all his anxiety of various kinds mr dunster's flight and reported defalcations eleanor's illness of the seriousness of which her lover was now convinced by her appearance he would fain have spoken more to her during the dinner that ensued but mr wilkins absorbed all his attention talking and questioning on subjects that left the ladies out of the conversation almost perpetually mr corbett recognized his host's fine tact even while his persistence in talking annoyed him he was quite sure that mr wilkins was anxious to spare his daughter any exertion beyond that to which indeed she seemed scarcely equal of sitting at the head of the table and the more her father talked so fine an observer was mr corbett the more silent and depressed eleanor appeared but by and by he accounted for this inverse ratio of gaiety as he perceived how quickly mr wilkins had his glass replenished and here again mr corbett drew his conclusions from the silent way in which without a word or a sign from his master fletcher gave him more wine continually wine that was drained off at once six glasses of sherry before dessert thought mr corbett to himself bad habit no wonder eleanor looks grave and when the gentlemen were left alone mr wilkins helped himself even still more freely yet without the slightest effect on the clearness and brilliancy of his conversation he had always talked well and racily that ralph knew and in this power he now recognized a temptation to which he feared that his future father-in-law had succumbed and yet while he perceived that this gift led into temptation he coveted it for himself for he was perfectly aware that this fluency this happy choice of epithets was the one thing he should fail in when he began to enter into the more active career of his profession but after some time spent in listening and admiring with this little feeling of envy lurking in the background mr corbett became aware of mr wilkins's increasing confusion of ideas and rather unnatural merriment and with a sudden revulsion from admiration to disgust he rose up to go into the library where eleanor and miss monroe were sitting mr wilkins accompanied him laughing and talking somewhat loudly was eleanor aware of her father's state of that mr corbett could not be sure she looked up with grave sad eyes as they came into the room but with no apparent sensation of surprise annoyance or shame when her glance met her father's mr corbett noticed that it seemed to sober the latter immediately he sat down near the open window and did not speak but sighed heavily from time to time miss monroe took up a book in order to leave the young people to themselves and after a little low murmured conversation eleanor went upstairs to put on her things for a stroll through the meadows by the riverside they were sometimes sauntering along in the lovely summer twilight 
now resting on some grassy hedgerow bank or standing still looking at the great barges with their crimson sails lazily floating down the river making ripples on the glassy opal surface of the water they did not talk very much eleanor seemed disinclined for the exertion and her lover was thinking over mr wilkins's behavior with some surprise and distaste of the habit so evidently growing upon him they came home looking serious and tired yet they could not account for their fatigue by the length of their walk and miss monroe forgetting autolycus's song kept fidgeting about eleanor and wondering how it was she looked so pale if she had only been as far as the ash meadow to escape from this wonder eleanor went early to bed mr wilkins was gone no one knew where and ralph and miss monroe were left to a half hour's tete-a-tete -tete. he thought he could easily account for eleanor's languor if indeed she had perceived as much as he had done of her father's state when they had come into the library after dinner but there were many details which he was anxious to hear from a comparatively indifferent person and as soon as he could he passed on the conversation about eleanor's health to inquiries as to the whole affair of mr dunster's disappearance next to her anxiety about eleanor miss monroe liked to dilate on the mystery connected with mr dunster's flight for that was the word she employed without hesitation as she gave him the account of the event universally received and believed in by the people of hamley how mr dunster had never been liked by any one how everybody remembered that he could never look them straight in the face how he always seemed to be hiding something that he did not want to have known how he had drawn a large sum exact quantity unknown out of the county bank only the day before he left hamley doubtless in preparation for his escape how someone had told mr wilkins he had seen a man just like dunster lurking about the docks at liverpool about two days after he had left his lodgings but that this someone being in a hurry had not cared to stop and speak to the man how that the affairs in the office were discovered to be in such a sad state that it was no wonder that mr dunster had absconded he that had been so trusted by poor dear mr wilkins money gone no one knew how or where but has he no friends who can explain his proceedings and account for the missing money in some way asked mr corbett no none mr wilkins has written everywhere right and left i believe i know he had a letter from mr dunster's nearest relation a tradesman in the city a cousin i think and he could give no information in any way he knew that about ten years ago mr dunster had had a great fancy for going to america and had read a great many travels all just what a man would do before going off to a country ten years is a long time beforehand said mr corbett half smiling shows malice prepense with a vengeance but then turning grave he said did he leave hamley in debt no i never heard of that said miss monroe rather unwillingly for she considered it as a piece of loyalty to the wilkinses whom mr dunster had injured as she thought to blacken his character as much as was consistent with any degree of truth it is a strange story said mr corbett musing not at all she replied quickly i am sure if you had seen the man with one or two side locks of hair combed over his baldness as if he were ashamed of it and his eyes that never looked at you and his way of eating with his knife when he thought he was not observed oh and numbers of things you would not think it strange mr corbett smiled i only meant that he seems to have had no extravagant or vicious habits which would account for his embezzlement of the money that is missing but to be sure money in itself is a temptation only he being a partner was in a fair way of making it without risk to himself has mr wilkins taken any steps to have him arrested in america he might easily do that oh my dear mr ralph you don't know our good mr wilkins he would rather bear the loss i am sure and all this trouble and care which it has brought upon him than be revenged upon mr dunster revenged what nonsense it is simple justice justice to himself and to others 
to see that villainy is so sufficiently punished as to deter others from entering upon such courses but i have little doubt mr wilkins has taken the right steps he is not the man to sit down quietly under such a loss no indeed he had him advertised in the times and in the county papers and offered a reward of twenty pounds for information concerning him twenty pounds was too little so i said i told eleanor that i would give twenty pounds myself to have him apprehended and she poor darling fell a-trembling and said i would give all i have i would give my life and then she was in such distress and sobbed so i promised her i would never name it to her again poor child poor child she wants change of scene her nerves have been sadly shaken by her illness the next day was sunday eleanor was to go to church for the first time since her illness her father had decided it for her or else she would fain have stayed away she would hardly acknowledge why even to herself but it seemed to her as if the very words and presence of god must there search her and find her out she went early leaning on the arm of her lover and trying to forget the past and the present they walked slowly along between the rows of waving golden corn ripe for the harvest mr corbett gathered blue and scarlet flowers and made up a little rustic nosegay for her she took and stuck it in her girdle smiling faintly as she did so hamley church had in former days been collegiate and was in consequence much larger and grander than the majority of country town churches the ford bank pew was a square one downstairs the ford bank servants sat in a front pew in the gallery right before their master eleanor was hardening her heart not to listen not to hearken to what might disturb the wound which was just being skinned over when she caught dixon's face up above he looked worn sad soured and anxious to a miserable degree but he was straining eyes and ears heart and soul to hear the solemn words read from the pulpit as if in them alone he could find help in his strait eleanor felt rebuked and humbled she was in a tumultuous state of mind when they left the church she wished to do her duty yet could not ascertain what it was who was to help her with wisdom and advice assuredly he to whom her future life was to be trusted but the case must be stated in an impersonal form no one not even her husband must ever know anything against her father from her eleanor was so artless herself that she had little idea how quickly and easily some people can penetrate motives and combine disjointed sentences she began to speak to ralph on their slow sauntering walk homewards through the quiet meadows suppose ralph that a girl was engaged to be married i can very easily suppose that with you by me said he filling up her pause oh but i don't mean myself at all replied she reddening i am only thinking of what might happen and suppose that this girl knew of some one belonging to her we will call it a brother who had done something wrong that would bring disgrace upon the whole family if it was known though indeed it might not have been so very wrong as it seemed and as it would look to the world ought she to break off her engagement for fear of involving her lover in the disgrace certainly not without telling him her reason for doing so ah but suppose she could not she might not be at liberty to do so i can't answer suppositious cases i must have the facts if facts there are more plainly before me before i can give an opinion who are you thinking of eleanor asked he rather abruptly oh of no one she answered in a fright why should i be thinking of any one i often try to plan out what i should do or what i ought to do if such and such a thing happened just as you recollect i used to wonder if i should have presence of mind in case of fire then after all you yourself are the girl who is engaged and who has the imaginary brother who gets into disgrace yes i suppose so said she a little annoyed at having betrayed any personal interest in the affair he was silent meditating 
"'There is nothing wrong in it,' said she timidly. "'Is there?' "'I think you had better tell me fully out what is in your mind,' he replied kindly. "'Something has happened which has suggested these questions. "'Are you putting yourself in the place of any one about whom you have been hearing lately? "'I know you used to do so formerly when you were a little girl.' "'No. "'It was a very foolish question of mine, and I ought not to have said anything about it. "'See? "'Here is Mr. Ness overtaking us.' "'The clergyman joined them on the boardwalk that ran by the riverside, "'and the talk became general.' It was a relief to Eleanor, who had not attained her end, but who had gone far towards betraying something of her own individual interest in the question she had asked. Ralph had been more struck even by her manner than her words. He was sure that something lurked behind, and had an idea of his own that it was connected with Dunster's disappearance. But he was glad that Mr. Ness's joining them gave him leisure to consider a little. The end of his reflections was that the next day, Monday, he went into the town and artfully learnt all he could hear about Mr. Dunster's character and mode of going on, and with still more skill he extracted the popular opinion as to the embarrassed nature of Mr. Wilkins's affairs, embarrassment which was generally attributed to Dunster's disappearance with a good large sum belonging to the firm in his possession. But Mr. Corbett thought otherwise. He had accustomed himself to seek out the baser motives of men's conduct, and to call the result of these researches wisdom. He imagined that Dunster had been well paid by Mr. Wilkins for his disappearance, which was an easy way of accounting for the derangement of accounts and loss of money that arose, in fact, from Mr. Wilkins's extravagance of habits and growing intemperance. On the Monday afternoon, he said to Eleanor, Mr. Ness interrupted us yesterday in a very interesting conversation. Do you remember, love? Eleanor reddened and kept her head still more intently bent over a sketch she was making. Yes, I recollect. I have been thinking about it. I still think she ought to tell her lover that such disgrace hung over him. I mean, over the family with whom he was going to connect himself. Of course, the only effect would be to make him stand by her still more for her frankness. Oh, but, Ralph, it might perhaps be something she ought not to tell, whatever came of her silence. Of course, there might be all sorts of cases. Unless I knew more, I could not pretend to judge. This was said rather more coolly. It had the desired effect. Eleanor laid down her brush and covered her face with her hand. After a pause, she turned towards him and said, "'I will tell you this, and more you must not ask me. "'I know you are as safe as you can be. "'I am the girl, you are the lover. "'And possible shame hangs over my father "'if something, oh, so dreadful,' here she blanched, "'but not so very much his fault is ever found out.' "'Though this was nothing more than he expected,' though ralph thought that he was aware what the dreadful something might be yet when it was acknowledged in words his heart contracted and for a moment he forgot the intent wistful beautiful face creeping close to his to read his expression aright but after that his presence of mind came in aid he took her in his arms and kissed her murmuring fond words of sympathy and promises of faith nay even of greater love than before since greater need she might have of that love but somehow he was glad when the dressing bell rang and in the solitude of his own room he could reflect on what he had heard for the intelligence had been a great shock to him although he had fancied that his morning's inquiries had prepared him for it end of chapter eight recording by james k white chula vista Chapter 9 Ralph Corbett found it a very difficult thing to keep down his curiosity during the next few days. It was a miserable thing to have Eleanor's unspoken secret severing them like a phantom. But he had given her his word that he would make no further inquiries from her. Indeed, he thought he could well enough make out the outline of past events. Still, there was too much left to conjecture for his mind not to be always busy on the subject. 
he felt inclined to probe Mr. Wilkins in their after-dinner conversation, in which his host was frank and lax enough on many subjects. But once touch on the name of Dunster, and Mr. Wilkins sank into a kind of suspicious depression of spirits, talking little and with evident caution, and from time to time shooting furtive glances at his interlocutor's face. Eleanor was resolutely impervious to any attempts of his to bring his conversation with her back to the subject which more and more engrossed Ralph Corbett's mind. She had done her duty as she understood it, and had received assurances which she was only too glad to believe fondly with all the tender faith of her heart. Whatever came to pass, Ralph's love would still be hers, nor was he unwarned of what might come to pass in some dread future day. So she shut her eyes to what might be in store for her, and, after all, the chances were immeasurably in her favour, and she bent herself with her whole strength into enjoying the present. Day by day Mr. Corbett's spirits flagged. He was, however, so generally uniform in the tenor of his talk, never very merry and always avoiding any subject that might call out deep feeling, either on his own or anyone else's part, that few people were aware of his changes of mood. Eleanor felt them, though she would not acknowledge them. It was bringing her too much face to face with the great terror of her life. One morning he announced the fact of his brother's approaching marriage. The wedding was hastened on account of some impending event in the Duke's family, and the home letter he had received that day was to bid his presence at Stokely Castle, and also to desire him to be at home by a certain time, not very distant, in order to look over the requisite legal papers, and to give his assent to some of them. He gave many reasons why this unlooked-for departure of his was absolutely necessary, but no one doubted it. He need not have alleged such reiterated excuses. The truth was, he was restrained and uncomfortable at Ford Bank ever since Eleanor's confidence. He could not rightly calculate on the most desirable course for his own interests, while his love for her was constantly being renewed by her sweet presence. Away from her, he could judge more wisely. Nor did he allege any false reasons for his departure. But the sense of relief to himself was so great at his recall home, that he was afraid of having it perceived by others, and so took the very way which, if others had been as penetrating as himself, would have betrayed him. Mr. Wilkins, too, had begun to feel the restraint of Ralph's grave, watchful presence. Eleanor was not strong enough to be married, nor was the promised money forthcoming if she had been. And to have a fellow dawdling about the house all day, sauntering into the flower garden, peering about everywhere, and having a kind of right to put all manner of unexpected questions, was anything but agreeable. It was only Eleanor that clung to his presence, clung as though some shadow of what might happen before they met again had fallen on her spirit. As soon as he had left the house, she flew up to the spare bedroom window to watch for the last glimpse of the fly which was taking him into town, and then she kissed the part of the pane on which his figure, waving an arm out of the carriage window, had last appeared, and went down slowly to gather together all the things he had last touched the pen he had mended, the flower he had played with, and to lock them up in the little quaint cabinet that had held her treasures since she was a tiny child. Miss Monroe was perhaps very wise in proposing the translation of a difficult part of Dante for a distraction to Eleanor. The girl went meekly, if reluctantly, to the task set her by her good governess, and by and by her mind became braced by the exertion. Ralph's people were not very slow in discovering that something had not gone on quite smoothly with him at Ford Bank. They knew his ways and looks with family intuition, and could easily be certain thus far. But not even his mother's skilfulest wiles, nor his favourite sister's coaxing, could obtain a word or a hint, and when his father, the squire, who had heard the opinions of the female part of the family on this head, began in his honest, blustering way, in their tete-a-tetes after dinner, to hope that Ralph was thinking better than to run his head into that confounded Hamley attorney's noose, 
Ralph gravely required Mr. Corbett to explain his meaning, which he professed not to understand so worded. And when the squire had, with much perplexity, put it into the plain terms, of hoping that his son was thinking of breaking off his engagement to Miss Wilkins, Ralph coolly asked him if he was aware that, in that case, he should lose all title to being a man of honour, and might have an action brought against him for breach of promise. Yet not the less for all this was the idea in his mind as a future possibility. Before very long the Corbett family moved en masse to Stokely Castle for the wedding. Of course, Ralph associated on equal terms with the magnates of the county, who were the employers of Eleanor's father, and spoke of him always as Wilkins, just as they spoke of the butler as Simmons. Here, too, among a class of men high above local gossip, and thus unaware of his engagement, he learnt the popular opinion respecting his future father-in-law, an opinion not entirely respectful, though intermingled with a good deal of personal liking. Poor Wilkins, as they called him, was sadly extravagant for a man in his position, had no right to spend money and act as if he were a man of independent fortune. His habits of life were criticised, and pity, not free from blame, was bestowed upon him for the losses he had sustained from his late clerk's disappearance and defalcation. But what could be expected if a man did not choose to attend to his own business? The wedding went by, as grand weddings do, without let or hindrance, according to the approved pattern. A cabinet minister honoured it with his presence, and, being a distant relation of the Brabants, remained for a few days after the grand occasion. During this time he became rather intimate with Ralph Corbett. Many of their tastes were in common. Ralph took a great interest in the manner of working out political questions, in the balance and state of parties, and had the right appreciation of the exact qualities on which the minister piqued himself. In return, the latter was always on the lookout for promising young men, who, either by their capability of speech-making or article-writing, might advance the views of his party. Recognizing the powers he most valued in Ralph, he spared no pains to attach him to his own political set. When they separated, it was with the full understanding that they were to see a good deal of each other in London. The holiday Ralph allowed himself was passing rapidly away. But before he returned to his chambers and his hard work, he had promised to spend a few more days with Eleanor, and it suited him to go straight from the Duke's to Ford Bank. He left the castle soon after breakfast, the luxurious, elegant breakfast, served by domestics who performed their work with the accuracy and perfection of machines. He arrived at Ford Bank before the manservant had quite finished the dirtier part of his morning's work, and he came to the glass door in his striped cotton jacket, a little soiled, and rolling up his working apron. Eleanor was not yet strong enough to get up and go out and gather flowers for the rooms, so those left from yesterday were rather faded. In short, the contrast from entire completeness and exquisite freshness of arrangement struck forcibly upon Ralph's perceptions, which were critical rather than appreciative, and, as his affections were always subdued to his intellect, Eleanor's lovely face and graceful figure, flying to meet him, did not gain his full approval. Because her hair was dressed in an old-fashioned way, her waist was either too long or too short, her sleeves too full or too tight for the standard of fashion to which his eye had been accustomed, while scanning the bridesmaids and various high-born ladies at Stokely Castle. But, as he had always piqued himself upon being able to put on one side all superficial worldliness in his chase after power, it did not do for him to shrink from seeing and facing the incompleteness of moderate means. Only marriage upon moderate means was gradually becoming more distasteful to him. Nor did his subsequent intercourse with Lord Bolton, the cabinet minister before mentioned, tend to reconcile him to early matrimony. At Lord Bolton's house he met polished and intellectual society, and all that smoothness in ministering to the lower wants in eating and drinking, 
which seems to provide that the right thing shall always be at the right place at the right time, so that the want of it shall never impede for an instant the feast of wit or reason. While, if he went to the houses of his friends, men of the same college and standing as himself, who had been seduced into early marriages, he was uncomfortably aware of numerous inconsistencies and hitches in their menages. Besides, the idea of the possible disgrace that might befall the family with which he thought of allying himself haunted him with the tenacity and also with the exaggeration of a nightmare, whenever he had overworked himself in his search after available and profitable knowledge, or had a fit of indigestion after the exquisite dinners he was learning so well to appreciate. Christmas was, of course, to be devoted to his own family, it was an unavoidable necessity, as he told Eleanor, while, in reality, he was beginning to find absence from his betrothed something of a relief. Yet the wranglings and folly of his home, even blessed by the presence of a Lady Maria, made him look forward to Easter at Ford Bank with something of the old pleasure. Eleanor, with the fine tact which love gives, had discovered his annoyance at various little incongruities in the household, at the time of his second visit in the previous autumn, and had laboured to make all as perfect as she could before his return. But she had much to struggle against. For the first time in her life there was a great want of ready money. She could scarcely obtain the servant's wages, and the bill for the spring seeds was a heavy weight on her conscience. For Miss Monroe's methodical habits had taught her pupil great exactitude as to all money matters. Then her father's temper had become very uncertain. He avoided being alone with her whenever he possibly could, and the consciousness of this, and of the terrible mutual secret which was the cause of this estrangement, were the reasons why Eleanor never recovered her pretty, youthful bloom after her illness. Of course it was to this that the outside world attributed her changed appearance. They would shake their heads and say, "'Ah, poor Miss Wilkins! What a lovely creature she was before that fever!' But youth is youth, and will assert itself in a certain elasticity of body and spirits, and at times Eleanor forgot that fearful night for several hours together. Even when her father's averted eye brought it all once more before her, she had learnt to form excuses and palliations, and to regard Mr. Dunster's death as only the consequence of an unfortunate accident. But she tried to put the miserable remembrance entirely out of her mind, to go on from day to day thinking only of the day, and how to arrange it so as to cause the least irritation to her father. She would so gladly have spoken to him on the one subject which overshadowed all their intercourse. She fancied that by speaking she might have been able to banish the phantom, or reduce its terror to what she believed to be the due proportion. But her father was evidently determined to show that he was never more to be spoken to on that subject, and all she could do was to follow his lead on the rare occasions that they fell into something like the old confidential intercourse. As yet, to her, he had never given way to anger, but before her he had often spoken in a manner which both pained and terrified her. Sometimes his eye, in the midst of his passion, caught on her face of affright and dismay, and then he would stop, and make such an effort to control himself as sometimes ended in tears. Eleanor did not understand that both these phases were owing to his increasing habit of drinking more than he ought to have done. She set them down as the direct effects of a sorely burdened conscience, and strove more and more to plan for his daily life at home, how it should go on with oiled wheels, neither a jerk nor a jar. It was no wonder she looked wistful, and careworn, and old. Miss Monroe was her great comfort, the total unconsciousness on that lady's part of anything below the surface, and yet her full and delicate recognition of all the little daily cares and trials, made her sympathy most valuable to Eleanor, while there was no need to fear that it would ever give Miss Monroe that power of seeing into the heart of things which it frequently confers upon imaginative people who are deeply attached to someone in sorrow. There was a strong bond between Eleanor and Dixon, although they scarcely ever exchanged a word save on the most commonplace subjects. 
but their silence was based on different feelings from that which separated Eleanor from her father. Eleanor and Dixon could not speak freely, because their hearts were full of pity for the faulty man whom they both loved so well, and tried so hard to respect. This was the state of the household to which Ralph Corbett came down at Easter. He might have been known in London as a brilliant diner-out by this time, but he could not afford to throw his life away in fireworks. He calculated his forces and condensed their power as much as might be, only visiting where he was likely to meet men who could help in his future career. He had been invited to spend the Easter vacation at a certain country house which would be full of such human stepping-stones, and he declined in order to keep his word to Eleanor and go to Ford Bank. But he could not help looking upon himself a little in the light of a martyr to duty, and perhaps this view of his own merits made him chafe under his future father-in-law's irritability of manner, which now showed itself even to him. He found himself distinctly regretting that he had suffered himself to be engaged so early in life, and having become conscious of the temptation, and not having repelled it at once, of course it returned and returned, and gradually obtained the mastery over him. What was to be gained by keeping to his engagement with Eleanor? He should have a delicate wife to look after, and even more than the common additional expenses of married life. He should have a father-in-law whose character at best had had only a local and provincial respectability, which it was now daily losing by habits which were both sensual and vulgarizing, a man, too, who was strangely changing from joyous geniality into moody surliness. Besides, he doubted if, in the evident change in the prosperity of the family, the fortune to be paid down on the occasion of his marriage to Eleanor could be forthcoming. And above all, and around all, there hovered the shadow of some unrevealed disgrace which might come to light at any time and involve him in it. He thought he had pretty well ascertained the nature of this possible shame, and had little doubt it would turn out to be that Dunster's disappearance, to America or elsewhere, had been an arranged plan with Mr. Wilkins. Although Mr. Ralph Corbett was capable of suspecting him of this mean crime, so far removed from the impulsive commission of the past sin which was dragging him daily lower and lower down, it was of a kind that was peculiarly distasteful to the acute lawyer, who foresaw how such base conduct would taint all whose names were ever mentioned, even by chance, in connection with it. He used to lie miserably tossing on his sleepless bed, turning over these things in the night season. He was tormented by all these thoughts. He would bitterly regret the past events that connected him with Eleanor, from the day when he first came to read with Mr. Ness up to the present time. But when he came down in the morning, and saw the faded Eleanor flash into momentary beauty at his entrance into the dining-room, and when she blushingly drew near with the one single flower freshly gathered, which it had been her custom to place in his buttonhole when he came down to breakfast, he felt as if his better self was stronger than temptation, and as if he must be an honest man and honourable lover, even against his wish. As the day wore on, the temptation gathered strength. Mr. Wilkins came down, and while he was on the scene, Eleanor seemed always engrossed by her father, who apparently cared little enough for all her attentions. Then there was a complaining of the food which did not suit the sickly palate of a man who had drunk hard the night before. And possibly these complaints were extended to the servants, and their incompleteness or incapacity was thus brought prominently before the eyes of Ralph, who would have preferred to eat a dry crust in silence, or to have gone without breakfast altogether, if he could have had intellectual conversation of some high order, to having the greatest dainties with the knowledge of the care required in their preparation, thus coarsely discussed before him. By the time such breakfasts were finished, Eleanor looked thirty, and her spirits were gone for the day. It had become difficult for Ralph to contract his mind to her small domestic interests, and she had little else to talk to him about, now that he responded but curtly to all her questions about himself, and was weary of professing a love which he was ceasing to feel, in all the passionate nothings which usually make up so much of lovers' talk. 
The books she had been reading were old classics, whose place in literature no longer admitted of keen discussion. The poor whom she cared for were all very well in their way, and if they could have been brought in to illustrate a theory, hearing about them might have been of some use, but as it was, it was simply tiresome to hear day after day of Betty Palmer's rheumatism and Mrs. Kay's baby's fits. There was no talking politics with her, because she was so ignorant that she always agreed with everything he said. He even grew to find luncheon and Miss Monroe not unpleasant varieties to his monotonous tete-a-tetes. Then came the walk, generally to the town to fetch Mr. Wilkins from his office, and once or twice it was pretty evident how he had been employing his hours. One day in particular his walk was so unsteady and his speech so thick that Ralph could only wonder how it was that Eleanor did not perceive the cause. But she was too openly anxious about the headache of which her father complained to have been at all aware of the previous self-indulgence which must have brought it on. This very afternoon, as ill luck would have it, the Duke of Hinton and a gentleman whom Ralph had met in town at Lord Bolton's rode by and recognized him saw Ralph supporting a tipsy man with such quiet, friendly interest as must show all passers-by that they were previous friends. Mr. Corbett chafed and fumed inwardly all the way home after this unfortunate occurrence. He was in a thoroughly evil temper before they reached Ford Bank, but he had too much self-command to let this be very apparent. He turned into the shrubbery paths, leaving Eleanor to take her father into the quietness of his own room, there to lie down and shake off his headache. Ralph walked along, ruminating in gloomy mood as to what was to be done, how he could best extricate himself from the miserable relation in which he had placed himself by giving way to impulse. Almost before he was aware, a little hand stole within his folded arms, and Eleanor's sweet, sad eyes looked into his. "'I have put Papa down for an hour's rest before dinner,' said she. His head seems to ache terribly. Ralph was silent and unsympathizing, trying to nerve himself up to be disagreeable, but finding it difficult in the face of such sweet trust. Do you remember our conversation last autumn, Eleanor? He began at length. Her head sunk. They were near a garden seat, and she quietly sat down without speaking. About some disgrace which you then fancied hung over you? no answer. Does it still hang over you? Yes, she whispered with a heavy sigh. And your father knows this, of course? Yes, again in the same tone, and then silence. I think it is doing him harm, at length, Ralph went on, decidedly. I am afraid it is, she said in a low tone. "'I wish you would tell me what it is,' he said, a little impatiently. "'I might be able to help you about it.' "'No, you could not,' replied Eleanor. "'I was sorry to my very heart to tell you what I did. "'I did not want help. All that is past. "'But I wanted to know if you thought that a person situated as I was "'was justified in marrying anyone ignorant of what might happen. "'What I do hope and trust never will.' If I don't know what you are alluding to in this mysterious way, you must see. Don't you see, love? I am in the position of the ignorant man whom I think you said you could not feel it right to marry. Why don't you tell me straight out what it is? He could not help his irritation betraying itself in his tones and manner of speaking. She bent a little forward and looked full into his face as though to pierce to the very heart's truth of him. Then she said, as quietly as she had ever spoken in her life, "'You wish to break off our engagement?' He reddened and grew indignant in a moment. "'What nonsense! Just because I ask a question and make a remark? I think your illness must have made you fanciful, Eleanor. Surely nothing I said deserves such an interpretation. On the contrary, have I not shown the sincerity and depth of my affection to you by clinging to you through, through everything? He was going to say, through the wearying opposition of my family, 
but he stopped short, for he knew that the very fact of his mother's opposition had only made him the more determined to have his own way in the first instance, and even now he did not intend to let out what he had concealed up to this time, that his friends all regretted his imprudent engagement. Eleanor sat silently gazing out upon the meadows, but seeing nothing. Then she put her hand into his. "'I quite trust you, Ralph. I was wrong to doubt. I'm afraid I have grown fanciful and silly.' He was rather put to it for the right words, for she had precisely divined the dim thought that had overshadowed his mind when she had looked so intently at him. But he caressed her and reassured her with fond words, as incoherent as lovers' words generally are. By and by they sauntered homewards. When they reached the house, Eleanor left him and flew up to see how her father was. When Ralph went into his own room he was vexed with himself, both for what he had said and for what he had not said. His mental lookout was not satisfactory. Neither he nor Mr. Wilkins was in good humour with the world in general at dinner-time and it needs little in such cases to condense and turn the lowering tempers into one particular direction. As long as Eleanor and Miss Monroe stayed in the dining-room, a sort of moody peace had been kept up, the ladies talking incessantly to each other about the trivial nothings of their daily life, with an instinctive consciousness that if they did not chatter on, something would be said by one of the gentlemen which would be distasteful to the other. As soon as Ralph had shut the door behind them, Mr. Wilkins went to the sideboard and took out a bottle which had not previously made its appearance. "'Have a little cognac?' he asked, with an assumption of carelessness, as he poured out a wine-glassful. "'It's a capital thing for the headache, and this nasty, lowering weather has given me a racking headache all day.' "'I'm sorry for it,' said Ralph for I wanted particularly to speak to you about business, about my marriage, in fact. Well, speak away. I'm as clear-headed as any man, if that's what you mean. Ralph bowed, a little contemptuously. What I wanted to say was that I am anxious to have all things arranged for my marriage in August. Eleanor is so much better now, in fact so strong, that I think we may reckon upon her standing the change to a London life pretty well. Mr. Wilkins stared at him rather blankly, but did not immediately speak. "'Of course I may have the deeds drawn up in which, as by previous arrangement, you advance a certain portion of Eleanor's fortune, for the purposes therein to be assigned, as we settled last year when I hoped to have been married in August.' A thought flitted through Mr. Wilkinson's confused brain that he should find it impossible to produce the thousands required without having recourse to the money-lenders, who are already making difficulties, and charging him usurious interest for the advances they had lately made, and he unwisely tried to obtain a diminution in the sum he had originally proposed to give Eleanor. Unwisely, because he might have read Ralph's character better than to suppose he would easily consent to any diminution, without good and sufficient reason being given, or without some promise of compensating advantages in the future, for the present sacrifice asked from him. But perhaps Mr. Wilkins, dulled as he was by wine, thought he could allege a good and sufficient reason, for he said, "'You must not be hard upon me, Ralph. That promise was made before—before before I exactly knew the state of my affairs.' "'Before Dunster's disappearance, in fact,' said Mr. Corbett, fixing his steady, penetrating eyes on Mr. Wilkinson's countenance. "'Yes, exactly, before Dunster's—' mumbled out Mr. Wilkins, red and confused, and not finishing his sentence. "'By the way,' said Ralph, for, with careful carelessness of manner, he thought he could extract something of the real nature of the impending disgrace from his companion, in the state in which he then was. And if he only knew more about this danger, he could guard against it, guard others, perhaps himself. "'By the way,' "'Have you ever heard anything of Dunster since he went off to America, isn't it thought?' He was startled beyond his power of self-control by the instantaneous change in Mr. Wilkins, which his question produced. Both started up, 
Mr. Wilkins, white, shaking, and trying to say something, but unable to form a sensible sentence. "'Good God! Sir, what is the matter?' said Ralph, alarmed at these signs of physical suffering. Mr. Wilkins sat down, and repelled his nearer approach without speaking. "'It is nothing, only this headache which shoots through me at times. Don't look at me, sir, in that way.' "'It is very unpleasant to find another man's eyes perpetually fixed upon you.' "'I beg your pardon,' said Ralph coldly, his short-lived sympathy thus repulsed, giving way to his curiosity. But he waited for a minute or two without daring to renew the conversation, at the point where they had stopped. Whether interrupted by bodily or mental discomfort on the part of his companion he was not quite sure.' While he hesitated how to begin again on the subject, Mr. Wilkins pulled the bottle of brandy to himself and filled his glass again, tossing off the spirit as if it had been water. Then he tried to look Mr. Corbett full in the face, with a stare as pertinacious as he could make it, but very different from the keen observant gaze which was trying to read him through. "'What were we talking about?' said Ralph at length with the most natural air in the world, just as if he had really been forgetful of some half-discussed subject of interest. "'Of what you'd a d-blanked deal better hold your tongue about,' growled out Mr. Wilkins in a surly, thick voice. "'Sir!' said Ralph, starting to his feet with real passion at being so addressed by Wilkins the attorney. "'Yes,' continued the latter. I'll manage my own affairs and allow of no meddling and no questioning. I said so once before, and I was not minded, and bad came of it. And now I say it again. And if you're to come here and put impertinent questions, and stare at me as you've been doing this half-hour past, why, the sooner you leave this house the better. Ralph half turned to take him at his word, and go at once. But then he gave Eleanor another chance as he worded it in his thoughts, but it was in no spirit of conciliation that he said, "'You've taken too much of that stuff, sir. You don't know what you're saying. If you did, I should leave your house at once, never to return.' "'You think so, do you?' said Mr. Wilkins, trying to stand up and look dignified and sober. "'I say, sir, that if you ever venture again to talk and look as you have done to-night, why, sir, I will ring the bell and have you shown the door by my servants. So now you're warned, my fine fellow. He sat down, laughing a foolish, tipsy laugh of triumph. In another minute his arm was held firmly but gently by Ralph. Listen, Mr. Wilkins, he said in a low, hoarse voice. You shall never have to say to me twice what you have said to-night. Henceforward we are as strangers to each other. As to Eleanor... His tones softened a little, and he sighed in spite of himself. I do not think we should have been happy. I believe our engagement was formed when we were too young to know our own minds. But I would have done my duty and kept to my word. But you, sir, have yourself severed the connection between us by your insolence to-night. I, to be turned out of your house by your servants. I, a Corbett of Westley, who would not submit to such threats from a peer of the realm, let him be ever so drunk. He was out of the room, almost out of the house, before he had spoken the last words. Mr. Wilkins sat still, first fiercely angry, then astonished, and lastly dismayed into sobriety. Corbett! Corbett! Ralph! He called in vain. Then he got up and went to the door, opened it, looked into the fully lighted hall, all was so quiet there that he could hear the quiet voices of the women in the drawing-room talking together. He thought for a moment, went to the hat-stand, and missed Ralph's low-crowned straw hat. Then he sat down once more in the dining-room, and endeavoured to make out exactly what had passed. But he could not believe that Mr. Corbett had come to any enduring or final resolution to break off his engagement, and he had almost reasoned himself back into his former state of indignation at impertinence and injury, when Eleanor came in, pale, hurried, and anxious. "'Papa, what does this mean?' said she, putting an open note into his hand. He took up his glasses, but his hand shook so that he could hardly read. 
The note was from the parsonage to Eleanor. Only three lines sent by Mr. Ness's servant, who had come to fetch Mr. Corbett's things. He had written three lines with some consideration for Eleanor, even when he was in his first flush of anger against her father, and it must be confessed of relief at his own freedom, thus brought about by the act of another, and not of his own working out, which partly saved his conscience. The note ran thus. Dear Eleanor, words have passed between your father and me, which have obliged me to leave his house, I fear, never to return to it. I will write more fully to-morrow. But do not grieve too much, for I am not, and never have been, good enough for you. God bless you, my dearest Nelly, though I call you so for the last time. R.C. Papa, what is it? Eleanor cried, clasping her hands together as her father sat silent, vacantly gazing into the fire after finishing the note. I don't know, said he, looking up at her piteously. It's the world, I think. Everything goes wrong with me and mine. It went wrong before that night, so it can't be that, can it, Eleanor? Oh, papa, said she, kneeling down by him, her face hidden on his breast. He put one arm languidly round her. I used to read of Orestes and the Furies at Eton when I was a boy, and I thought it was all a heathen fiction. Poor little motherless girl, said he, laying his other hand on her head, with the caressing gesture he had been accustomed to use when she had been a little child. Did you love him so very dearly, Nelly? he whispered, his cheek against her. For somehow of late he has not seemed to me good enough for thee. He has got an inkling that something has gone wrong, and he was very inquisitive. I may say he questioned me in a relentless kind of way. Oh, papa, it was my doing, I'm afraid. I said something long ago about possible disgrace. He pushed her away. He stood up and looked at her with the eyes dilated, half in fear, half in fierceness, of an animal at bay. He did not heed that his abrupt movement had almost thrown her prostrate on the ground. "'You, Eleanor! You! You!' "'Oh, darling father, listen!' said she, creeping to his knees and clasping them with her hands. "'I said it as if it were a possible case of someone else last August, but he immediately applied it and asked me if it was over me the disgrace or shame. I forget the words we used.' hung and what could i say anything anything to put him off the scent god help me i am a lost man betrayed by my child eleanor let go his knees and covered her face every one stabbed at that poor heart in a minute or so her father spoke again i don't mean what i say i often don't mean it now eleanor you must forgive me my child he stooped and lifted her up and sat down taking her on his knee and smoothing her hair off her hot forehead. Remember, child, how very miserable I am, and have forgiveness for me. He had none, and yet he must have seen I had been drinking. Drinking, papa, said Eleanor, raising her head and looking at him with sorrowful surprise. Yes, I drink now to try and forget said he, blushing and confused. "'Oh, how miserable we are!' cried Eleanor, bursting into tears. "'How very miserable! It seems almost as if God had forgotten to comfort us.' "'Hush, hush,' said he. "'Your mother said once she did so pray that you might grow up religious. You must be religious, child, because she prayed for it so often. Poor Latisse!' How glad I am that you are dead. Here he began to cry like a child. Eleanor comforted him with kisses rather than words. He pushed her away after a while and said sharply, How much does he know? I must make sure of that. How much did you tell him, Eleanor? Nothing, nothing indeed, Papa, but what I told you just now. Tell it me again, the exact words. I will as well as I can, but it was last August. I only said, 
was it right for a woman to marry knowing that disgrace hung over her and keeping her lover in ignorance of it that was all you are sure yes he immediately applied the case to me to ourselves and he never wanted to know what was the nature of the threatened disgrace yes he did and you told him no not a word more he referred to the subject again to-day in the shrubbery but i told him nothing more you quite believe me don't you papa he pressed her to him but did not speak then he took the note up again and read it with as much care and attention as he could collect in his agitated state of mind nelly said he at length he says true he is not good enough for thee he shrinks from the thought of the disgrace thou must stand alone and bear the sins of thy father he shook so much as he said this that eleanor had to put any suffering of her own on one side and try to confine her thoughts to the necessity of getting her father immediately up to bed she sat by him till he went to sleep and she could leave him and go to her own room to forgetfulness and rest if she could find those priceless blessings end of chapter 9 recording by lisa reichert chapter 10 mr corbett was so well known at the parsonage by the two old servants that he had no difficulty on reaching it after his departure from ford bank in having the spare bedroom made ready for him late as it was in the absence of the master who had now taken a little holiday now that lent and easter were over for the purpose of fishing while his room was getting ready ralph sent for his clothes and by the same messenger he dispatched a little note to eleanor but there was a letter he had promised to her in it still to be written and it was almost his night's employment to say enough yet not too much as he expressed it to himself he was over halfway over the stream and it would be folly to turn back for he had given nearly as much pain to both himself and eleanor by this time he should ma do by making the separation final besides after mr wilkins's speech that evening but he was candid enough to acknowledge that bad and offensive as they had been if they had stood alone they might have been condoned his letter ran as follows dearest eleanor for dearest you are and i think ever will be my judgment has consented us to a step which has given me great pain greater than you will readily believe i am convinced it is better that we should part for circumstances have occurred since we formed our engagement which although i am unaware of their exact nature i can see weigh heavily towards you and have materially affected your father's behaviour nay i think after to-night i may almost say have entirely altered his feelings towards me what these circumstances are i am ignorant any further that i know from your own admission that they may lead to some future disgrace now it may be my fault it may be in my temperament to be anxious above all things earthly to obtain and possess a high reputation i can only say that it is so and leave you to blame me for my weakness as much as you would like but anything that might come in between me and this object would i own be ill tolerated by me the very dread of such an obstacle intervening would paralyze me i should become irritable and deep as my affection is and always must be towards you i could not promise a happy peaceful life i should be perpetually haunted by the idea of what might happen in the way of discovery and shame i am the more convinced of this from my observation of your father's altered character an alteration which i trace back to the time I, which i conjecture that the secret affairs took place to which you have alluded in short it is for your sake my dear eleanor even more than my own that i feel compelled to affix a final meaning to the words which your father addressed to me last night when he desired me to leave his house forever god bless you eleanor for the last time my eleanor try and forget as soon as you can the unfortunate tie which has bound you for to a for a time to one so unsuitable i believe i ought to say so unworthy of you as ralph corbett eleanor was making breakfast when this letter was given to her according to the wont of the servants of the respected households of the parsonage in ford bank the man asked if there was any answer it was only custom for he had not been desired to do so eleanor went to the window to read her letter the man waiting all the time respectfully for her reply she went to the writing table and wrote it is right quite right i ought to have thought of it all last august i do not think you will forgive me easily but i entreat you never at any future time to blame yourself 
I hope you will be happy and successful. I suppose I must never write to you again, but I shall always pray for you. Papa was very sorry last night for having spoken angrily to you. You must forgive him. There is great need for forgiveness in this world, Eleanor. She kept putting down thought after thought just to prolong the last pleasure of writing to him. She sealed the note and gave it to the man. Then she sat down and waited for Miss Munro, who had gone to bed on the previous night without awaiting Eleanor's return from the dining room. I am late, my dear, said Miss Munro on coming down, but I have a bad headache, and I knew you had a pleasant companion. Then, looking around, she perceived Ralph's absence. Mr. Corbett not down yet, she exclaimed, and then Eleanor had to tell her the outline of the facts so soon likely to be made public, that Mr. Corbett and she had determined to break off their engagement, and that Mr. Corbett had accordingly betaken himself to the parsonage, and she did not expect him to return to Fort Bank. Miss Munro's astonishment was unabounded. She kept going over and over on all the little circumstances she had noticed during the last week. Only on yesterday, in fact, which she had noticed she could not reconcile with the notion that the two, apparently so much attached to each other but a few hours before, were now forever to be separated and estranged. As Eleanor sickened under the torture, which yet seemed like torture in a dream, for which there must come an awakening and a relief, she felt as if she could not hear any more. Yet there was always more to hear. Her father, it turned out, was very ill, and had been so all night long. He had evidently had some kind of attack on the brain, whether apologetic or paralytic as for the doctors to decide. In the hurry and anxiety of the day of misery succeeding to misery, she had almost forgotten to wonder whether Ralph was still at the parsonage, still in Hamley, and it was not till the evening visit of the physician that she learned he had been seen by Dr. Morse as he was taken his place in the morning mail to London. Dr. Moore alluded to the name as though the thought would cheer and comfort the fragile girl during her night, watched by the f watched by her father's bedside. But Miss Munro stole out after the doctor to warn him of the subject of for the future, crying bitterly over the forlorn position of her darling as she spoke, crying as Eleanor had never been able to cry. Though all the time, in the pride of her sex, she was endeavouring to persuade the doctor it was entirely Eleanor's doing, and doing the wisest and best things she could have done and he was not good enough for her, only a poor barrister struggling for a livelihood. Like many other kind-hearted people, she fell into the blunder of lowering the moral character of those whom it was their greatest risk to exalt. But Dr. Moore knew Eleanor too well to believe the whole of what Miss Munro said. She would never act from interested motives, and it was all the more likely to cling to a man because he was down and unsuccessful. No, there had been a level's quarrel, and it could not have happened at a sadder time. Before the June roses were in full bloom, Mr. Wilkins was dead. He had left his daughters to the guardianship of Mr. Ness by some will made years ago, but Mr. Ness had caught a rheumatic fever with his Easter fishings and been unable to be moved home from the little Welsh inn where he had been staying where he was taken ill. Since his last attack, Mr. Wilkins's mind had been much affected, and he often talked strangely and wildly, but he had rare intervals of quietness and full possession of his senses. At one of these times he must have written a half-finished pencil note, which his nurse found under his pillow after his death, and brought to Eleanor. Through her tear-blinded eyes she read the weak, faltering words. I am very ill. Sometimes I think I should never get better, so I wish to ask your pardon for what I said the night before I was taken ill. I afraid my anger made mischief before, between you and Eleanor, but think you will forgive a dying man. If you come back and let all as it used to be, I will make any apologies you require. If sh I go... She will be very, so very friendless, and I have looked to you to care for her ever since you first. Then came some illegible and incoherent writing, ending with, From my deathbed I adjure to you to stand to her friend. I will beg pardon on my knees for anything. And there strength had failed. The paper and pencil had been laid aside to be resumed at some time when the brain was clearer, the hand stronger. Eleanor kissed the letter, kissed the letter, reverently folding it up, and laid it in among her sacred treasures, by her mother's half in a sewing and a little curl over her baby sister's golden hair. Mr. Johnson, who had once been the trustees for Mr. Wilkins's marriage settlement, a respectable solicitor in the country town, and Mr. Ness had been appointed executor of his will, and guardian to Eleanor. The will itself has been made several years before, when he imagined himself the possessor of a handsome fortune, the bulk of which bequeathed to his only child. By her mother's marriage settlement, Ford Bank was held in the trust for children of the marriage, the trustees being Sir Frank Holder and Mr. Johnson. There are some legacies to his executors, a small annuity to Miss Munro, with the expression of a hope that it might be arranged to her continue living with Eleanor as long as the latter remained unmarried, and all her servants were remembered, Dixon especially, and most liberally. What remained of the handsome fortune one possessed by the testator? The executors asked in vain. 
There was nothing. They could hardly make out what had become of it, and with such utter confusion with all the accounts, both personal and official, Mr. Johnson was hardly restrained by his compassion for the orphan from throwing up at the executorship in disgust. Mr. Ness roused himself from his scholar-like abstraction to labour and examination of books, parchments, papers for Eleanor's sake. Sir Francis Holster professed himself only a trustee for Ford Bank. Meanwhile, she went on living at Ford Bank, quite unconscious of the state of her father's affairs, but sunk into a deep, planetive melancholy, which affected her looks and the tones of her voice in such a manner to distress Miss Munro exceedingly. It was not that good lady did not quite acknowledge the great cause her people had for grieving. Deserted by her lover, her father dead, which she could not bear the outward signs of how much the sorrow had told on Eleanor. Her love for the poor girl was infinitely distressed by seeing the daily wasting away, the constant heavy depression of spirits, and she grew impatient to the, of the continual pain of sympathy. If Miss Monroe could have done something to relieve Eleanor of her woe, she would have been less inclined to scold her for giving way to it. The time came when Miss Monroe could act, and after that there was no more irritation on her part. When all hope of Eleanor's having anything beyond the house and grounds of Ford Bank were gone, and when it was proved that all the legacies bequeathed by Mr. Wilkins was not one farthing could ever be paid, when it came to a question of how far the beautiful pictures and other objects of art in the house were not legally the property of unsatisfied creditors, the state of her father's affairs was communicated to Eleanor as delicately as Mr. Ness knew how. She was drooping over her work, she always drooped now, and she left off sewing to listen to him, leaning her head in the arm of which she rested on the table. She did not speak when he had ended his statement. She was silent for whole minutes afterwards, and he went on speaking out of very agitation and awkwardness. It was all the rascal Dunster's doing, I've no doubt, he said he, trying to account for the entire loss of Mr. Wilkins's fortune. To his surprise, she lifted up her white stony face, and she said slowly and faintly, but with almost col solemn calmness, Mr. Ness, you must never allow Mr. Dunster to be blamed for this. My dearest Eleanor, there can be no doubt about it. Your father always referred to the losses he sustained by Dunster's disappearance. Eleanor covered her face with her hands. God forgive us all, she said, and relapsed into the old, unbearable silence. Mr. Ness had undertaken to discuss her future plans with her, and he was obliged to go on. Now, my dear child, I have known you since you were quite a little girl, you know, so he must not give way to feeling, for he himself was choking. She was quite quiet, but this is what I think must be done. You will have the rent of this house, and we will have a very good offer for it. A tenant on the lease of seven years at a hundred and twenty pounds a year. I will never let this house, she said, standing up suddenly, as if defying him. Not let for a bank? Why? I don't understand it. I can't have been clear, Eleanor. The rent of this house is all you will have to live on. I can't help it. I can't leave this house. Oh, Mr. Ness, I can't leave this house. My dear child, you shall not be hurried. I know how hard all these things are coming upon you, and I wish I had never seen Corbett. With all my heart I do. But this was almost to himself. She must have heard it, for she quivered all over. But leave this house you must. You must eat, and the rent of the house must pay for your food. You must dress, and there is nothing but the rent to clothe you on. I will glad you have you stay at the parsonage as long as you like, but in fact the negotiations with Mr. Osbaldistone, the gentleman who offers to take the house, are nearly completed. It's my house, said Eleanor fiercely. I know it is settled on me. No, my dear, it is held in trust for you by Sir Frank Holster and Mr. Johnson, and you will receive all monies and benefit accruing from it. He spoke gently, for he almost thought her head was turned. But you must remember you are not of age, and Mr. Johnson and I have full power. Eleanor sat down, helpless. Leave me, she said at length. You are very kind, but you don't know. I cannot stand any more talking now, she added faintly. Mr. Ness bent over her and kissed her forehead, and withdrew without another word. He went to Miss Munro. Well, and how did you find her? was her first inquiry, after the usual greetings had passed between them. It really is quite painful to see how she gives way. Really is quite sad to see how she gives way. I speak to her, and speak to her, and tell her as how she is neglecting after all her duties, and she does no good. She has still has to bear a further sorrow today, said Mr. Ness, on the part of Mr. Johnson and myself a very painful duty to perform to you as well as her. Mr. Wilkins has died insolvent. I grieve to say there is no hope of you recovering any of your annuity. Mr. Miss Munro looked very blank. Many happy little visions had faded away in those few moments. Then she roused up and said, I am but forty. I have a good fifteen years left to work in me, thank God. Insolvent? Do you mean he left no money? Not a farthing. The creditors may be thankful if they are fully paid. And Eleanor? Eleanor will have the rent of this house, which is hers by the right of her mother's settlement, to live on. How much will that be? A hundred and twenty pounds. Miss Monroe's lips went from a form prepared for whistling. 
Mr. Ness continued. She is at present unwilling enough to leave this house, poor girl. It is but natural, but she has no power in the matter, even where there was any other course open to her. I can only say how glad, how honoured I shall feel, as long as a visit as you, and she can be prevailed along to pay me at the parsonage. Where is Mr. Corbett? said Miss Munro. I do not know. After breaking off his engagement, he wrote to me a long letter, explanatory, as he called it, explaculary, as I termed it. I wrote back, curtly enough, saying I had regretted the breaking off of an intercourse, which has always been very pleasant to me, but that he must be aware, with my intimacy at the family of the Ford Bank, it will be both awkward and unpleasant to all parties if he and I remained on our previous footing. Who's going past the w window? Eleanor riding? Miss Mummer went to the window. Yes, I am thankful to see her on horseback again. It was only this morning I advised her to have a ride. Poor Dixon. He will suffer too. His legacy cannot be paid more than the others. And it is not many young ladies who will be as consent to have a so old, so old fashioned a groom riding after them as Eleanor seems to be. As soon as Mr. Ness left, Miss Monroe went to her desk and wrote a long letter to some friends she had at the Cathedral of the East Chester, where she had spent some happy years of her former life. Her thoughts had, beg had gone back to the time even when Mr. Ness had been speaking, for it was when her father had lived, and it was after his death that her cares had in search of subsistence had begun. But the recollections of the peaceful years spent there were stronger than the remembrance of the weeks of sorrow and care, and, while Eleanor's marriage had seemed a probable event, she had made a little plan of their returning to her native place, and obtaining what daily teaching she could meet there, and the friends to whom she was writing now had promised her their aid. She thought that Eleanor had to leave Ford Bank, a home at a distance might be more agreeable to her, and she went on to plan that they should live together, if possible, on her earnings and the small income that would be Eleanor's. Miss Munro uh, loved her pupil so dearly that if her own pleasure was only to be consulted, this projected life would be more agreeable to her than if Mr. Wilkins's legacy to set her in independence. With Eleanor away from her, married, and with some interest in which her former governess had but little part. As soon as Mr. Ness had left her, Eleanor rang the bell and startled the servant who answered up by a sudden sharp desire to have the horses at the door as soon as possible and to tell Dixon to be ready to go out with her. She felt that she must speak to him, and in her nervous state she wanted to be on the free borrowed common. No one could notice or remark their talk. It was long since she had ridden, and much wonder was excited by her in the sudden movement in kitchen and stable yard. But Dixon went gravely about his work preparation, saying nothing. They rode pretty hard till they reached Monk's Heath, six or seven miles away from Hamley. Eleanor had previously determined that she would talk over the plan Mr. Ness had proposed to her with Dixon, and he seemed to understand her without any words passing between them. When she reined in, he rode up to her, and he met the gaze of her sad eyes with sympathetic, wistful silence. Dixon, said she, they say I must leave for bank. I was afeard from it. From all I've heard, say I, in the town since the master's death. Then you've heard, then you know, that Papa had hardly left any money. My poor dear Dixon, you won't have your legacy, and I never thought of that before. Never heed, never heed, he said eagerly. I couldn't have touched it if it would have been it there, but the taking it would have seemed too like blood money, he was going to say, but he stopped in time. She guessed the meaning, though not the words he would have used. No, not that, said she. His will was dated years before. But oh, Dixon, what must I do? They will make me leave for a bank, I see. The trustees have half let it already. Well, you'll have the rent on I reckon, he asked anxiously. Many a time heard them say it was set it on the missus first, and then on, on you. Oh, yes. It's not that, but, you know, under the beech tree. I, he said heavily. It's been oftentimes in my mind, waking, and I think there's never a night I don't dream of it. But how can I leave it? Eleanor cried. They may do a hundred things, may drig up the shrubbery. Oh, Dixon, I feel sure of it was to be found out. Oh, Dixon, I cannot bear any more blame on Papa. It will kill me, and such a dreadful thing too. Dixon's face fell into the lines of habitual pain that had assumed of late years whenever he was thinking or remembering anything. They must never have any reason to speak ill of the dead, that's for certain, he said he. The Wilkinses have been respected in Hamley all my lifetime, and all my fathers before me. And surely, Missy, there's ways and means of tying tenants up from the alterations both the house and out it. I beg the trustees, or whatever they're called, to be very particular if I was you, and not have a thing touched either in the house, or in the gardens, or in the meadows, or in the stables. I think with a word from you, they may keep me in in the stables, and I could look after things a bit. And the day of judgment will come at last, when all our secrets will be made known, without having the trouble and the shame of telling them. I'm getting rather tired of this world, Miss Eleanor. 
Don't talk so, said Eleanor tenderly. I know how sad it is, but oh, remember how I shall want a friend when you're gone, to advise me as you have done today. You're not feeling ill, Dixon, are you? She considered anxiously. No, I'm hearty enough, and like it for the live. The father was eighty-one, and mother were about the seventies when they died. It's only my heart as I got to feel so heavy. Our only for that matter is, is yours. So is yours, I'll be bound. And it's a comfort to us both if we can serve him as dead as any care of ours, for he was such a bright, handsome lad, with such cheery face as never should have known shame. They rode on without much more speaking. Eleanor was silently planning for Dixon, and he, not caring to look forward to the future, was bringing up before fancy this time. Thirty years ago, when he had first entered the elder Mr. Wilkins' service as stable lad, and pretty Molly, the scullery nag, was his daily delight. Pretty Molly lay buried in Hamley churchyard, and few living, except Dixon, could have gone straight to her grave. End of chapter 10 Recording by Anthony Orr Chapter 11 In a few days Miss Munro obtained a most satisfactory reply to one of her letters of inquiries as to whether a daily governess could find employment in East Chester. For once the application seemed to have come at just the right time. The canons were most of them married men with young families, those at present in residence welcomed the idea of such an instruction as Miss Munro could offer for their children, and almost answer that for their successors in office. This was a great step gained. Miss Munro, the daughter of a professor to this very cathedral, had a secret unwillingness to be engaged as a teacher by any wealthy tradesman there, but to be received into the canon's families, in almost any capacity, was like going home. Moreover, besides the empty honour of the thing, there were many small pieces of patronage and gift in the chap chapter, such as a small house opening on the close, which has formerly belonged to the verger, but which are now vacant, and which was offered to Miss Munro in nominal rent. Eleanor had once more sunk into her old depressed passive state. Mr. and S. and Miss Munro, modest and undecided as they were both in general, had to fix and arrange everything for her. Her great interest seemed to be in the old servant Dixon, and her great pleasure seemed to lie in seeing Tim, and talking over old times. So her two friends talked about her, little knowing what a bitter, stinging pain her pleasure was. In vain, Eleanor tried to plan how they could take Dixon with them to East Chester. If he had been a woman, it would have been a feasible step, for they would only keep one servant, and Dixon, capable and versatile as he was, would not do for that servant. All that passed through Eleanor's mind, it's still a question of whether Dixon would have felt the love of his native place, and with all its associations and remembrances, or his love of Eleanor, the stronger. But he was not put to the proof, he was only told that he must leave, and seeing Eleanor's extreme grief at the idea of their separation, he set himself to comfort her by every means in his power, reminding her, with end of choice of words, how necessary it was that he should remain on the spot, in Mr. Osterman's service, by any small influence he might have, every project alteration in the garden that contained the dreadful secret. He persisted in this view, though Eleanor repeated, with pertinacious anxiety, the care in which Mr. Johnson had taken, in drawing up the lease, to provide against any change or alteration being made in the present disposition of the house or grounds. People in general were rather astonished at the eagerness Miss Wilkins showed to sell all of the Ford Bank furniture. Even Miss Munro was a little scandalised at the want of this sentiment, although she said nothing about it, indeed justified the step by telling everyone how wisely Eleanor was acting, that the large, handsome tables and chairs would be very much out of place in keeping with the small, oddly shaped rooms of their future house in East Chester Close. None knew how strong was the instinct of self-preservation, may almost, almost be called, which impelled Eleanor to shake off at any cost of present pain, the incubus of a terrible remembrance. She wanted him to go into an unhaunted dwelling in a free, unknown country, as she felt it was her only chance of sanity. Sometimes she thought her sentence would not hold together till the time when those arrangements were ended, but she did not speak to anyone about her feelings, poor child, to whom she could she speak on the subject but to Dixon, nor did she define them to herself. All she knew was that she was going nearly mad as possible, and if she did, she feared that she might betray her folder's guilt. All this time she never cried, or varied from her dull, passive demeanour, and there were blessed tears of relief that she shed when Miss Munro, herself weeping bitterly, told her to put her head out of the post chairs window, for at the next turning of the road they would catch the last glimpse of Hanley church spire. Late one October evening, Eleanor had her first sight of East Chester clothes, where she was to pass the remainder of her life. Miss Munro had been backwards and forwards between Hamley and East Chester more than once, while Eleanor remained at the parsonage so she had not only the pride of proprietorship in the whole of the beautiful city, but something of desire of hospitality welcoming Eleanor to their joint future home. Look, 
The fly must take a long road round because of our luggage, but behind those old walls of the Canon's gardens, that high-pitched roof with the clumps of stone crop on the walls near it, is Canon Wilson's, whose four little girls I am to teach. Hark, the great cathedral clock! How proud I used to be of its great boom when I was a child! I thought all the other church clocks in town sounded so shrill and poor after that, and that when I con which I considered mine especially. There are rooks flying towards the elms in the close. I wonder if they are the same that used to be there when I a little go. They say that the rook is a very long-lived bird, and I could swear as if they are the way they are cawing. Eh, hey, you may smile, Eleanor, but I now understand the lines of those grey used to say so prettily. I feel the gales from ye below, a momentary bis bestow, and breathe a second spring. Now, dear, you must get out. This flag walk leads to our front door, but our back rooms, which are the pleasantest, looks on to the close, and the cathedral, and the lime tree walk, and the deanery, and the rookery. It was a mere slip of a house, the kitchen being wisely placed close to the front door, so reserving a pretty view for the little dining room, of, out of which a glass door opened into a small walled-in garden, which had the entrance into the close. Upstairs was a bedroom in the front, which Miss Munro had taken for herself, because, as she said, she had associations with the back of every house of the high street, which Eleanor mounted to the pleasant chamber above the tiny drawing-room, both of which looked on to the vast and solemn cathedral, and the peaceful, dignified close. East Chester's Cathedral is Norman, with a low, massive tower, a grand, majestic nave, and a choir full of stately, historic tombs. The whole city is so quiet and decorous a place, that the perpetual daily chants and hymns of praise seem to sound so far and wide over the roofs of the houses. Eleanor soon became a regular attendant at the morning and evening services. The sense of worship calmed and soothed her achy, wearing heart, and to be punctual to those cathedral hours, she roused and exerted herself when probably doing nothing else would have been sufficient to this end. By and by, Miss Munro formed many acquaintances she picked up, or was picked up by, old friends and the descendants of old friends. The grave and kindly canons, whose children she taught, called upon her with their wives, and talked over the former deans and chapters, of whom she had been a, both been a personal and traditional knowledge, as they walked away and talked about her silent, delicate-looking friend Miss Wilkins, and perhaps planned some little present of the, out of their future garden or bountiful stores which should make Miss Munro's table a little more tempting to one apparently so frail as Eleanor, for the household was always spoken of as belonging to Miss Munro, the active and prominent person. By and by, Eleanor herself won her way to their hearts, not by words or deeds, but by her sweet looks and meek demeanour, as they marked her regular attendance at the cathedral service, and when they heard of her consistent visits to a certain parachild school, and of her being sometimes seen carrying a little basin to the cottages of the poor, they began to try and tempt her, with more urgent words, to accompany Miss Munro in her frequent tea-drinkings at their house. The old dean, that courteous gentleman and good Christian, early become great friends with Eleanor. He had watched at the windows of his great vaulted library till he saw her emerge into, from her garden into the close, and then open the deanery drawer, and join her, she softly adjusting the measure of his pace to his. This time of his departure from East Chester became a great blank in her life, although she would never accept, or allow Miss Munro to accept, his repeated invitations to go and pay him a visit at his country place. Indeed, once having tasted comparative peace again at East Chester Cathedral Close, it seemed as though she was afraid of ever venturing out onto those calm precincts. All Mr. Ness's invitations to visit him as his parsonage at Hamley was declined, although he was welcomed at Miss Munro's on the occasion of his annual visit by every means in their power. He slept at one of the canon's vacant houses and lived with his two friends, who made a yearly festivity to the best of their means in his honour, inviting such the cathedral clergy as were in residence or, if they failed, consenting to the town clergy. Their friends knew well that no presents were so acceptable as those sent while Mr. Ness was with them, and from the dean, who would send them a hamper of choice fruit and flowers from Oxton Park down to the curate, who worked on the same schools as Eleanor, and who was a great fisher, and caught splendid trout, all did their best to help them to give them a welcome to the only visitor they ever had. The only visitor they ever had, as far as the stately gentry knew. There was one, however, who came as often as master could give him a holiday long enough to undertake a journey to so distant a place. But few knew of his being a guest at Miss Munro's, though his welcome was there was not less hearty than Mr. Ness's. This was Dixon. Eleanor had convinced him that he could give her no greater pleasure any time by allowing her to frank him to and from Mr. East Chester. Whenever he came, they were together the, the greater part of the day, she taking him hither and thither to see all the sights that she thought would interest or please him, but they spoke very little to each other during all this companionship. Miss Munro had much more to say to them. She questioned him right and left whether Eleanor was out of the room. She learnt that the house at Ford Bank was splendidly furnished, and that no money spared on the garden, 
and that the elderly Miss Hanbury was very well married, and that Brown had succeeded to Jones in the Hyderabad shop. Then she hesitated a little before making her next inquiry. I suppose Mr. Corbett never comes into the parsonage now? No, not he. I don't think as how Mr. Ness would have him, but they write letters to each other by times. Old job. You'll re recollect old job, ma'am. He did garden for Mr. Ness, and waited in the parlour when there was company. I did say as one day he heard them speaking about Mr. Corbett, and he's a grand councillor now, as one of them goes about at Aziz time, and speaks in a wig. A barrister, you mean, said Miss Munro. Aye, and he's something more than that, although I can't rightly remember. Eleanor could have told them both. They had the times lent to them on the second day after publication, by one of their friends in the close, and Eleanor, watching till Miss Munro's eyes were otherwise engaged, always turned with trembling hands and a beating heart to the reports of the various courts of law. In them, she found, at first rarely, the name she sought for, for the name she dwelt upon, if ever a letter was a study. Mr. Losh and Mr. Duncombe appeared for the plaintiff. Mr. Smith and Mr. Corbett were the defendant. In a year or two that this name appeared more frequently, and generally took the precedence of the other, whatever it might be, then on special occasions his speeches were reported at full length, as if his words accounted weighty, and by and by she saw that he had been appointed a Queen's Council. And this was all she ever heard or saw about him. His once familiar name never passed her lips, except in hurried whisper to Dixon, when he came to stay with them. Eleanor had no idea why she, when she had parted from Mr. Corbett, how total the separation between them was henceforth word to be, and so much left seemed left unfinished, unexplained. It was so difficult at first to break herself the habit of the constant mental reference to him, and for many a long year she kept thinking that surely some kind fortune would bring them together again, and all this heart-sickness and melancholy estrangement from each other that would both seem only as ugly as dream that had passed away in the morning light. The dean was an old man, but there was a canon who was older still, and whose death had been expected by many, and speculated upon by some, at any time for ten years at least. Canons Holdsworth was too old to show active kindness to any one, and on the good dean life was full of thoughtful and benevolent deeds, but he was taken with the other left. Eleanor looked out on the vacant deanery with tearful eyes, the last thing at night, the first thing in the morning. But it's pretty nearly the same time with church dignitaries with him as kings. The dean is dead. Long live the dean. A clergyman from a distant county was appointed, and all the close was astir to lean and hear every particular connected with him. Luckily, he came in at the tag end of one of the noble families in the peerage. So, at any rate, all his future associates could learn with tolerable certainty that he was forty-two years of age, married, with eight daughters and one son. Deanery, formerly so quiet and sedate a dwelling of one old man, was now to be filled with noise and merriment. Iron wailings were being placed before three windows, evidently to be the nursery. In the summer public city of open windows and doors, the sound of the busy carpenters were perpetually heard over all the clothes, and by and by wagon loads of furnishers and carriage loads of people began to arrive. Neither Miss Munro nor Eleanor felt themselves of sufficient importance or station to call on the newcomers, but they were well acquainted with the proceedings of the family, as if they had been in daily intercourse, that they knew that the eldest Beauchamp was seventeen, and very pretty, only one shoulder was higher than the other, and she was dotingly fond of dancing, and talked a great deal in tete-a-tete, -tete, but not much of her mamma was by, and never opened her lips at all if the dean was in the room, and the next sister was wonderfully clever, and supposed to know all the governess could teach her, and to have private lessons in Greek and mathematics from her father, and so on down to the little boy at the preparatory school, and little baby girl in arms. Moreover, Miss Munro, at any rate, could have stood an examination to the number of servants at the deanery, their division of work, the, and the hours of their meals. Presently, a very beautiful, haughty young-looking lady made her appearance in the clothes and in the dean's pew. She was said to be his niece, the orphan daughter of her brother, General Beauchamp, come to see East Chester to reside for the necessary time before her marriage, and which was to be performed in the cathedral by her uncle, the new dignitary. But as callers of the deanery did not see this beautiful bride-elect, and the Beauchamps had not yet fallen into habits of intimacy with any of their new acquaintances. Very little was known of the circumstances of this one approaching wedding beyond the particulars given above. Eleanor and Miss Munro sat at their drawing-room window, a little shaded by the muslin curtains, watching the busy preparations for the marriage, which was to take place the next day. All morning long, hampers of fruit and flowers, boxes from the railway, and for this time East Chester had got a railway, shop messengers, hired assistants, kept passing backwards and forwards in the busy close. Towards afternoon the bustle subsided, the scaffolding was up, and the materials for the next day's feast was carried out of sight. It was to be concluded that the bride-elect was seen to the packing of her trousseau, 
helped by the merry multitude of cousins, and that the servants were arranging the dinner for the day, or the breakfast for the morrow. So Miss Monroe had settled it, discussing every detail and every probability, as though she was the chief actor, instead of only a distant, uncared-for spectator of the coming event. Eleanor was tired, and now that there was nothing interesting going on, she had fallen back to her sewing, when she was startled by Miss Memo's explanation. Look, look, here are two gentlemen coming along the lime tree walk. It must be the bridegroom and his friend. Out of much sympathy and some curiosity, Eleanor bent forward and saw, just emerging from the shadow of the trees to the full afternoon sunlight, Mr. Corbett and another gentleman, the former charged, warm age, but still with a fine intellectual face, leaning on the arm of the younger taller man and talking eagerly. The other gentleman was doubtless the bridegroom, Eleanor said to himself, and yet her prophetic heart did not believe her words. Even before the bright beauty at the deanery looked out of the great oil windows of the drawing-room, and blushed and smiled, and kissed her hand, a gesture applied to by Mr. Corbett with much empressement, while the other man only took off his hat, almost as if he saw her there for the first time. Eleanor's greedy eyes watched him till he was hidden from the deanery, unheeding Mrs. Munro's eager incoherent sentences, in turn entreating, apologising, comforting and upbraiding. Then she slowly turned to painful eyes to Miss Monroe's face, and moved her lips without a sound being heard, and fainted dead away. In all her life she had never done so before, and when she came round she was not like herself. In all probability the persistence and willfulness like, who was usually so meek, meek and docile, showed her during the next twenty-four hours the consequences of fever. She resolved to be present at the wedding, numbers were going, and she would be unseen, unnoticed in the crowd, but whatever befell, before she go she would, and neither the tears nor the prayers of Miss Monroe could keep her back. She gave her no reason for this determination, indeed. In all probability, she had none to give, so there was no arguing the point. She was inflexible to entreaty, no it as no one, and no one had any authority over her, except, perhaps, distant Miss Ness. Miss Monroe had all sorts of forebodings to the possible scenes that might come to pass, but all went on as quietly through the fullest sympathy pervaded every individual of the great numbers assembled. No one guessed that the muffled, m veiled figure sitting in the shadow behind one of the great pillars was the one who had one hoped to stand at the altar with the same bridegroom, who had now cast tender looks at the beautiful bride, her veil white and fairy-like, Eleanor's black and shrouding as that of any nun. Already Mr. Corbett's name was known throughout the country as that of a great lawyer. People discussed his speeches and character far and wide, and well-informed and legal gossip spoke of him as sur sure to be offered a judgeship in the next vacancy. So he, the grave and middle-aged and somewhat grey, divided the tension with his lovely bride and her pretty train of cousin bridemaids. Miss Munro needed not have feared for Eleanor. She saw and heard all things as in a mist, a dream, as something she had to go through, before she could wake up to reality a brightness in which her youth and the hopes of her youth should be restored, restored, and all those weary years of dreaminess and woe should be revealed as nothing more but the nightmare of a night. She sat motionless enough, still enough, Miss Munro by her, watching her intently as a keeper watches a madman, with the same purpose to prevent any outburst by, even by bodily strength, if such restraint was needed. When this was all over, when the principal personages of the ceremony had filed to the vestry to sign their names, when the swarm of townspeople were going out as swiftly as their individual notions and the restraint of the sac sacred edifice permitted, when the great chords of the wedding march clanged out from the organ and the loud bells pealed overhead, Eleanor laid her hands on Miss Munro. Take me home, she said softly, and Miss Munro led her home as one leads the blind. End of chapter 11. Recording by Anthony Orr. Chapter 12. There are some people who imperceptibly float away from their youth into middle age, and thence pass into declining life with the soft and gentle motion of happy years. There are others who are whirled, in spite of themselves, down dizzy rapids of agony, away from their youth at one great bound, into old age with another sudden shock and thence into the vast calm ocean where there are no shore marks to tell the time. This last, it seemed, was to be Eleanor's lot. Her youth was gone in a single night, fifteen years ago, and now she appeared to become an elderly woman, very still and hopeless in look and movement, but as sweet and gentle in speech and smile she had ever been in her happiest days. All young people, when they came to know her, loved her dearly, though at first they might call her dull and heavy to get on with. As for children and old people, her ready watchful sympathy in their joys as well as their sorrows was an unfailing passage to their hearts. After the first great shock of Mr. Corbett's marriage was over, she seemed to pass into a greater peace than she had known for years. The last faint hope of happiness was gone. It would, perhaps, be more accurate to say, of the bright happiness she had planned for herself in her early youth. 
Unconsciously, she was being weaned from self-seeking in any shape, and her daily life became, if possible, more innocent and pure and holy. One of the canons used to laugh at her for her constant attendance at all the services, and for her devotion to good works, and call her always the Reverend Sister. Miss Munro was a little annoyed at this faint clerical joke. Eleanor smiled quietly. Miss Munro disapproved of Eleanor's grave ways and sober style of dress. You may be as good as you like, my dear, and yet go dressed in some pretty colour, instead of those, all those perpetual blacks and greys, and then there would be no need for me to be perpetually telling people you are only four and thirty, and they don't believe me, though I tell them till I am black in the face, or if you would wear but a decent-shaped bonnet, instead of always wearing one of those pokey shape in fashion when you were seventeen. The old canon died, and someone was to be appointed in his stead. These clerical preference and appointments were the all-important interests of the inhabitants of the close, and discussion and probabilities came up invariably if any two met together, in street or house, or even in the very cathedral itself. At length it was settled, and announced by the higher powers, an energetic, hard-working clergyman from a distant part of the diocese, Livingstone by name, was to have the vacant cannery. Miss Munro said the name was somewhat familiar to her, and by degrees she recollected that the young curate had, who had come to inquire after Eleanor in that dreadful illness she had had at Hamley in the year 1829. Eleanor knew nothing of that visit, no more than Miss Munro did of what had passed between the two before that ancient night. Eleanor just thought it m possible there might be the same Mr. Livingstone, and would rather it not, because she did not feel as if she could bear the frequent thought not initiate intercourse she must needs have. And if such were the case, with one so closely associated with that great time of terror which she was striving to bury out of sight by every effort in her power. Miss Munro, on the contrary, was busy weaving a romance for her pupil. She thought of the passionate interest displayed by the fair young clergyman fifteen years ago, and believed that occasionally men could be constant, and hoped that if Mr. Livingstone was a new canon, it might prove the rara avis which exists but once in a century. He came, and it was the same. He looked a little stouter, a little older, but still had the gait and aspect of a young man. His smooth face was scarcely lined at all with any marks of care. The blue eyes looked so kindly and peaceful, the Miss Munro could scarcely fancy what they were the same, which she had seen fast filling with tears. The bland, calm look of the whole man who needed the in evident devoutness to be raised to into the type of holy innocence, which some of the Romanists called the sacerdotal fate. His entire soul was in his work, and he looked as little likely to step forth in the character of either a hero of romance or a faithful lover could be imagined. Still, Miss Munro was not discouraged. She remembered the warm, passionate feelings she had once seen break through the calm exterior, and she believed that what happened once might occur again. Of course, while all the eyes were directed on the new canon, he had to learn who the possessors of those eyes were, one by one, and it was probably some time before the idea it came into his mind that Miss Wilkins, the lady in black, with the sad pale face, so constant an attendant at service, so regular a visitor at the school, were the same Miss Wilkins as the bright vision of his youth. It was her sweet smile at a painstaking child that betrayed her, as if, indeed, betrayal might be called where there was no wish or effort to conceal anything. Canon Livingstone left the schoolroom almost directly, and, after being an for an hour or so in his house, went out to call on Miss Randall, the person who knew more of her neighbour's affairs than any one in East Chester. The next day, he called on Miss Wilkins herself. She would have been very glad if he had kept on his ignorance. It was so keenly painful in the company of one sight of whom, even at a distance, had brought her such a keen remembrance of her past misery, and when told of his call, as she was sitting at her sewing in the dining room, she had to nerve herself for an interview before going upstairs into the drawing room, where he was being entertained by Miss Munro with warm demonstrations of welcome. A little contraction of the brow, a little compression of the lip, an increased pallor on Eleanor's part, was all that Miss Munro could see in her, though she had put on her glasses with foresight and intention to observe. She turned to the canon. His colour had certainly deepened as he went forward with outstretched hand to meet Eleanor. That was all that was to be seen, but only a slight foundation of the blush. Miss Munro built many castles, and when they filled faded away, one by one, she recognised that they were only baseless visions. She used to put the disappointment of her hopes down to Eleanor's unvaried calmness of demeanour, which might be taken for the coldness of disposition, and to her steady refusal to allow Miss Munro to invite Canon Livingstone to the small teas that they were in the habit of occasionally giving. Yet... He preserved in his calls. About once every fortnight he came, and he would sit an hour or more, looking covertly at his watch, as if Miss Munro shrewdly observed to herself 
yet he did not go away at last because he wished to do so, but because he ought. Sometimes Eleanor was present, sometimes she was away. In this latter case, Miss Munro thought she could detect a certain wistful watching at the door every time a noise was heard outside the room. He always avoided any reference to former days at Hamley, and that, Miss Munro feared, was a bad sign. After this long uniformity of years, without any event closely touching on Eleanor's own individual life, with the one great exception of Mr. Corbett's marriage, something happened which much affected her. Mr. Ness suddenly died of this personage, and Ellen learned it at first from Mr. Brown, a clergyman who was living near Hamley, and who had been sent from the parsonage servants as soon as they discovered it was not sleep but death that made their master so late in rising. Mr. Brown had been appointed executor by his late friend, and wrote to tell Eleanor that after a few legacies were paid, she was to have a life interest in the remainder of the small property which Mr. Ness had left, and that it would be necessary for her, as the residuary legatee, to come to Hamley Parsonage as soon as convenient, to decide upon certain courses of action with regard to furniture, books, etc. Eleanor shrank from this journey, which her love and duty towards her dead friend rendered necessary. She had scarcely left East Chester since she first arrived there, sixteen or seventeen years ago, and she was timorous about the very mode of travelling, and then to go back into Hamley, which she thought she would never to see again. She never spoke much about any feelings of her own, but Miss Munro could always read her silence, and interpret it to, into pretty, just, and forcible words that afternoon when Canning Livingstone called. She liked to talk to Eleanor about him, and suspect that he, he liked to hear. She was almost annoyed by the time by the comfort he would keep giving her. There was no greater danger in travelling by railroad than by coach. A little care about certain things were required, that was all, and the average number of deaths by accidents on railroad was not greater than the average number when people travelled by coach, and if you took into consideration the far greater number of travellers, yes, returning to the deserted scenes of one's youth was very painful. Had Miss Wilkins made any provision for another lady to take her place in the visitor in the school? He believed it was her week. Miss Munro was all out of patience with his entire calmness and reasonableness. Later in the day she became more at peace with him, when... She received a kind note from Miss Forbes. A great friend of Forbes was not was quite sure that Miss Munro's companionship upon it would be a great comfort to both, and that she could be set liberally for a fortnight or so, for it had fallen this admirably with the fact that Jeanie was growing tall, and the doctor had advised sea air for the spring, so a month's holiday would suit them now even better than later on. Was this going straight to Mrs. Forbes, to whom she should scarcely herself like to name it? and in the act of a good, thoughtful man, or of a lover, questioned Miss Munro. But she could not answer her own inquiry, and she had to be very grateful for the deed, without accounting for her motives. A coach met the train at the station about ten miles from Hamley, and Dixon was at the inn where the coach stopped, ready to receive them. The old man was almost in tears at the sight of the game again in a familiar place. He had put on his Sunday clothes to do them honour, and to conceal his agitation he kept up a pretended bustle about their luggage. To the indignation of the importers, who were of a later generation, he would wheel himself to the parsonage, though he broke down from fatigue once or twice on the way, and had to stand and rest, his ladies waiting by him side, and making remarks on the alterations of houses and the places of trees, in order to give him ample time to recruit himself, for there was no one to wait for them, and give them a welcome at the parsonage, which was to be their temporary home. The respectful servants in deep mourning had all prepared, and gave Eleanor a note from Mr. Brown, saying that he purposely refrained from disturbing them that day after their long journey, but would call on them morrow, and tell them of the arrangement he thought of making, or always subject to Miss Wilkins's approval. They were simple enough, certain legal forms to be gone through, any selection from books or furniture to be made, and the rest to be sold by auction as speedily as convenient, as the successor to the living might wish to have repairs and alterations effected in the old parsonage. For some days Eleanor employed herself in business about the house, never going out except to church. Miss Munro, on the contrary, strolled about everywhere, noticing all the alterations in places and people, which were never improvements in her opinion. Eleanor had plenty of callers, her tenants, Mr. and Miss Osbaldistone, among others, but, excepting in work cases, most of them belonged to humble life. She declined to see almost everyone, as she had business enough on her hands. Sixteen years makes a great difference in any set of people. The old acquaintances of her father in her better days were almost all dead or removed, and there were one or two remaining, and these Eleanor received, one or two more, old and infirm, confined to their houses. She planned to call upon them before leaving Hanley. Every evening, when Dixon had done his work at Mr. Old Stone's, he came up to the parsonage, obstinately to help her moving or packing books, but really because those two clung to each other. 
were bound to each other by a bond never to be spoken about. It was understood between them that once Eleanor left, she would go to see the old place, Ford Bank, not to go into the house, though Mr. and Mrs. Old Baldystone had begged her to name her own time for revisiting it when they and her family would be absent, but to see all the gardens and grounds once more, a solemn, miserable visit, which, because of the very misery it involved, appeared to Eleanor to be an imperative duty. Dixon and she talked together as she sat making a catalogue in one evening in the low broad library. The casement windows were opened into the garden, and the May showers had brought out the scents of the new leaf sweet by the brush just below. Beyond the garden hedge, in the grassy meadows, sloped away down to a liver, and the parsonage was so much raised that, sitting in the house, you could see over the boundary hedge. Men with instruments were busy in the window. Eleanor, pausing in her work, asked Dixon what they were doing. "'That's them people for the new railway,' said he. No, "'Not would satisfy the Hamley folk, but to have a railway all to themselves. "'Coach isn't good enough nowadays.' "'He spoke with eternal first personal offence natural to a man "'who had passed all his life among horses "'and considered railway engines of their despicable rival, "'conquering only by stratagem. "'By and by Eleanor passed on to the subject of consideration, "'which she had repeatedly urged upon Dixon, "'and entreated him to come and form one of the household at East Chester. "'He's growing old,' she thought, older even in looks and feelings than in years, and she would make him happy and comfortable in his declining years if he would but come and pass them under her care. The addition which Mr. Ness's bequest made to her income would enable her not only to do this, but to relieve Miss Monroe of her occupation of teaching, which, at the years that she had arrived, was becoming burdensome. When she proposed the removal to Dixon, he shook his head. It's not that I don't thank you, and kindly too, but I'm too old to go chopping and changing. "'But it would be no change to come back to me, Dixon,' said Eleanor. "'Yes, it would. I was born here in Camley, and it's Hamley I would reckon to die. "'On her urging him a little more, it came out he had a strong feeling "'that if he did not watch the spot where the dead man lay buried, the hole would be discovered, "'and this dread of his had often poisoned his pleasure to visit East Chester. "'I don't rightly know how it is, for sometimes I think if it wasn't for you, Missy, "'I should be glad enough to make it all clear before I go. "'And yet, at times I dream, or it comes into my head as I lie awake with the rheumatics, that someone is there, digging, or I hear them cutting down the tree, and when I get up and look out the loft window, you'll mind the window over the stables, and look out into the garden, all covered with the leaves of the jargon pear tree. That was my room when I first came as a stable boy, and though Mr. Old Battistone would fair give me a warmer one, I always tell him I like the old place best, and by the times I get up five or six times a night to make sure there was no one at work under the tree. Eleanor shivered a little. He saw it, and restrained himself in the relief he was receiving from imparting his superstitious fancies. "'You see, Missy, I could never rest at nights if I didn't feel as if I kept the secret in my hand, and held it tight night and day, so I could open my hand any minute and see it was there. No, my own little Missy will let me come down and see her now and again, and I know I can always ask her for what I want, but if it pleases God to lay me by, I shall tell her so, and she'll see me as I want for nothing. But somehow I could never bear leaving Hanley.' You shall come and follow me to my grave when the time comes. Don't talk, please, say Dixon, said she. Nay, it'll be a mercy when I can lay me down and sleep in peace, though I sometimes fear his peace will not come to me even there. He was going out of the room, and was now more of talking to himself than her. They say blood will out, and if it weren't for her part in it, I wish I could just make a clear breast before I die. She did not hear the latter part of this mumbled sentence. She was looking at a letter just brought in requiring an immediate answer. It was from Mr. Brown. Notes from him were as daily as occurrence, but this contained an open letter, the writing of which was strangely familiar to her. It did not need the signature, Ralph Corbett, to tell her who the letter came from. From so many moments she could not read the words. They expressed a simple enough request, and were addressed to the auctioneer who was to dispose of the rather valuable library of the late Mr. Ness, and whose name had been advertised in connection with the sale, in the Anthenium, and other similar papers. To him, Mr. Corbett wrote, saying that he should be unable to be present when the books were sold, but he wished to be allowed to buy, in any price decided upon, a certain rare folio edition of Virgil, bound in parchment and with notes in the Italian. The book was fully described. Though no Latin scholar, Eleanor knew the book well, remembered its look from old times, and it could instantly have laid her hand upon it. The auctioneer had sent the request on to his employer, Mr. Brown. That gentleman applied to Eleanor for her consent. Sure that the fact of the intended sale must be all that Mr. Corbett was aware of, and he could not know to whom the books belonged. She chose out the book, and wrapped and tied it up with her trembling hands. He might be the person to untie the knot. It was strangely familiar to her love, 
after so many years, to be brought into thus much contact with him. She wrote a short note to Mr. Brown, in which she requested him to say, as though from himself, without any mention of her name, that he, as executor, requested Mr. Corbett's acceptance of the Virgil, as a remembrance of his former friend and tutor. Then she rang the bell, and gave the letter and parcel to the servant. Again alone, and Mr. Corbett's open letter on the table, she looked it up and looked at it until the letters dazzled crimson on the white paper. Her life rolled backwards, and she was a girl again. At last she roused herself, but instead of destroying the note, it was long years since all her love letters from him had been returned to the writer. She unlocked her little writing case again, and placed this little letter down carefully at the bottom, among the dead rose leaf which embalmed the note from her father, found after his death under his pillow, and the little golden curl of his sister's, and the half-finished sewing of her mother. The shabby writing case what itself was given to by her father long ago, and had been taken everywhere with her. And, to be sure, the, her changes of place had been few, but if she had gone to Nova Zambella, that sight of that little box on awakening from her first sleep would have given her a sense of home. She locked the case up, and felt all the richer that morning. A day or two afterwards she left Hamley. Before she went she had compelled herself to go round the gardens and grounds of Ford Bank. She had made Mr. Old Mrs. Oldbodystone understand that it would be painful for her to re-enter the house, but Mr. Oldbodystone accompanied her in her walk. You should see how literally we have obeyed the clause in the lease which tied us out from any alterations, he said he, smiling. We are living in a tangled thicket of wood. I must confess that I should have liked to cut down a great deal, but we do not do the, even the requisite things without making the proper applications for leave to Mr. Johnson. In fact, your old friend Dixon is jealous of every piece stake the gardener cuts. I never met with so faithful a fellow, a good enough servant too, in his way, but somewhat too old-fashioned for my wife and daughters, who complain of him being surly now and then. You are not thinking of parting with him, said Eleanor, jealous for Dixon. Oh no, he and I are capital friends, and I believe Mr. Osbaldestone himself, Mrs. Osbaldestone herself would never consent to him leaving us. But some ladies, you know, like a little more subvergency in their manner that our friend Dixon can boast. Eleanor made no reply. They're entering the painted flower garden, hiding the ghastly memory. She could not speak. She felt as if, with all her striving, she could not move, just as one does in a nightmare. But she was past the place even as this terror came to it to seem. And when she came to herself, Mr. Osbaldestone was still blandly talking and saying, It is now a sign for reward of our obedience to your wishes, Miss Wilkins. For if their projected railways passes through the Ashfield yonder, we should have been perpetually troubled with the sight of the train. Indeed, the sound will have been much more distinct than it would be now coming through the interlacing branches. Then, you will not go in, Miss Wilkins? Mr. Osbaldestone decided to say. Mrs. Osbaldestone decided me to say how happy. Ah, I can understand such feelings. Certainly, certainly. It is much the shortest way to the town, that we old boys always go through the stable yard. For young people, it is perhaps not quite so desirable. Ha, Dixon, he continued, on the watch from Miss Eleanor we so often hear of. This old man, he continued to Eleanor, is never satisfied with the seat of our young ladies, always comparing the ray of their lighting to the way of a certain missy. I cannot help it, sir. They have quite a different style of hand, and sit all lumpish-like. Now, Miss Eleanor there. Hush, Dixon, she said. Suddenly aware of why the old servant was not properly with his mistress, I suppose I may, may be allowed to ask for Dixon's company for an hour or so? We have something to do together before we leave. The consent given, the two walked away, as by previous appointment, to Hamley Churchyard, where he pointed out the exact spot where he wished to be buried. Trampling over the long, rank grass, but avoiding passing directly over any of the thickly strewn graves, he made straight for one spot, a little space of unoccupied grave close to by where Molly, the pretty scullery maid, lay. Sacred to the memory of Mary Greaves, Born 1797. Dined 1818. We part to meet again. I put the stone up over here with my first savings, he said, looking at it, and then pulling out his knife, he began to clean the letters. I said then I would lie by her, and it'll be a comfort to think that you'll see me laid here. I trust no one will be so crabbed as to take a fancy to hear this spot of ground. Eleanor grasped eagerly at the only pleasure which her money enabled her to give to the old man, and promised him that she would take care and buy the particular piece of ground. This was evidently a gratification Dixon had frequently yearned after. He kept saying, I'm greatly obliged to ye, Miss Eleanor. I may say I'm truly obliged. And when he saw them off by the coach the next day, his last words were, I cannot justify how greatly I'm obliged to you for the matter in the churchyard. It was a much more easy affair to give Miss Munro some additional comforts, as she was as cheery as ever, 
still working at her languages in any spare time, but confessing that she was tired of most of the perpetual teaching in which her life had been spent during the last thirty years. Eleanor was now enabled to set her at liberty from this, and she accepted the kindness from her former people with as much simple gratitude as that which a mother received a favour from a child. If Eleanor were but married to Canon Livingstone, I should be happier than I had ever been since my father died, she used to say in the solitude of her bedchamber, for talking aloud had become her wont in the early years of her isolated life as a governess, and yet, she went on, I don't know what I should do without her. It is lucky for me that such things are not in my hands, for a pretty mess I should make of them, one way or another. Dear, how old Miss Cadogan used to hate that word, mess, and correct her granddaughters for using it before my face, when I, when I knew I had said it myself only the moment before. Well, those days are gold now. God be thanked. In spite of being glad that things were not in her hands, Miss Munro tried to take her affairs into her charge by doing all she could persuade Eleanor to allow her to invite the canon to their little sociable teas. The most provoking part was, as she could be sure, he would have come if he had been asked, but she could never get leave to do so. Of course no man could go on forever and ever without encouragement as she confided to herself in a plaintive tone of voice, and by and by many people were led to suppose that, b that the bachelor canon was even paying attention to Miss Forbes, the eldest daughter of the family to which the delicate Jean Jeanie belonged. It was, perhaps, with the Forbeses is that both Miss Munro and Eleanor were the most intimate of all the families in East Chester. Miss Forbes was a widow lady of good means, and with a large family of pretty, delicate daughters. She herself belonged to one of the great houses in Shire, but had married into Scotland, so, after her husband's death, it was the most natural thing in the world that she should settle in East Chester, and after one of her daughters had become the first Miss Munro's pupil, and afterwards her friend. Miss Forbes had always been strongly attached by Eleanor, and it was not long before she could conquer the timid reserve by Miss Mitch Wilkins was hedged around. It was Miss Munro, who was herself incapable of jealousy, who preserved in praising them one to another, and bringing them together and now Eleanor was as intimate as familiar in Mrs. Forbes' household as she could ever be with any family not her own. Mrs. Forbes was considered to be a little fanciful as to illness, but it was no wonder, remembering how many sisters she had lost by consumption. Miss Munro had often grumbled as the way her that in which her pupils were made irregular by very trifling causes, but no one so alarmed as she, when, in the autumn succeeding Mr. Ness's death, Mrs. Forbes remarked on Eleanor's increased delicacy of appearance, and shortness of breathing. From that time forward she worried Eleanor, if anyone so sweet and patient could ever have been worried, with respirators and precautions. Eleanor had submitted to all her friends' wishes and cares, sooner than make her anxious, and remained a prisoner in the house through the whole of November. Then Mrs. Munro's anxiety took another turn. Eleanor's appetites and spirits failed her, not at all an unnatural occurrence of so many weeks' confinement to the house. A plan was started, quite suddenly, one morning in December, they met with approval from everyone but Eleanor, who was, however, by this time too languid to make much resistance. Mrs. Forbes and her daughters were going to Rome for three or four weeks, as to avoid the trying east wings of spring, and why should Miss Wilkins not go with them? They urged it, and Miss Munro urged it, although a little private sinking of her heart at the idea of a long separation from someone who was almost like a child to her. Eleanor was, as it were, lifted off her feet and borne away by the unanimous opinion of others, the doctor included, who decided that such a step was highly desirable, if not absolutely necessary. She knew that she only had a life interest in both her father's property and that bequeathed to her by Mr. Ness. Hitherto she had not felt much trouble by this, and she supposed that there was a natural course of events that she should survive Miss Munro and Dixon, both of whom she looked upon as dependent upon her. All she had to bequeath was the two in small savings, which would not nearly suffice for both purposes especially considering that Miss Munro had given up her teaching, and that both she and Dixon were passing into years. Before Eleanor had left England, she made every arrangement for the contingency of her death abroad that Mr. Johnson could suggest. She had written and sent a long letter to Dixon, and a shorter one that was left in charge of Canon Livingstone. She dared not hint at the possibility of her dying to Miss Munro, to be sent to the old man. As they drove out of the King's Cross station, they passed a gentleman's carriage entering. Eleanor saw a bright, handsome lady, a nurse and baby inside, and the gentleman sitting by them whose face she could not forget. It was Mr. Corbett taking his wife and child to the railway, and they were going on a Christmas visit to the East Chester Deanery. He had been leaning back, but not noticing the passers-by, not attending to the under-inmates of the carriage, probably absorbed in the consideration of some law case. Such were the casual glimpses Eleanor had of one whose life she had once thought herself bound up. 
Who so proud as Miss Munro when her foreign letter came? Her correspondent was not particularly graphic in her descriptions, nor were there any adventures to be described, nor was the habit of the mind of Eleanor as to make her clear and definite in her own impressions of what her saw, and her natural reserve kept her from communicating to them to Miss Munro. But that lady would have been pleased to read aloud about these letters to the assembled dean and canons, who would not have been surprised if they had invited her to the chapel house for that purpose. To a circle of untravelled ladies, ignorant of Murray, but laudably desirous of information, all Eleanor's historical reminiscences and f rather former details were really interesting. There were no railway in, the, in those days between Lyons and Marseilles, so their progress was st slow, and the passage of letters to and fro, for when they had arrived in Rome, long and uncertain. But all seemed to going on well. Eleanor spoke of herself and was in better health, and Canon Livingstone, between whom and Miss Munro great in intimacy had sprung up since Eleanor had gone away, and Miss Munro could ask him to tea, confirmed this report of Miss Wilkins's health from a letter which he had received, although the Livingstone and Forbeses were distinctly related, after the manner in Scotland. Could it have been that he offered to Euphemia, after all, that her mother had answered, or possibly there was a letter from Elfie herself enclosed? It was a pity for Miss Munro's peace of mind that she did not ask him straight away. She would ha then have learnt what Canon Livingstone had no thought of concealing, that Mrs. Forbes had written solely to give him some fully directions about certain choices had she time to think about the hurry of starting. As it was, and when, a little later on, she had heard him speak of the possibility of his going himself to Rome, as soon as his term of resistance was over, in time for the carnival, he she gave up her fond project in despair, and felt very much like a child whose house of bricks had been knocked down by the unlucky waft of some passing petticoat. Meanwhile, the entire change of scene brought on the exquisite refreshment of the entire change of thought. Eleanor had not been able to so completely forget her past life for many years. It was like a renewing of her youth, cut so suddenly short by the shears of fate. Ever since that night, she had had to rouse herself on awakening in the morning to a full comprehension of the great cause, for she had so much fear and heavy grief. Now, when she wakened in her little room, fourth piano, number third bobina, she saw the strange, pretty things around here, and her mind went off into pleasant wonder and conjecture, happy recollections of the day before, and pleasant anticipations of the day to come. Latent in Eleanor was her father's artistic temperament. Everything new and strange was from a picture, and a delight, the merest group in the street, a Roman facino with his cloak draped around his shoulder, a girl going to market or carrying her pitcher back from the fountain. Everything and every person that presented itself or himself to her, her senses gave them a delicious shock, as if it was something strangely familiar from Pinelli, but unseen by immortal eyes before him. She forgot her despondency, her real health disappeared as if by magic, and the Mrs. Forbes, who had taken the pensive, drooping invalid as but a companion of kindness out of heart, found themselves amply rewarded by the sight of her amended health, and her keen enjoyment of everything, the half-quaint, half-naive expressions of her pleasure. So much came around. Lent was late that year. The great nosegays of violets and camillas were for sale at the corner of the condotti, and the revellers had no difficulty in procuring much rarer flowers from the bells of the Corsa. The embassies had their balconies. The attaches of the Russian embassy threw their light and lovely presence at every pretty girl, or suspicion of a pretty girl, who passed slowly in her carriage, covered over her white domino, and holding her wire mask as protection to her face from the showers of lime confetti, who otherwise would have been enough to blind her. Mrs. Forbes had her own hired balcony, as became a wealthy and respectable in Englishwoman. The girl had a great full basket of bouquets in which to pelt their friends in the crowd below. A store of moccoletti lay piled over the table, be table behind, for it was the last day of the carnival, and as soon as dusk came on the tapers were to be lighted, as to be as quickly extinguished by every means in one's power. The crowd below was at its wildest pitch. The rolls of riffraff to the city, the slow-driving carriages, showers of flowers, most of them faded by this time, everyone shouting and struggling in that wild pitch of excitement which may so soon turn into fury. The Forbes's girls had given up a place at the window to their mother and Eleanor, who were gazing, half amused, half terrified, at this mad, party-coloured movement below, where a familiar face looked up, smiling in recognition, and how should I get to you, was asked in English, by the well-known voice of Canon Livingstone. They saw him disappear under the balcony on which they were standing, but it was some time before they made his, his appearance in their room. And when he did, he was almost overjoyed with greeting, so glad were they to see an East Chester face. When, when did you come? Where are you? What a pity you did not come sooner. It is so long since we have heard anything. Do tell us everything. 
it's three weeks since we have any letters those tiresome boats have been irregular because of the weather how was everybody miss munro in particular eleanor asked he quietly smiling replied to their questions by slow degrees he had only arrived the night before and been hunting for them all day but no one can give any distinct intelligence as to their whereabouts and all the noise and confusion of the place especially as they had only their english servant with them and the canon was not strong in his italian he was not sorry he had missed all but the last day of this carnival for he was half blinded and wholly deafened as it was he was at the angleterre and as he had left east chester about a week ago he had all f- letters for all of them but he had not dared to bring them through the crowd for fear of having his pocket picked miss munro was very well but very uneasy at not having heard from eleanor in so long the irregularity of the boats must be telling both ways for their english friends were fur- full of wonder at not hearing from rome and then followed some well-deserved views of the roman post and some suspicion of the carelessness in which italian servants posted english letters all these answers were satisfactory enough yet mrs forbes sought to show a latent uneasiness in canon livingstone's manner and fancied once or twice that he hesitated to replying eleanor's questions but there was no being quite sure in the increasing darkness which prevented counter nuances from being seen nor in the constant interruptions and screams which were going on in the small crowded room as wafting handkerchiefs puffs of wind or veritable extinguishers fastened to long sticks and coming from nobody knew where to put out taper after taper as fast as they were lighted you will come home with us said mrs forbes i can only offer you cold meat with tea our cook is gone this being a universal festa but we cannot part with an old friend for any scruples as to the mis- commissariat thank you i should have invited myself if you had not been good enough to ask me when they had all arrived at their apartment in the babino canon livingstone had gone round to fetch the letters with which he was entrusted mrs forbes was confirmed in her suspicion that he had indeed something particular and not very pleasant to say to eleanor by the rather grave and absent manner in which he returned he awaited her return from her taking off of door things he broke off indeed in his conversation with miss forbes to go and meet eleanor and lead her to the most distant window before he delivered her letters from what you said in the balcony younger i fear you not received your home letters regularly no she said startling and trembling she hardly knew why no more no more had miss munro heard from you nor i believe had someone else who expected to hear your man of business i forget his name my man of business something has gone wrong mr livingstone tell me i want to know i have been expecting it only tell me she sat down suddenly as white as ash did dear miss wilkins i am afraid it is painful enough but you are fancying it worse than it is all your friends are quite well but an old servant well seeing his hesitation and leaning forward and gripping at his arm is taken up on a chance of manslaughter or murder oh mrs forbes come here for eleanor had fainted falling towards on the arm he held when she came round she was lying half undressed on her bed they were giving her tea and spoonfuls i must get up she moaned i must go home you must lie still said miss forbes friendly you don't know i must go home she repeated and she tried to sit up but fell back helpless then she did not speak but lay there and thought will you bring me some meat she whispered and some wine they brought her meat and wine she ate though she was choking now please bring ma- me my letters and leave me alone and after that i should like to speak to canon livingstone <laughs> don't let him go please i won't be long half an hour i think only let me be alone there was a hurried feverish sharpness in her tone that made mrs forbes very anxious but she judged it best to comply with her request the letters were brought the lights were arranged so she could read them lying on her bed and they left her then she got up and stood on her feet dizzy enough her arms clasped at the top of her head her eyes dilating and staring as if looking at some great horror but a few minutes she sat down suddenly and began to read letters were evidently missing some had been sent by an opportunity that had been delayed on journey and had not arrived in rome others had been dispatched by the post but the severe weather the unusual snow had in those days before the railway was made between lyons and marseilles put a stop to many a traveller's plans and had rendered the transmission of the mail extremely uncertain so much of that intelligence which munro and evidently considered as to be known to eleanor was entirely a matter of conjecture and could only be guessed at from what was told in these letters one was from mr johnson one from mr brown one from miss munro and of course the last mention was the first read she spoke of the shock of discovery of mr dunster's body found in the cutting of the new line of the railway to mr from hamley to the nearest railway station the body so hastily buried long ago in its clothes by now it was recognised a recognition confirmed by one or two of the personal indestructible things such as his watch and seal with his initials of the shock to everyone the old baldy stones in particular on the further discovery of a flea or horse lancet 
having the name of Abraham Dixon engraved on the handle. How Dixon had gone to Mr. Osbaldiston's business to a horse fair in some island some weeks before this, and he had his leg broken by a kick from an unruly mare, so he was barely able to move when the officers of justice went to apprehend him in Charlie. At this point, Eleanor cried out loud and chill, Oh, Dixon, Dixon! And I was away enjoying myself. They heard her cry and came to the drawer, but it was bolted inside. Please, go away, she said. Please go. I will be very quiet, only please go. She could not bear just then to read any more of Miss Munro's letter. She tore open Mr. Johnson's. The date was from a fortnight earlier than Miss Munro's. He had also expressed his wonder in not hearing it in her reply to her letter at July 9th, but he added that he thought her trustees had judged rightly in the handsome sum the railway company had offered up for the land when their surveyor decided on the alteration of the line. Mr. Old Baldestone, and see. She could not read any more. It was fate pursuing her. Then she took the letter up again and tried to read. But all that reached her understanding was the fact that Mr. Johnson had sent his present letter to Miss Munro, thinking that she might know some private opportunity safer than the post. Mr. Brown's was just such a letter as he occasionally sent her from time to time. A correspondence aroused out of their mutual regard for their dead friend, Mr. Ness. It, too, had been sent to Miss Munro to direct. Eleanor was on the point of putting it aside entirely when the name of Corbett caught her eye. You will be interested to hear that the old pupil of her departed friend, who was so ob uh, anxious to obtain the folio of Virgil with the its Italian notes, is appointed the new judge in room of Mr. Justice Jenkin. At least I concede that Mr. Ralph Corbett, Q.C., is the same Virgil fancier. Yes, said Eleanor bitterly. He judged well. He would never have done. Those are the first works of anything like reproach he has ever formed in her own mind during all these years. She thought for a few moments of the old times. It seemed to steady her brain to think of them. Then she took up and finished Miss Munro's letter. That excellent friend had done all which, which she thought Eleanor would have wished without delay. She had written to Mr. Johnson and charged him to do everything he could to defend Dixon and to spare no expense. She was thinking of going to the prison in the country town to see the old man herself, but Eleanor could perceive all those endeavours and purposes of Miss Munro's were based on love for her own people and a desire to set her mind at ease as far as she could rather than from any ideas that Dixon himself could be innocent. Eleanor put down the letters and went to the door, then turned back, then locked them up in her writing case with trembling hands, and after that she entered the drawing room, looking like her to a ghost and a living woman. Can I speak to you alone for, for a minute alone? Her tuneless, still voice that made the more into a command. Canon Livingstone arose and followed her into the little dining room. Will you tell me all you know, and all you have heard about my... you know what? Then Miss Munro was my informant. At least, at first. It was in the Times the day before I left. Miss Munro said it could only have been a moment of anger if the old servant was really guilty, that he was as steady and good a man as she ever knew, and she seemed to have a strong feeling against Mr. Dunster, as always giving your father much unnecessary trouble. In fact, she hints that his disappearance at the time was supposed to be the cause of a considerable loss of property to Mr. Wilkins. No, said Eleanor, eagerly feeling that some ju justice ought to be done to the dead man, and that she stopped short, fearful of saying that anything that should be betray her full knowledge. I mean this, she went on. Mr. Dunster was a very disagreeable old man personally, and Papa, we none of us liked him, but he was quite honest, please remember that. The canon bowed and said a few equising words. He waited for her to speak again. Miss Munro is saying that she's going to see Dixon in. Oh, Miss Livingstone, I can't bear it. He let her alone, looked at her pitifully, as she twisted and wrung her hands together in her endeavour to regain the quiet manner she had striven throughout the interview. She looked up at him with a poor attempt at an apologetic smile. It is so terrible to think of that good man in prison. You do not believe him guilty, said Canon Livingstone, in some surprise. I am afraid, from all I heard and read, but there is little doubt that he did kill the man. I trust in some moment of irritation, and with no premeditated malice. Eleanor shook his head. How soon can I get back to England, said she. I must start at once. Miss Forbes sent out while you were lying down. I am afraid there is no boat to Marseilles till Thursday, the day after tomorrow. But I must go sooner, said Eleanor, starting up. I must go. Please help me. He may be tried before I can get there. Alas, I feel that will be the case, whatever haste you make. The trial was to come on the Hellingford as is, and that town stands first on the Midland Circuit list. Today is the 27th of February, and the Assizes begin on the 7th of March. I'll start tomorrow morning early for Siva. There may be a boat there and there they did not know of here. At any rate, I shall be on my way. If he dies, I must die too. Oh, I don't know what I am saying. I will be so utterly crushed down. It will be such a kindness if you would go away and let no one come to me. I know Mrs. Forbes is so good. She will forgive me. I will say goodbye to you all tomorrow morning before I go, but I must think now. For one moment he stood looking at her, if he longed to comfort her by more words. He thought better of it, however, and silently left the room.
For a long time Eleanor sat still, now and then taking up Miss Monroe's letter, and rereading the few terrible details. Then she bethought that her possibly the canon might have brought her a copy of the Times, containing the examination of Dixon before the magistrates, and she opened the door and called to a passing servant to make the inquiry. She was quite right in her conjecture. Dr. Livingstone had the paper in his pocket during his interview with her, but he thought the evidence so conclusive that the perusal of it would be only adding to her extreme distress by accelerating the conviction of Dixon's guilt, which he believed she must arrive at sooner or later. He had begun reading the report over with much with Miss Forbes and her daughters, after his return from Eleanor's room, and they were all participating in his opinion upon it, when her request for the Times was brought. They had reluctantly agreed, saying there did not appear to be a shadow of doubt in the fact of Dixon having killed Mr. Dunster, only hoping there might be through some extenuating circumstances, which Eleanor had probably recollected, and which she was now derisious of pursuing on the approaching trial. End of chapter 12. Recording by Anthony Orr. Chapter 13. Eleanor, having read the report of Dixon's examination in the newspaper, bathed her eyes and forehead in cold water, and tried to still her poor heart's beating, that she might be clear and collected enough to weigh the evidence. Every line of it was condemnatory. One or two witnesses spoke of Dixon's unconcealed dislike of Dunster, a dislike which Eleanor knew had been entertained by the old servant out of a species of loyalty to his master, as well as from personal distaste. The flea was proved beyond all doubt to be Dixon's, and a man, who had been stable boy in Mr. Wilkins's service, swore that on the day that Mr. Dunster was missed, when the whole town was wondering what had become of him, a certain colt of Mr. Wilkins had needed bleeding, and that he had been sent by Dixon to the farriers for a horse lancet, an errand which he had remarked upon at the time, as he knew that Dixon had a flea of his own. Mr. Osbaldystone was examined. He kept interrupting himself perpetually to express his surprise at the fact of so steady and well-conducted a man as Dixon being guilty of so heinous a crime, and was willing to testify to the excellent character which he had borne during the many years he had been in Mr. Alderborn's service. But he appeared to be quite convinced by the evidence of previously given by the prisoner's guilt in the matter, and strengthened the case against him materially by stating a circumstance of the old man's dogged willingness to have the slightest un interference with the cultivation of the with that particular piece of ground. Here Eleanor shuddered. Before her, in that Roman bedchamber, rose that fatal oblong she knew by heart, a little green moss or lichen, and thinly growing blades of grass scarcely con covering the caked and dis undisturbed soil under the old tree. Oh, that she had been in England when the surveyors of the railway between Ashcombe and Hamley had altered their line. She would have entreated, implored, compelled her trustees not to have sold that piece of ground for any sum of money whatever. She would have bribed the surveyors, done what sh done she knew not what, but now it was too late. She would not let her mind wander off to what might have been. She would force herself to attend the newspaper columns. There was little more. The prisoner had been asked if he could say anything to clear himself, and properly cautioned him not to say anything to incriminate himself. The poor man's evidence was described, and his evident emotion. The prisoner was observed to clutch at the rail before him to steady himself, and his colour changed so much at this part of the evidence that one of the turnkeys offered him a glass of water, which he declined. He is a man of strongly built frame, with a rather morose and sullen cast of countenance. "'My poor, poor Dixon,' said Eleanor, laying down the paper for an instant. She was near crying only she had revolved to shed no tears until she had finished all, and could judge of the chances. There were but a few lines more. At one time, the prisoner seemed to be desirous of alleging something in his defence, but he changed his mind, if such had been the case, and in reply to Mr. Gordon, the magistrate, he only said, You made a pretty strong case against me, gentlemen, and it seemed to satisfy you, so I think I'll not disturb your minds by saying anything more. Accordingly, Dixon now stands committed trial for murder at the next Hellingford Assizes, which commenced on March the 7th, before Baron Rushton and Mr. Justice Corbett. Mr. Justice Corbett! The rewards ran through Eleanor, as though she had been stabbed with a knife, and an irrepensible movement she stood up rigid. The young man, her lover in her youth, the old servant in those days were perpetually about her. The two had so often met in familiar, if not friendly, relations, now to face each other as judged and accused. She could not tell how much Mr. Corbett had conjectured from the partial revelation she had made to him of the impending shame that hung over her and hers. A day or two ago, she could remember the exact words she had used in that memorable interview, but now, strive as she would, she could only recall facts, not words. After all, after Mr. Judges Corbett might not be wroth, there is one chance in a hundred against the identity of the two. While she was weighing probabilities in her sick, dizzy mind, she heard soft steps outside her bolted door, 
and low voices whispering. It was the bedtime of happy people with hearts at ease. Some of the footsteps passed lightly on, but there was a gentle rap at Eleanor's door. She pressed her two hot hands hard against her temples for an instant before she went to open the door. There stood Mrs. Forbes in her handsome evening dress, holding a lighted lamp in her hand. "'May I come in, my dear?' she asked. Eleanor's stiff, dry lips refused to utter the words of assent, which indeed did not come readily from her heart. "'I am so grieved at this sad news from which the canon brings. I can well understand what a shock it must be to you. We have just been saying it must be as bad for you as it would be to us if our old Donald should have turned out to be a hidden murderer all these years that he lived with us. I really could have soon suspected Donald as that white-haired, respectable old man who used to come and see you at Old Chester. Eleanor felt that she must say something. "'It is a terrible shock, poor old man, and no friend near him, even Mr. Osbaldistone giving evidence against him. Oh, dear, dear, why did I ever come to Rome? Now, my dear, you must not let yourself take an exaggerated view of the case. Sad and shocking it is to have been so deceived, it is what happens to many of us, though not to so terrible a degree. And as you're coming to Rome to having anything to do with it, Mrs. Forbes almost smiled at the idea, so anxious was she to banish the idea of self-reproach from Eleanor's sensitive mind. But Eleanor interrupted her abruptly. Mrs. Forbes, did he? Can Callan Livingstone tell you that I must leave tomorrow? I must go to England as fast as possible to do what I can for Dixon. Yes, he already told us you were thinking of it, and it is partly me to force myself it upon you tonight. I think, my love, that you are mistaken in feeling as if you are called upon to do more than what the canon tells Miss Monroe has already done in your name. Engage the best legal advice, and spared no expense to give the suspected man every chance. What more could you do if you were on the spot? And it is very possible that the trial may come on before you get home. Then what could you do? He would either have been acquitted or condemned. If the former, he would fight public symphonies all in his favour, as it always is for the unjustly accused. And if he turns out guilty, my dear Eleanor, it would be far better for you to have not all the softening which distance can give to such a dreadful termination to the life of a poor man whom you have so respected for so long. But Eleanor spoke again with a kind of irritated determination, very foreign to her usually soft docility. Please let me go and judge this for myself this once. I am not ungrateful. God knows I don't want to vex one who has been so kind to me as you have been, dear Miss Forbes. But I must go, and every word you say to dissuade me only makes me more convinced. I am going to Sativa tomorrow. I shall be very much on that way. I cannot rest here. Mrs. Forbes looked at her in grave silence. Eleanor could not bear the conscience of that fixed gaze. Yet it is fixity only arose from Mrs. Forbes' perplexity as how best to assist Eleanor, whether to restrain her by further advice, of which the f first dose had proved so useless, or to speed her departure. Eleanor broke on her meditations. You have always been so kind and good to me. Go on being so. Please do. Leave me alone now, dear Miss Forbes, for I cannot bear talking about it, and help me to go tomorrow as you do not know how I will pray God to bless you. Such an appeal was irresistible. Miss Forbes kissed her very tenderly, and went to rejoin her daughters, who were clustered outside there in their mother's bedroom, awaiting her coming. Well, Mamma, how is she? What does she say? She is in a very excited state, poor thing, and has got a strong impression that it is her duty to go back to England, and do all she can for this wretched old man, and I am afraid we must not oppose her. I am afraid that she really must go on Thursday. Although Miss Forbes secured the services of a travelling maid, Dr. Livingstone in insisted of accompanying Eleanor to England, and it would have required more energy than she possessed at this time to combat the resolution with both words and manners expressed as determined. She would much rather have travelled alone with her maid. She did not feel the need of the services he offered, but she was utterly listless and broken down, and all her interest was centred in the thought of Dixon and his approaching trial, and perplexity as the mode in which she must do her duty. They embarked late at night in the tardy Santa Lucia, and Eleanor immediately went to her berth. She was not seasick, but it might possibly have lessened her mental sufferings, which all night long tormented her. High perched in another berth, she did not like disturbing the other occupants of the cabin till daylight appeared. Then she descended and dressed, and went on the deck. The vessel was just passing the rocky coast of Elba, and the sky was flushed with rosy light, that made the shadows of the island of the most exquisite purple. The sea still heaved with yesterday's storm, but the motion only added the beauty of the sparkles and white form that dimpled and curled on the blue waters. The air was delicious, and after the closeness of the cabin, Eleanor was only wondered that more people were not on deck to enjoy it. One or two stragglers came up, time after time, and began pacing the deck. Dr. Livingstone came up before very long, but he seemed to have made a rule of not intruding himself on Eleanor, accepting what he could be of some use. After a few words of commonplace morning greeting, he too began to walk backwards and forwards, while Eleanor sat quietly watching Lovely Island receding fast from review a beautiful reason never to be seen again by her mortal eyes.
Suddenly there was a shock and sound all over the vessel. Her progress was stopped, and a rocking vibration was felt everywhere. The quarter-deck was filled with blasts of steam, which obscured everything. Sick people came rushing up of their berths in strange undeath. The steerage passenger, a motley and picturesque set of people, many varieties of gay costume, took refuge on the quarter-deck, speaking loudly in all varieties of French and Italian patois. Eleanor stood up silent, wondering dismay. Was the Santa Lucia going down on the creek deep, and Dixon unaided in his peril? Dr. Livingstone was by her side in a moment. She could scarcely see him for the vapour, nor hear him for the roar of the escaping scheme. Do not be unnecessarily frightened, he repeated it a little louder. Some accident has occurred to the engines. I will go and make instant inquiry, and come back to you as soon as I can. Trust to me. He came back to where she sat trembling. A part of the engine is broken, through the carelessness of those Neapolitan engineers. They say we must make for the nearest port, return to Civita, in fact. But Elba is not many miles away, said Eleanor, and if the steam were bore away, you could see it still. And if we were landed there, we might stay on the island for many days. No steamer touches there, but if we return to Civita, we'll we shall be there in time for the Sunday boat. Oh, dear, dear. Today is the second. Sunday will be the fourth. The assizes begin on the seventh. How miserably unfortunate. Yes, he said, it is. And those things always appear so doubly unfortunate when they hinder our serving others. But it does not follow that the, because the assizes begin on Hellingford and the seventh, Dixon's trial will come so soon. We may still get to Marseilles on Monday evening, and by our diligence to Lyons it will, I fear. It must be Thursday at the earliest, before we reach Ferris. Thursday the 8th. And I suppose you know some expulsatory evidence that has to be hunted up? He added this unwillingly, for he saw that Eleanor was jealous of the secret she had, she had hitherto maintained for her reasons to her believing Dixon innocent. But he could not help thinking that she, a gentle timid woman, unaccustomed to action or business, would require some of the assistance to which he had been so thankful to give her, especially at this untoward accident would increase the press of time in which what was to be done would have to be done. But no. Eleanor scarcely replied to his half inquiry as her reasons for hastening to England. She yielded to all his directions, agreed to his plans, but gave him none of her confidence, and had to submit this exclusion from his sympathy to the exact causes of her anxiety. Once more in the dreary salsa, with the gaudy painted ceiling, the bare dirty floor, the innumerable rattling doors and windows, Eleanor was submissive and patient in her demeanour, because so sick and despairing at heart. Her maid was ten times as demonstrative and as annoyance and disgust. She who had no particular reason for wanting to reach England, but who thought it became her dignity to make it seem as though she had. At length the weary time was over, and again they sailed past Elba, and arrived at Marseilles. Now Eleanor could begin to feel how much assistant it was to have Dr. Livingstone for a courier, as he had several times called himself. End of chapter 13 Recording by Anthony Orr Chapter 14 Where now, said the canon, as they approached the London Bridge station. To the Great Western, said she. Hellingford is on that line, I see. But please, now we must part. That I may not go with you to Hellingford? At any rate, you will allow me to go with you to the railway station and do my last office as courier in getting you your ticket and placing you in the carriage? So they went together to the station and learnt that no train was leaving for Hellingford for two hours. There was nothing for it but to go to the hotel close by and pass away the time as best they could. Eleanor called for her maid's accounts and dismissed her. Some refreshment that the canon had ordered was eaten, and the table cleared. He began walking up and down the room, his arms folded, his eyes cast down. Every now and then he looked at the clock on the mantelpiece. When that showed that it only wanted a quarter of an hour to the time appointed for the train to start, he came up to Eleanor, who sat, leaning her head upon her hand, her hand resting on the table. Miss Wilkins, he began, and there was something peculiar in his tone which startled Eleanor. I am sure you will not scruple to apply to me, if in any possible way I can help you in this sad trouble of yours. No, indeed, I won't, said Eleanor gratefully, and putting out her hand as a token. He took it and held it, 
she went on a little more hastily than before. You know you were so good as to say you would go at once and see Miss Monroe, and tell her all you know, and that I will write to her as soon as I can. May I not ask for one line? he continued, still holding her hand. Certainly, so kind a friend as you shall hear all I can tell, that is, all I am at liberty to tell. A friend? Yes, I am a friend, and I will not urge any other claim just now. Perhaps... Eleanor could not affect to misunderstand him. His manner implied even more than his words. No, she said eagerly. We are friends, that is it. I think we shall always be friends, though I will tell you now something this much. It is a sad secret. God help me. I am as guilty as poor Dixon, if indeed he is guilty. But he is innocent, indeed he is. If he is no more guilty than you, I am sure he is. Let me be more than your friend, Eleanor. Let me know all and help you all that I can, with the right of an affianced husband. No, no, said she, frightened both at what she had revealed and his eager, warm, imploring manner. That can never be. You do not know the disgrace that may be hanging over me. If that is all, said he, I'll take my risk. If that is all, if you only fear that I may shrink from sharing any peril you may be exposed to. It is not peril, it is shame and obloquy, she murmured. Well, shame and obloquy. Perhaps if I knew all I could shield you from it. Don't, pray, speak any more about it now. If you do, I must say no. She did not perceive the implied encouragement in these words, but he did, and they sufficed to make him patient. The time was up, and he could only render her his last services as courier, and none other but the necessary words at starting passed between them. But he went away from the station with a cheerful heart, while she, sitting alone and quiet, and at last approaching near to the place where so much was to be decided, felt sadder and sadder, heavier and heavier. All the intelligence she had gained since she had seen the Galliani in Paris had been from the waiter at the Great Western Hotel, who, after returning from a vain search for an unoccupied times, had volunteered the information that there was an unusual demand for the paper because of the Hellingford Assizes, and the trial there for murder that was going on. There was no electric telegraph in those days. At every station Eleanor put her head out and inquired if the murder trial at Hellingford was ended. Some porters told her one thing, some another, in their hurry. She felt that she could not rely on them. Drive to Mr. Johnson's in the high street, quick, quick. I will give you half a crown if you go quick. For indeed her endurance, her patience, was strained almost to snapping. Yet at Hellingford Station, where doubtless they could have told her the truth, she dared not ask the question. It was past eight o'clock at night. In many houses in the little country town there were unusual lights and sounds. The inhabitants were showing their hospitality to such of the strangers brought by the assizes as were lingering there, now that the business which had drawn them was over. The judges had left the town that afternoon to wind up the circuit by the short list of a neighboring county town. Mr. Johnson was entertaining a dinner party of attorneys when he was summoned from dessert by the announcement of a lady who wanted to speak to him immediate and particular. He went into his study, in not the best of tempers. There he found his client, Miss Wilkins, white and ghastly, standing by the fireplace, with her eyes fixed on the door. "'It is you, Miss Wilkins. I am very glad.' "'Dixon,' said she. It was all she could utter.' 
Mr. Johnson shook his head. Ah, that is a sad piece of business, and I'm afraid it has shortened your visit at Rome. Is he? Ay, I'm afraid there's no doubt of his guilt. At any rate, the jury found him guilty, and— And? she repeated quickly, sitting down the better to hear the words that she knew were coming. He is condemned to death. When? The Saturday but one after the judges left the town. I suppose it's the usual time. Who tried him? Judge Corbett, and for a new judge, I must say I never knew one who got through his business so well. It was really as much as I could stand to hear him condemning the prisoner to death. Dixon was undoubtedly guilty, and he was as stubborn as could be. A sullen old fellow who would let no one help him through. I'm sure I did my best for him at Miss Monroe's desire, and for your sake. But he would furnish me with no particulars, help us to no evidence. I had the hardest work to keep him from confessing all before witnesses, who would have been bound to repeat it as evidence against him. Indeed, I never thought he would have pleaded not guilty. I think it was only with a desire to justify himself in the eyes of some old Hamley acquaintances. "'Good God, Miss Wilkins, what's the matter? You're not fainting?' He rang the bell till the rope remained in his hands. "'Here, Esther, Jerry, whoever you are, come quick. Miss Wilkins has fainted. Water, wine. Tell Mrs. Johnson to come here directly.' Mrs. Johnson, a kind motherly woman, who had been excluded from the gentleman's dinner party, and had devoted her time to superintending the dinner her husband had ordered, came in answer to his call for assistance, and found Eleanor lying back in her chair, white and senseless. Bessie, Miss Wilkins has fainted. She has had a long journey, and is in a fidget about Dixon, the old fellow who was sentenced to be hung for that murder, you know. I can't stop here. I must go back to those men. You bring her round and see her to bed. The blue room is empty since Horner left. She must stop here, and I'll see her in the morning. Take care of her, and keep her mind as easy as you can, will you? For she can do no good by fidgeting. And, knowing that he left Eleanor in good hands, and with plenty of assistance about her, he returned to his friends. Eleanor came to herself before long. It was very foolish of me, but I could not help it she said apologetically. No, to be sure not, dear. Here, drink this. It is some of Mr. Johnson's best port wine that he has sent out on purpose for you. Or would you rather have some white soup? Or what? We've had everything you could think of for dinner, and you've only to ask and have, and then you must go to bed, my dear. Mr. Johnson says you must, and there's a well-aired room." for Mr. Horner only left us this morning. I must see Mr. Johnson again, please. But indeed you must not. You must not worry your poor head with business now. And Johnson would only talk to you on business. No, go to bed and sleep soundly, and then you'll get up quite bright and strong and fit to talk about business. I cannot sleep. I cannot rest till I have asked Mr. Johnson one or two more questions. Indeed I cannot, pleaded Eleanor. Mrs. Johnson knew that her husband's orders on such occasions were peremptory, and that she should come in for a good conjugal scolding if, after what he had said, she ventured to send for him again. Yet Eleanor looked so entreating and wistful that she could hardly find it in her heart to refuse her. A bright thought struck her. Here is a pen and paper, my dear. Could you not write the questions you wanted to ask? And he'll just jot down the answers upon the same piece of paper. I'll send it in by Jerry. He has got friends to dinner with him, you see. Eleanor yielded. She sat, resting her weary head on her hand, and wondering what were the questions which would have come so readily to her tongue could she have been face to face with him. As it was, she only wrote this. How early can I see you tomorrow morning? Will you take all the necessary steps for my going to Dixon as soon as possible? 
could I be admitted to him to-night? The penciled answers were, Eight o'clock? Yes? No. I suppose he knows best, said Eleanor, sighing as she read the last word. But it seems wicked in me to be going to bed, and he so near in prison. When she rose up and stood, she felt the former dizziness return, and that reconciled her to seeking rest before she entered upon the duties which were becoming clearer before her, now that she knew all and was on the scene of action. Mrs. Johnson brought her white wine whey instead of the tea she had asked for, and perhaps it was owing to this that she slept so soundly. End of chapter 14 Recording by Arnold Banner, Mount Vernon, Maine Chapter 15 When Eleanor awoke, the clear light of dawn was fully in the room. She could not remember where she was. For so many mornings she had wakened up in strange places that it took her several minutes before she could make out the geographical whereabouts of the heavy blue moreen curtains, the print of the Lord Lieutenant of the County on the wall, and all the handsome ponderous mahogany furniture that stuffed up the room. As soon as full memory came into her mind, she started up, nor did she go to bed again, although she saw by her watch on the dressing-table that it was not yet six o'clock. She dressed herself with the dainty completeness so habitual to her that it had become an unconscious habit, and then, the instinct was irrepressible, she put on her bonnet and shawl and went down, past the servant on her knees cleaning the doorstep, out into the fresh open air, and so she found her way to the high street, to Hellingford Castle, the building in which the court of Assize were held, the prison in which Dixon lay condemned to die. She almost knew she could not see him, yet it seemed like some amends to her conscience for having slept through so many hours of the night if she made the attempt. She went up to the porter's lodge and asked the little girl sweeping out the place if she might see Abraham Dixon. The child stared at her and ran into the house, bringing out her father, a great burly man, who had not yet donned either coat or waistcoat, and who, consequently, felt the morning air as rather nipping. To him Eleanor repeated her question. Him has to be hung come Saturday se'night? Why, ma'am, I've naught to do with it. You may go to the governor's house and try, but if you'll excuse me, you'll have your walk for your pains. Them in the condemned cells is never seen by nobody without the sheriff's order. You may go up to the governor's house and welcome, but they'll only tell you the same. Yon's the governor's house. Eleanor fully believed the man, and yet she went on to the house indicated as if she still hoped that in her case there might be some exception to the rule, which she now remembered to have heard of before, in days when such a possible desire as to see a condemned prisoner was treated by her as a wish that some people might have, did have, people as far removed from her circle of circumstances as the inhabitants of the moon. Of course she met with the same reply, a little more abruptly given, as if every man was from his birth bound to know such an obvious regulation. She went out past the porter, now fully clothed. He was sorry for her disappointment, but could not help saying with a slight tone of exultation, Well, you see, I was right, ma'am. She walked as nearly round the castle as ever she could looking up at the few high barred windows she could see, and wondering in what part of the building Dixon was confined. Then she went into the adjoining churchyard, and sitting down upon a tombstone she gazed idly at the view spread below her, a view which was considered as the lion of the place to be shown to all strangers by the inhabitants of Hellingford.
Eleanor did not see it, however. She only saw the blackness of that fatal night, the hurried work, the lanterns glancing to and fro. She only heard the hard breathing of those who are engaged upon unwonted labor. The few hoarse muttered words, the swaying of the branches to and fro. All at once the church clock above her struck eight, and then pealed out for distant laborers to cease their work for a time. Such was the old custom of the place. Eleanor rose up and made her way back to Mr. Johnson's house in High Street. The room felt close and confined in which she awaited her interview with Mr. Johnson, who had sent down an apology for having overslept himself, and at last made his appearance in a hurried, half-awakened state in consequence of his late hospitality of the night before. "'I am so sorry I gave you all so much trouble last night,' said Eleanor apologetically. "'I was overtired and much shocked by the news I had heard.' "'No trouble, no trouble, I am sure. Neither Mrs. Johnson nor I felt it in the least a trouble. Many ladies I know feel such things very trying, though there are others that can stand a judge's putting on the black cap better than most men.' I'm sure I saw some as composed as could be under Judge Corbett's speech. But about Dixon, he must not die, Mr. Johnson. Well, I don't know that he will, said Mr. Johnson, in something of the tone of voice he would have used in soothing a child. Judge Corbett said something about the possibility of a pardon. The jury did not recommend him to mercy. You see, his looks went so much against him and all the evidence was so strong, and no defense, so to speak, for he would not furnish any information on which we could base defense. But the judge did give some hope to my mind, though there are others that think differently. I tell you, Mr. Johnson, he must not die, and he shall not. To whom must I go? You, have you got additional evidence? with a sudden sharp glance of professional inquiry. Never mind, Eleanor answered. I beg your pardon. Only tell me into whose hands the power of life and death has passed. Into the Home Secretary's, Sir Philip Holmes. But you cannot get access to him on such an errand. It is the judge who tried the case that must urge a reprieve, Judge Corbett. Judge Corbett? Yes and he was rather inclined to take a merciful view of the whole case. I saw it in his charge. He'll be the person for you to see. I suppose you don't like to give me your confidence, or else I could arrange and draw up what will have to be said. No, what I have to say must be spoken to the arbiter, and to no one else. I am afraid I answered you impatiently just now. You must forgive me. If you knew all, I am sure you would. Say no more, my dear lady. We will suppose you have some evidence not adduced at the trial. Well, you must go up and see the judge, since you don't choose to impart it to anyone, and lay it before him. He will doubtless compare it with his notes of the trial, and see how far it agrees with them. Of course you must be prepared with some kind of proof for Judge Corbett will have to test your evidence. It seems strange to think of him as the judge, said Eleanor, almost to herself. Why, yes, he is but a young judge. You knew him at Hamley, I suppose. I remember his reading there with Mr. Ness. Yes, but do not let us talk more about that time. Tell me when I can see Dixon. I have been to the castle already, but they said I must have a sheriff's order. To be sure, I desired Mrs. Johnson to tell you so last night. Old Ormerod was dining here. He is clerk to the magistrates, and I told him of your wish. He said he would see Sir Henry Cropper and have the order here before ten. But all this time Mrs. Johnson is waiting breakfast for us. Let me take you into the dining room. It was very hard work for Eleanor to do her duty as a guest. 
and to allow herself to be interested and talked to on local affairs by her host and hostess. But she felt as if she had spoken shortly and abruptly to Mr. Johnson in their previous conversation, and that she must try and make amends for it. So she attended to all the details about the restoration of the church, and the difficulty of getting a good music master for the three little Miss Johnsons, with all her usual gentle good breeding and patience, though no one can tell how her heart and imagination were full of the coming interview with poor old Dixon. By and by Mr. Johnson was called out of the room to see Mr. Ormerod, and received the order of admission from him. Eleanor clasped her hands tight together as she listened with apparent composure to Mrs. Johnson's never-ending praise of the Hulla system. But when Mr. Johnson returned, she could not help interrupting her eulogy and saying, Then I may go now? Yes, the order was there. She might go, and Mr. Johnson would accompany her to see that she met with no difficulty or obstacle. As they walked thither, he told her that someone, a turnkey or someone, would have to be present at the interview, that such was always the rule in the case of condemned prisoners, but that if this third person was obliging, he would keep out of earshot. Mr. Johnson quietly took care to see that the turnkey who accompanied Eleanor was obliging. The man took her across high-walled courts, along stone corridors, and through many locked doors before they came to the condemned cells. "'I've had three at a time in here,' said he, unlocking the final door, after Judge Morton had been here. We always called him the hanging judge. But it's five years since he died, and now there's never more than one in at a time though once it was a woman for poisoning her husband. Mary Jones was her name. The stone passage out of which the cells opened was light and bare and scrupulously clean. Over each door was a small barred window, and an outer window of the same description was placed high up in the cell, which the turnkey now opened. Old Abraham Dixon was sitting on the side of his bed, doing nothing. His head was bent, his frame sunk, and he did not seem to care to turn round and see who it was that entered. Eleanor tried to keep down her sobs while the man went up to him, and laying his hand on his shoulder and lightly shaking him, he said, Here's a friend come to see you, Dixon. Then turning to Eleanor, he added, There's some as takes it in this kind of stunned way while others are as restless as a wild beast in a cage after they're sentenced. And then he withdrew into the passage, leaving the door open so that he could see all that passed if he chose to look, but ostentatiously keeping his eyes averted and whistling to himself so that he could not hear what they said to each other. Dixon looked up at Eleanor, but then let his eyes fall on the ground again. The increasing trembling of his shrunken frame was the only sign he gave that he had recognized her. She sat down by him and took his large horny hand in hers. She wanted to overcome her inclination to sob hysterically before she spoke. She stroked the bony, shriveled fingers on which her hot, scalding tears kept dropping. "'Do not do that,' said he at length, in a hollow voice. Do not take on about it. It's best as it is, Missy. No, Dixon, it's not best. It shall not be. You know it shall not, cannot be. I'm rather tired of living. It's been a great strain and labor for me. I think I'd as lief be with God as with men. And you see, I were fond on him ever since he were a little lad and told me what hard times he had at school. He did, just as if I were his brother. I loved him next to Molly Greaves. Dear, and I shall see her again, I reckon, come next Saturday week. They'll think well on me up there, I'll be bound, though I cannot say as I've done all I should do here below. But, Dixon, 
said Eleanor. You know who did this? This? Guilty o' murder, said he. That's what they called it, murder. And that it never were. Choose who did it. My poor, poor father did it. I am going up to London this afternoon. I am going to see the judge and tell him all. Don't you demean yourself to that fellow, Missy. It's him as left you in the lurch as soon as sorrow and shame came nigh you. He looked up at her now for the first time. But she went on as if she had not noticed those wistful, weary eyes. Yes, I shall go to him. I know who it is, and I am resolved. After all, he may be better than a stranger for real help. And I shall never remember anything else when I think of you, good faithful friend. He looks but a wizened old fellow in his gray wig. I should hardly have known him. I gave him a look as much as to say, I could tell tales of you, my lord judge, if I chose. I don't know if he heeded me, though. I suppose it were for a sign of old acquaintance that he said he'd recommend me to mercy. But I'd sooner have death nor mercy by long odds. Yon man out there says mercy means Botany Bay. It'd be like killing me by inches, it would. I'd liefer go straight to heaven than live among the black folk. He began to shake again. This idea of transportation from its very mysteriousness was more terrifying to him than death. He kept on saying plaintively, Missy, you'll never let him send me to Botany Bay. I couldn't stand that. No, no, said she. You shall come out of this prison and go home with me to East Chester. I promise you, you shall. I promise you. I don't yet know quite how but trust in my promise. Don't fret about Botany Bay. If you go there, I go too. I am so sure you will not go. And you know, if you have done anything against the law in concealing that fatal night's work, I did it too. And if you are to be punished, I will be punished too. But I feel sure it will be right. I mean as right as anything can be with the recollection of that time present to us, as it must always be. She almost spoke these last words to herself. They sat on, hand in hand, for a few minutes more in silence. I thought you'd come to me. I knowed you were far away in foreign parts. But I used to pray to God. Dear Lord God, I used to say, let me see her again. I told the chaplain as I'd begin to pray for repentance at after I'd done praying that I might see you once again. For it just seemed to take all my strength to say those words as I've named. And I thought as how God knew what was in my heart better than I could tell him. How I was mean and sorry for all I'd ever done wrong. I always were at after it was done but I thought as no one could know how bitter keen I wanted to see you. Again they sank into silence. Eleanor felt as if she would fain be away and active in procuring his release. But she also perceived how precious her presence was to him, and she did not like to leave him a moment before the time allowed her. His voice had changed to a weak, piping old man's quaver, and between the times of his talking he seemed to relapse into a dreamy state. But through it all he held her hand tight, as though afraid that she would leave him. So the hour elapsed with no more spoken words than those above. From time to time Eleanor's tears dropped down upon her lap. She could not restrain them, though she scarce knew why she cried just then. At length the turnkey said that the time allowed for the interview was ended. Eleanor spoke no word, but rose and bent down and kissed the old man's forehead, saying, I shall come back tomorrow. God keep and comfort you. So almost without an articulate word from him in reply, he rose up and stood on his shaking legs as she bade him farewell, putting his hand to his head with the old habitual mark of respect. 
she went her way swiftly out of the prison swiftly back with mr johnson to his house scarcely patient or strong enough in her hurry to explain to him fully all that she meant to do she only asked him a few absolutely requisite questions and informed him of her intention to go straight to london to see judge corbett just before the railway carriage in which she was seated started on the journey she bent forward and put out her hand once more to mr johnson "'Tomorrow I will thank you for all,' she said. "'I cannot now.' It was about the same time that she had reached Hellingford on the previous night that she arrived at the Great Western Station on this evening, past eight o'clock. On the way she had remembered and arranged many things. One important question she had omitted to ask Mr. Johnson, but that was easily remedied. She had not inquired where she could find Judge Corbett. If she had, Mr. Johnson could probably have given her his professional address. As it was, she asked for a post office directory at the hotel and looked out for his private dwelling. 128 Hyde Park Gardens. She rang for a waiter. Can I send a message to Hyde Park Gardens? She said, hurrying on to her business tired and worn out as she was. It is only to ask if Judge Corbett is at home this evening. If he is, I must go and see him. The waiter was a little surprised, and would gladly have had her name to authorize the inquiry, but she could not bear to send it. It would be bad enough, that first meeting, without the feeling that he, too, had had time to recall all the past days better to go in upon him unprepared and plunge into the subject the waiter returned with the answer while she yet was pacing up and down the room restlessly nerving herself for the interview the messenger has been to hyde park gardens ma'am the judge and lady corbett are gone out to dinner lady corbett of course eleanor knew that he was married had she not been present at the wedding in East Chester Cathedral? But somehow these recent events had so carried her back to old times that the intimate association of the names the judge and Lady Corbett seemed to awaken her out of some dream. Oh, very well, she said, just as if these thoughts were not passing rapidly through her mind. Let me be called at seven tomorrow morning and let me have a cab at the door to Hyde Park Gardens at eight. And so she went to bed, but scarcely to sleep. All night long she had the scenes of those old times, the happy, happy days of her youth, the one terrible night that cut all happiness short, present before her. She could almost have fancied that she heard the long, silent sounds of her father's step her father's way of breathing, the rustle of his newspaper as he hastily turned it over, coming through the lapse of years, the silence of the night. She knew that she had the little writing case of her girlhood with her in her box, the treasures of the dead that it contained, the morsel of dainty sewing, the little sister's golden curl, the half-finished letter to Mr. Corbett, were all there. She took them out and looked at each separately, looked at them long, long and wistfully. Will it be of any use to me? she questioned of herself as she was about to put her father's letter back into its receptacle. She read the last words over again once more. From my deathbed I adjure you to stand her friend. I will beg pardon on my knees for anything. I will take it, thought she. I need not bring it out. Most likely there will be no need for it, after what I shall have to say. All is so altered, so changed between us, as utterly as if it never had been, that I think I shall have no shame in showing it to him for my own part of it. While if he sees poor papa's, dear, dear papa's suffering humility, it may make him think more gently of one who loved him once, though they parted in wrath with each other, I'm afraid. 
so she took the letter with her when she drove to Hyde Park Gardens. Every nerve in her body was in such a high state of tension that she could have screamed out at the cabman's boisterous knock at the door. She got out hastily before anyone was ready or willing to answer such an untimely summons, paid the man double what he ought to have had, and stood there, sick and trembling and humble. End of chapter 15 Recording by Arnold Banner, Mount Vernon, Maine Chapter 16 and Last Is Judge Corbett at home? Can I see him? She asked of the footman, who at length answered the door. He looked at her curiously and a little familiarly before he replied, Why, yes, he's pretty sure to be at home at this time of day, but whether he'll see you is quite another thing. Would you be so good as to ask him? It is on very particular business. Can you give me a card? Your name, perhaps, will do, if you have not a card. I say, Simmons, to a lady's maid crossing the hall, is the judge up yet? Oh, yes, he's in his dressing-room this half-hour. My lady is coming down directly. It is just breakfast time. Can't you put it off and come again a little later, said he, turning once more to Eleanor. White Eleanor, trembling Eleanor. No, please let me come in. I will wait. I am sure Judge Corbett will see me, if you tell him I am here. Miss Wilkins, he will know the name. Well, then, will you wait here while I have got breakfast in, said the man, letting her into the hall and pointing to the bench there. He took her from her dress to be a lady's maid or governess, or at most a tradesman daughter. And besides, he was behindhand with all his preparations. She came in and sat down. You will tell him I am here, she said faintly. Oh, yes, never fear. I'll send up word, though I don't believe he'll come to you before breakfast. He told a page who ran upstairs, and, knocking at the judge's door, said that a Miss Jenkins wanted to speak to him. Who? asked the judge from the inside. Miss Jenkins. She said you would know the name, sir. Not I. Tell her to wait. So Eleanor waited. Presently down the stairs, with slow, deliberate dignity, came the handsome Lady Corbett, in her rustling silks and ample petticoats, carrying her fine boy, and followed by her majestic nurse. She was ill-pleased that any one should come and take up her husband's time when he was at home, and supposed to be enjoying domestic leisure. And her imperious, inconsiderate nature did not prompt her to any civility towards the gentle creature sitting down, weary and heartsick in her house. On the contrary, she looked her over as she slowly descended, till Eleanor shrank abashed from the steady gaze of the large black eyes. Then she, her baby, and nurse disappeared into the large dining-room, into which all the preparations for breakfast had been carried. The next person to come down would be the judge. Eleanor instinctively put down her veil. She heard his quick, decided step. She had known it well of old. He gave one of his sharp, shrewd glances at the person sitting in the hall and waiting to speak to him, and his practiced eye recognized the lady at once, in spite of her travel-worn dress. "'Will you just come into this room?' said he, opening the door of his study, to the front of the house. The dining-room was to the back. They communicated by folding doors. The astute lawyer placed himself with his back to the window. It was the natural position of the master of the apartment, but it also gave him the advantage of seeing his companion's face in full light. Eleanor lifted her veil. It had only been a dislike to a recognition in the hall which had made her put it down. Judge Corbett's countenance changed more than hers. She had been prepared for the interview. He was not. But he usually had the full command of the expression on his face. Eleanor! miss wilkins is it you and he went forwards holding out his hand with cordial greeting under which the embarrassment if he felt any was carefully concealed she could not speak all at once in the way she wished that stupid henry told me jenkins i beg your pardon how could they put you down to sit in the hall you must come in and have some breakfast with us 
lady corbett will be delighted i'm sure his sense of the awkwardness of the meeting with the woman who was once to have been his wife and of the probable introduction which was to follow to the woman who was his actual wife grew upon him and made him speak a little hurriedly eleanor's next words were a wonderful relief and her soft gentle way of speaking was like the touch of a cooling balsam thank you you must excuse me i am come strictly on business otherwise i should never have thought of calling on you at such an hour it is about poor dixon ah i thought as much said the judge handing her a chair and sitting down himself he tried to compose his mind to business but in spite of his strength of character and his present efforts the remembrance of old times would come back at the sound of her voice he wondered if he was as much changed in appearance as she struck him as being in that first look of recognition after that first glance he rather avoided meeting her eyes i knew how much you would feel it some one at hellingford told me you were abroad in rome i think but you must not distress yourself unnecessarily the sentence is sure to be commuted to transportation or something equivalent i was talking to the home secretary about it only last night lapse of time and subsequent good character quite preclude any idea of capital punishment all the time that he said this he had other thoughts at the back of his mind some curiosity a little regret a touch of remorse a wonder how the meeting which of course would have to be some time between lady corbett and eleanor would go off but he spoke clearly enough on the subject in hand and no outward mark of distraction from it appeared eleanor answered i came to tell you what i suppose may be told to any judge in confidence and full reliance on his secrecy that abraham dixon was not the murderer she stopped short and choked a little the judge looked sharply at her then you know who was said he yes she replied with a low steady voice looking him full in the face with sad solemn eyes the truth flashed into his mind he shaded his face and did not speak for a minute or two then he said not looking up a little hoarsely this then was the shame you told me of long ago yes said she both sat quite still quite silent for some time through the silence a sharp clear voice was heard speaking through the folding doors take the kedgeree down and tell the cook to keep it hot for the judge it is so tiresome people coming on business here as if the judge had not his proper hours for being at chambers he got up hastily and went into the dining-room but he had audibly some difficulty in curbing his wife's irritation when he came back eleanor said i am afraid i ought not to have come here now oh it's all nonsense said he in a tone of annoyance you've done quite right he seated himself where he had been before and again half covered his face with his hand and dixon knew of this i believe i must put the fact plainly to you your father was the guilty person he murdered dunster yes if you call it murder it was done by a blow in the heat of passion no one can ever tell how dunster always irritated papa said eleanor in a stupid heavy way and then she sighed how do you know this there was a kind of tender reluctance in the judge's voice as he put all these questions eleanor had made up her mind beforehand that something like them must be asked and must also be answered but she spoke like a sleepwalker i came into papa's room just after he had struck mr dunster the blow he was lying insensible as we thought dead as he really was what was dixon's part in it he must have known a good deal about it and the horse lancet that was found with his name upon it papa went to wake dixon and he brought his flame i suppose to try and bleed him i have said enough have i not i seem so confused but i will answer any question to make it appear that dixon is innocent the judge had been noting all down he sat still now without replying to her then he wrote rapidly referring to his previous paper from time to time in five minutes or so he read the facts which eleanor had stated as he now arranged them in a legal and connected form he just asked her one or two trivial questions as he did so then he read it over to her and asked her to sign it she took up the pen and held it hesitating this will never be made public said she 
no i shall take care that no one but the home secretary sees it thank you i could not help it now it has come to this there are not many men like dixon said the judge almost to himself as he sealed the paper in an envelope no said eleanor i never knew any one so faithful and just at the same moment the reflection on a less faithful person than these words might seem to imply struck both of them and each instinctively glanced at the other eleanor said the judge after a moment's pause we are friends i hope yes friends said she quietly and sadly he felt a little chagrined at her answer why he could hardly tell to cover any sign of his feeling he went on talking where are you living now at east chester but you sometimes come to town don't you let us know always whenever you come and lady corbett shall call on you indeed i wish you'd let me bring her to see you to-day thank you i am going straight back to hellingford at least as soon as you can get me the pardon for dixon he half smiled at her ignorance the pardon must be sent to the sheriff who holds the warrant for his execution but of course you may have every assurance that it shall be sent as soon as possible it is just the same as if he had it now thank you very much said eleanor rising pray don't go without breakfast if you would rather not see lady corbett just now it shall be sent in to you in this room unless you have already breakfasted no thank you i would rather not you are very kind and i am very glad to have seen you once again there is just one thing more said she colouring a little and hesitating this note to you was found under papa's pillow after his death some of it refers to past things but i should be glad if you could think as kindly as you can of poor papa and so if you will read it he took it and read it not without emotion then he laid it down on his table and said poor man he must have suffered a great deal for that night's work and you eleanor you have suffered too yes she had suffered and he who spoke had been one of the instruments of her suffering although he seemed forgetful of it she shook her head a little for reply then she looked up at him they were both standing at the time and said i think i shall be happier now i always knew it must be found out once more good-bye and thank you i may take this letter i suppose said she casting envious loving eyes at her father's note lying unregarded on the table oh certainly certainly said he and then he took her hand he held it while he looked into her face he had thought it changed when he had first seen her but it was now almost the same to him as of yore the sweet shy eyes the indicated dimple in the cheek and something of fever had brought a faint pink flush into her usually colourless cheeks married judge though he was he was not sure if she had not more charms for him still in her sorrow and her shabbiness than the handsome stately wife in the next room whose looks had not been of the pleasantest when he left her a few minutes before he sighed a little regretfully as eleanor went away he had obtained the position he had struggled for and sacrificed for but now he could not help wishing that the slaughtered creature laid on the shrine of his ambition were alive again the kedgeri was brought up again smoking hot but it remained untasted by him and though he appeared to be reading the times he did not see a word of the distinct type his wife meanwhile continued her complaints of the untimely visitor whose name he did not give to her in its corrected form as he was not anxious that she should have it in her power to identify the call of this morning with a possible future acquaintance when eleanor reached dr johnson's house in hellingford that afternoon she found miss munro was there and that she had been with much difficulty restrained by mr johnson from following her to london miss munro fondled and purred inarticulately through her tears over her recovered darling before she could speak intelligibly enough to tell her that canon livingstone had come straight to see her immediately on his return to east chester and had suggested her journey to hellingford in order that she might be of all the comfort she could to eleanor she did not at first let out that he had accompanied her to hellingford she was a little afraid of eleanor's displeasure at his being there eleanor had always objected so much to any advance towards intimacy with him that miss munro had wished to make but eleanor was different now how white you are nelly said miss munro 
you have been travelling too much and too fast my child my head aches said eleanor wearily but i must go to the castle and tell my poor dixon that he is reprieved i am so tired will you ask mr johnson to get me leave to see him he will know all about it she threw herself down on the bed in the spare room the bed with the heavy blue curtains after an unheeded remonstrance miss munro went to do her bidding but it was now late afternoon and mr johnson said that it would be impossible for him to get permission from the sheriff that night besides said he courteously one scarcely knows whether miss wilkins may not give the old man false hopes whether she has not been excited to have false hopes herself it might be a cruel kindness to let her see him without more legal certainty as to what his sentence or reprieve is to be by to-morrow morning if i have properly understood her story which was a little confused she is so dreadfully tired poor creature put in miss munro who never could bear the shadow of a suspicion that eleanor was not wisest best in all relations and situations of life mr johnson went on with a deprecatory bow well then it really is the only course open to her besides persuade her to rest for this evening by to-morrow morning i will have obtained the sheriff's leave and he will most likely have heard from london thank you i believe that will be best it is the only course said he when miss munro returned to the bedroom eleanor was in a heavy feverish slumber so feverish and so uneasy did she appear that after the hesitation of a moment or two miss munro had no scruple in wakening her but she did not appear to understand the answer to her request she did not seem even to remember that she had made any request the journey to england the misery the surprises had been too much for her the morrow morning came bringing the formal free pardon for abraham dixon the sheriff's order for her admission to see the old man lay awaiting her wish to use it but she knew nothing of all this for days nay weeks she hovered between life and death tended as of old by miss munro while good mrs johnson was ever willing to assist one summer evening in early june she wakened into memory miss munro heard the faint piping voice as she kept her watch by the bedside where is dixon asked she at the canon's house at bromham this was the name of dr livingstone's county parish why we thought it better to get him into country air and fresh scenes at once how is he much better get strong and he shall come to see you you are sure all is right said eleanor sure my dear all is quite right then eleanor went to sleep again out of very weakness and weariness from that time she recovered pretty steadily her great desire was to return to east chester as soon as possible the associations of grief anxiety and coming illness connected with hellingford made her wish to be once again in the solemn quiet sunny close of east chester canon livingstone came over to assist miss munro in managing the journey with her invalid but he did not intrude himself upon eleanor any more than he had done in coming from home the morning after her return miss munro said do you feel strong enough to see dixon is he here he is at the canon's house he sent for him from bromham in order that he might be ready for you to see him when you wished please let him come directly said eleanor flushing and trembling she went to the door to meet the tottering old man she led him to the easy chair that had been placed and arranged for herself she knelt down before him and put his hands on her head he trembling and shaking all the while forgive me all the shame and misery dixon say you forgive me and give me your blessing and then let never a word of the terrible past be spoken between us it's not for me to forgive you as never did harm to no one but say you do it will ease my heart i forgive thee said he and then he raised himself to his feet with effort and standing up above her he blessed her solemnly after that he sat down she by him gazing at him yon's a good man missy he said at length lifting his slow eyes and looking at her better nor the other ever was he is a good man said eleanor but no more was spoken on the subject the next day canon livingstone made his formal call eleanor would fain have kept miss munro in the room but that worthy lady knew better than to stop they went on forcing talk on indifferent subjects 
at last he could speak no longer on everything but that which he had most at heart miss wilkins he had got up and was standing by the mantelpiece apparently examining the ornaments upon it miss wilkins is there any chance of your giving me a favourable answer now you know what i mean what we spoke about at the great western hotel that day eleanor hung her head you know that i was once engaged before yes i know to mr corbett he that is now the judge you cannot suppose that would make any difference if that is all i have loved you and you only ever since we met eighteen years ago miss wilkins eleanor put me out of suspense i will said she putting out her thin white hand for him to take and kiss almost with tears of gratitude but she seemed frightened at his impetuosity and tried to check him wait you have not heard all my poor poor father in a fit of anger irritated beyond his bearing struck the blow that killed mr dunster dixon and i knew of it just after the blow was struck we helped to hide it we kept the secret my poor father died of sorrow and remorse you now know all can you still love me it seems to me as if i had been an accomplice in such a terrible thing poor poor eleanor said he now taking her in his arms as a shelter how i wish i had known of all this years and years ago i could have stood between you and so much those who passed through the village of Bronham and paused to look over the laurel hedge that separates the rectory garden from the road may often see on summer days an old old man sitting in a wicker chair out upon the lawn he leans upon his stick and seldom raises his bent head but for all that his eyes are on a level with the two little fairy children who come to him in all their small joys and sorrows and who learnt to lisp his name almost as soon as they did that of their father and mother nor is miss munro often absent and although she prefers to retain the old house in the close for winter quarters she generally makes her way across to canon livingstone's residence every evening so ends a dark night's work end of chapter sixteen recording by dion gines salt lake city utah End of A Dark Night's Work by Elizabeth Cleghorn Gaskell